Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 366 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. Not a lot of hockey to talk about. COVID has shut the league down, but the boys are very excited. We are finally going to Minnesota. It's been a long time coming. We were supposed to go last year. It didn't happen, so the boys are packing up, getting ready to rock and roll in Minnesota. But let's see how their Christmases, holidays are going. Gee, let's go to you first. Uh, All right, I'm very excited. I've actually never been in Minnesota before, so I'm super, super excited. But it's the most wonderful time of the year. We got World Juniors, hockey every day now from here on out. And like you said, we're going to the Winter Classic, so it, it really doesn't get any better than this right now. Our World Junior Hockey uh, insider, Mike Grinnell, is going to have tons of facts about Team USA because i got to be pumping uh, Team Canada's tires a little later, but I'll let you keep snapping around, R.A. Yeah, well, somebody's got somebody's to pump their tires. That's why I got my uh, Team USA hat on right now in support of the squad for the juniors. But Biz Nasty, how was your Christmas, buddy? It was good. I was a little tired after visiting the family last pod. You guys carried at home, so thank you very much. But uh, it's been great to be home, relaxing in Arizona, um, obviously with the cancellation of games. But I'll tell you what, I watched every single World Junior g- uh, game on Boxing Day. It was great to see these young prospects because normally you got both leagues to, to fall around. So we'll dive into that, uh, some other dramatic news but uh all is well here i think sometimes like despite i mean the negativity of all the shutdowns and how frustrated people are just specifically over uh christmas eve and christmas day sometimes it's nice to be in even boxing day it's kind of nice to be forced to you know maybe just hang out at home with the family it really slows life down where i think life uh, in general moves pretty quickly for a lot of people now with technology yada 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 and the way the world moves in general ra i mean christ Mm -hmm. you've been around the longest Back, yeah. like the amount of, of information you're getting on a daily basis now is just it's it's, it's insane so it was good to I, chill out with the dogs and katie and uh and, and relax yeah. a little bit i got more anxiety now than my fucking parents split up 40 years ago <laughs> so it's a fucking crazy world we live in but any good any good christmas presents biz um okay so katie her the gift that she got me uh is delayed so I don't know. Oh. Uh, thanks a lot, Bezos. But uh, oh. I don't know if supply chain issues. But uh, I'm a, I'm not a big <clears throat> gift. I don't like getting gifts. It makes me uncomfortable. I li- I'd, ra- I'd rather give. Me too. Yeah. Me too, Biz. Hundred percent. Yeah, it's like Depends oh great, all the attention. I don't receiving. even think I'll have a big wedding because I don't think I can take the amount of eyes and attention. Like, like you know, this is I, a guy might... who has five thousand jobs. He can't take the eyes and the attention. What are you well, talking about? Well, not <laughs> like, in, not when like you're. I, I like talking about other shit. Not when it's just like like reading my about vows. You? Yeah. Imagine me trying to read vows to Kate. Her old man wow. being like, my fucking... You're the lead here, Biz. Would... Did you get engaged, bro? <laughs> no, no like, yeah. Oh, the <laughs> oh, pump the brakes here, folks. Pump the brakes. Congrats, man. Yeah, you awesome. flooded. Long time. You've been you ready, flooded, man. You flooded, not us. Hey, maybe maybe, uh, maybe <laughs> next Christmas. We'll see. But uh, definitely on the right uh, path, that's for sure. All right. Well, the, the Wit Dog, the only member of the crew who has children, so Christmas means a lot more, and it's a different thing for you these days. How'd everything go with you and the, the little fellas and the wife? It was amazing. Probably one of the most chill Christmases I can remember. I think that Ryder, this is his first year really understanding. And so it was actually, you know what? I'm not even going to say he's all in yet, though, because he slept till eight o'clock. Like, That's he unbelievable. Doesn't ever, dude, he sleeps. I'm he's jealous. always up at like 645 to 715, just comes in our room. And we woke up we're like, where is this kid? Check the check the camera. He's like passed out. <laughs> So, you know, you're not all in until you're up at 430 knocking on your parents' bedroom door. Pink Whitney in the crib next to him. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, so once we got downstairs, though, he was so fired up and, like, so appreciative. He loved it. I loved seeing him. And then, you know, Wyatt's just crawling around, rummaging through all the different, uh, you know, wrapping paper and all that stuff. Actually... I was laughing out loud at that um, Barstool's Instagram, like, had, like, dad mode. And the guy's laying there, and, like, right when the wrapping starts, he gets the trash bag. Dude, I went out and got a trash bag the second I heard a wrapping piece of wrapping paper get ripped. I was right there with a big black, big black trash bag, chucking it all in. Like, recycles over here. So my wife was, like, giving me the eye. Like, can you just sit down for a second? You're such a dad right now. But it was, it was awesome. I got Ryder this. He's, he's been into the Mighty Ducks. So I got him this Mighty Ducks jersey, like the one they get at the end of one, like says D5 district on the dock. But like he was so fired up. Dude, I ordered the smallest size. Now, granted, Ryder's like probably 3'1", 33 pounds. So it's like 
I got him the tiny one. This thing is the smallest jersey they had. It would be big on Shaq. So, you know, I'm tucking it into his pants and stuff, and I'm rolling up the arms. He's wearing it, but he's swimming in this thing. So uh, that was a great gift. Um, it was just very special because then that day we hung out. My parents came over. We had gone over to uh, my wife's family's Christmas Eve. It's a barn burner over there. It's an absolute bash. And there's, they do the, the Yankee swap. Now, mind you, people, there's no hockey to talk about besides World Junior. So we're just going to chat about Ryan's Christmas right now. So <laughs> bear with me. So we go over to this. It's, it's this they do the gang. I think it's Yankee swap. I don't know the exact terms, but everyone buys a present. And then you hand out the numbers. You know, and like if you're 13th, you go 13th. But the number one, they get to pick first. But then they get to take any present they want at the end. So the worst number you can get is number two because – you're picking like whatever you want, but then you can get it stolen from every because you could steal from everyone that went before you. Do you guys know what I'm saying? Yep. Am I doing a good oh, yeah. job yep. explaining this? It's, a, it's like white elephant, yeah. I believe, is another term they call it. Okay, right, cool. G? So That's correct. Knows what I'm saying. That's correct. Thank you. So um, plus one. This is uh, was it? This is year seven for uh, Ryan at the at the at the fam at the Bascon family Christmas. I haven't left this thing. It's $50 minimum. I haven't left this thing with one remotely good gift one bit. I've never one year, dude, I ended up with a a bag of pasta. Another year I ended another year $50 I ended up with like, minimum and, with and like then you a, got a bag of pasta. Like a, yeah, how many bags of pasta do you think were in there? It was it a Smitty's big old pasta? bag with like seven different times of no, types of noodles and stuff. You got angel hair, you got all the other ones, the penne, it Sounds was like ridiculous. a great gift. Then I had it's terrible. Bad. Then I had the pasta was brutal. Then I had a cheese a cutting board one year. So, was, so finally, I thought this year was my year. I ended up with complete trash again, dude. I, I got actually, I got. I hate to say this, we're a Pink Whitney podcast. I had, I got a a, a candy cane of Doctor McGillicuddy's, which was like at least helpful for my breath. But in the end, <laughs> I left again with a brutal present. And Maybe. now I'm just looking for scratch tickets. I would say of the 20 people playing. You know, this is only the adults. The kids have their That's own. That's a last-minute gift on the way over. Oh, fuck. What, oh, we forgot to get... Okay, grab the scratch tickets. No, the last-minute gifts, the scratch tickets. I don't even get the scratch tickets. <laughs> I don't even get the scratchies. So it was still fun, though. I was... I, I, so it's 50 minimum. So I bought... Um, what did I do? I forget. But I added in the, the, the pair of Bose headphones that somebody sent us years ago, like the big dogs. I never opened them. Oh, the They're New They're $400. Yeah, those, those are nice. are $400. I didn't know that. Hand so that downs. was part of my gift. So Jesus. I would have done the Aber Abercrombie that, hiding it. I would have done the Abercrombie dress shirt regift <laughs> from Luca Caputi. The one you wore. I would have got it back from Luca Caputi and, and, and brought it to the white elephant party. But uh, a couple of veteran moves though out there for the parents. What my parents used to do, because I was an early riser for Christmas, is uh, I told you guys I was gonna be an architect. That didn't happen, but they thought it was gonna happen. So they would hit me up with the Legos as the one gift I could get on Christmas Eve. So I'd be up all morning, Christmas day in my room, assembling whatever oh. fucking you know, uh, train track or, or spaceship I was gonna fly to, to planet Zoltan with and my, with my Legos. So I don't know how many of you parents out there have kids who like Legos. I, I think that Legos is probably as big oh. now as it was back then, right? They've never stopped being They didn't big. fuck Legos that up, did they? Legos are fucking huge. Oh, yeah, best, that's man. why, like, that, it's like that Disneyland nerd now? Stephen Che, that nerd Stephen Che at Barstool, <laughs> he's the only adult that still plays with him. So he's up with his kids at three in the morning yeah. putting together mm -hmm. battleships with. Now, they've I guess that's so elaborate, too, man. Over, sorry, they've gotten so elaborate. They like, used to be like Main Street USA, like when I was a kid. Now it's like build your own fucking Millennium Falcon in seven days or some shit. Like Legos have really stepped it up in the last several years. Sorry, go ahead, Biz. No, no, I'm, I'm, maybe I'll get back into it. Uh, me and Shay will start a Lego <laughs> podcast <laughs> at Barstool. <laughs> yeah. See you guys. Good knowing you. Back to the OG chicklets. Biz 20. Um, no. What was the other thing? Maybe may, maybe Ryder was sleeping in because he got into the, that candy cane of uh, alcohol you got. Oh, in. no. But speaking of that, oh, my God. I had a panic attack Christmas <laughs> Eve. So there was um, the, uh, what are they called? Minis? Like, you, know the, uh, you know the sour, the, the, like the bands? What are those things called? You know what I'm talking about that you eat? They're like the sour straws. Just, yeah, kind of. Well, there was edibles flying around for all the adults, oh. but then there was oh. kids. There oh, was boy. kids sour things too, <laughs> sour gummies, and they looked the exact same. Like I didn't see them. I didn't even know about them. But I saw why it was crawling around. Right? There's so many people. He's crawling around all night. And random people are picking them up, and I'm like, "What's in his mouth?" And I look and I see a fucking sour strip, 
And I panicked. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! And my, I'm like, I think why we got to go to the emergency room. He has, he has a edible in his mouth. They're like, no, no, the kids have the same looking ones. It's okay. I almost had a fucking heart attack. Oh my god! Yeah. I thought my my freaking year old son was sucking out an edible, but it wasn't. Thank you God. Me. I That's where RA started. It. RA, what's it like being that young doing edibles? <laughs> RA knows how to like. <laughs> That's what oh, he actually, got with the Playboy <laughs> subscription. <laughs> <laughs> Homemade edibles. Actually, here's, they a, here's a question. They sent him a bowl, an edible, a and, a, and a hustler. Biz, Biz, do you think what did I do first? Have a Playboy subscription or a smoke a joint? RA, oh, tri- wow. RA historical trivia. I mean, I, let's get let's let this marinate a little bit so the fans can think about it. Um, this so, is I, I know thir- thir- what you said thirteen years old was when you got your first no, Playboy, or was it eleven? I, I was fourteen when when I got the publisher's clearinghouse application, and I legally subscribed under my own name to Playboy at fourteen. Oh, I you were ten. No, uh, Christ, man. I would I, mean, I would definitely say sm- you smoked weed yeah. before that. Yeah, and it's funny too. And you know, I was twelve years old, and I, I don't say his name. I don't want to throw him under the bus, but an Italian friend of mine, he used to keep it in the soup. Remember Sucrets, the fucking uh, before Altoids, they were like throat lozenges. It was the same type of tin as an Altoids, and he and the first I smoked, I was twelve years old, and there was peer pressure, total like you know, you know, I grew up in the Nancy Reagan, say, just say no era, and I was like peer pressure. And I smoked, and like first two times, nothing happened, absolutely nothing. Like I smoked Beat a cigarette, the wheels off high the THC. as a kite. And nothing happened. And, you know, I, I, years later, when I was probably 14 or 15, I was like, oh, okay, this is that. But I was 12 years old the first two times. And that's that's very common I, from what I read. To the first couple times you, you do cannabis, you don't actually get stoned. Your body's not used you to just, it. But you just squash. He, that's every- it. Hey, he's, he's still making up for those two times he didn't get oh, to feel anything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then some. I deserve but- this one. Um, <laughs> um, at least you put the rumors to the fact that it, uh, it stunts uh, brain development to rest. Yeah, well, I mean, listen. I know I said I was tall. I wouldn't, and Makes I know we have a, we have a, a cross spectrum of listeners of all ages. And listen, I'm you know I know we have fun with it and joke about it, and and we you know we're users of it. It's it's the, it's a modern what he's trying thing. to say is he's a role model, and you should probably listen and, to him, folks. Well, I'm saying you should you shouldn't you know use it on a regular basis when your brain is still developing. Like when you're 12, 13, you know I know we all try things, we experiment, but you know I didn't become a regular user of cannabis until I was like my late teens or early early adulthood, and that's what I would say to everybody else because yeah, your brain is developing. Right. And, you know, it, it's not a, it's not a good thing to start no. that young, but it's a good uh, PSA, right? You're, you're, like, a, anyway, you're like a so. dare officer right now. <laughs> Seriously, I yeah, fuck that noise. Going so back you to know the what dare is biz. Massachusetts <laughs> schools have police so walking propaganda. around so dare, pro- drug abuse, <laughs> propaganda, education with like a crime dog with them. So back to me oh, ripping rough. a line on uh, Christmas Eve. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that was snow, dude. I, I my last Yankee swap uh, with it's funny. I. I don't take pot in them at all. It was a family one. And I, I got the, the bum draw. I ended up with a pair of, like, one pair of crew socks, and they had a Boston Red Sox B on them. Like, they were probably fucking $4 and a you $20 thing. You went jerked off on them in the middle of the party? Oh, Jesus Christ, no. man. Fuck, that's business role. I was thinking that. Jokes. I just, I keep those in now. No, I, I know. I should I should have known socks. You either yeah. did that or you're still wearing these socks to this yeah. day. That's my guess. No, and, and I never wore them. I had them in my drawer. I was like, whatever. And then I ended up getting tickets uh, October 20, was it 20th, 27th or 20th, whatever, of 04, Game 7, Yankees. I was like, I'm going down. And I wore them for my socks. I got tickets for Game 7, Yanks, socks, when they were that huge comeback. So I wore them underneath. But I couldn't show anybody because I was petrified to get jacked up in the Bronx. So I only would flash them to, like, other Red Sox fans. And then a week later, I was in St. Louis. I wore them to St. Louis. And that's it. Those are the only times I wore them. So... Please so credit. The shilling, it's the shilling bloody sock and the yeah. R-Age's yeah. sock. They're next to each other at the Hall of Fame now. I don't know how yeah, many exactly. of you yeah. knew that. So one's but, ketchup, though, and one's real jizz. No, I'm just kidding, Kurt. I know that's blood. <laughs> if we don't get credit for that comeback by the socks by, what, next week, R-A, we're coming after oh, him again? Oh, fuck. You're jumping, you're jumping the gun. We'll get there soon, you motherfucker. I know yeah, in wrapping that. up everything, guys, I hope everyone had an awesome Christmas. And Biz, you said that well. It's... A lot of stuff just sucks right now, but to be around my family, and I'm, I'm hoping everyone else was around their family, and for people who weren't, we're thinking of you. Um, it's an amazing time to really appreciate what you have, so let, let's try to be onward and upward here. That's, yeah. that's me talking to myself for this podcast. Don't get mad. I have a new thing when COVID comes up. I'm disengaging. I'm disengaging. I'm disengaging. That's what I say over and over. If things mm-hmm. get shut down, I'm actually going to start, uh, me and RA talked about it on our YouTube channel, we're going to do live yoga sessions. We, we're gonna a lot call of fat. Wick and a lot of fat. Wick a lot of fat. And we're just going to, we're like you said, we're going to combat the negative thoughts. Just like Rico Bosco blocks people on Twitter, we're just going to block any negative conversation about COVID. Yeah. Done with it. Breathe in. Um, 
we, we mentioned the Winter Classic from the jump. Uh, we are going to be at Cowboy Jack's for a meet and greet on Saturday uh, at 2.30 Central Time. It's the location 126 North 5th Street in Minneapolis. So, again, we'll be there before the game. Uh, another note, Biz, I understand you uh, have a few teammates for the Chicklets Cup you want to share with us at this time? All right, breaking news. Grinelli, if you've not posted it yet, for the team, for my ball hockey team at the Chicklets Cup, Terry Ryan and Terry Ryan Sr. are coming in. Terry Ryan Sr. will be right coaching, on. and Terry Ryan, who is a ball hockey legend, will be captaining my squad. That is the first two announcements. We will continue with more. And, gee, we have even bigger news that hasn't broken yet, and we're going to keep that in the holster for next week. Yes, we'll keep that in the holster for next week. But, Biz, we actually do have a word from uh, Terry Ryan right now. Ooh. Hi, I'm Terry Ryan Jr., I'm Terry Ryan also, except they call me Senior. And we're happy to be the latest pickups on the Big Deal Selects, part of the Chicklets Cup in beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada, on February 3rd and 4th, part of NHL All-Star Weekend. Senior, did you see any of my ball hockey swag lately? National Championship, World Championship. <coughs> see you in Vegas for the Spit and Chicklets Cup. Well, folks, if you're not excited, I am. We're going to beat the wheels off anybody in the A division. And apparently there's been some barking online with the kids who won it last year in Detroit. The, wait, you're doing foot hockey or roller hockey? Foot hockey. Foot hockey. Did you just say foot hockey? That team. Foot hockey? <laughs> and that, what do you mean? I don't know. What do you, foot On your feet or on your roller blades, all right. I mean, I don't know. What the fuck? It's ball Listen, hockey biz, or roller hockey. Biz, <laughs> chewed up bubblegum nose, kid. Will dust you guys. He I, was you got you think you have a chance against that we're, team? We're putting in a we're putting in a legitimate team. What? Yes, you're, I do. you're putting in a we. Zach Wierenski had a team. You guys are all retired. He's an NHL All Star. These okay. these guys. Well, hey, you have, Terry, well Terry I've, I've made you. I've made champion. you look like a fool with your uh, Edmonton Oilers prediction. And your, oh really? You oh, could oh th- really? You oh, could no. you could thank the stoppage. And if you want to keep talking about my ball hockey team, that you've heard two people that have been announced: the head coach, who's a fucking legend out east, and then other guy who's won a world championship, and I believe uh, a North American ball hockey championship and Terry Ryan who's going to be I the captain back, of the I team I didn't know that. Okay. I didn't know that. All right. I didn't know that. Yeah. So he's a legitimate ball hockey player. Oh yeah. Oh okay. yeah. All right. And he's well, helping we'll me see. assemble the squad. So anybody who wants to show up to Detroit and get bent over no spit no loops Vegas, and paper Vegas, finish. Not Detroit. Oh, I said Detroit. Sorry. I, I meant Vegas. You, you can want go to show Detroit though. I'll I'll be in Detroit. Uh no, but if you're going to show up to Vegas, we'll fuck you up. Bring even that, toys. even that guy's with the, the guy with the nose like at the half chewed caramel. I don't think he would show face knowing the team that I'm going to assemble. Uh, I, I mean, you're playing in the A division. I'm guessing if you if you're oh, busting yeah. out the big guys, oh, like yeah. T Ryan. Oh, I thought yeah. you said a word from Terry Ryan as if Terry Ryan is capable of saying a word. <laughs> <laughs> love you. T- love we're you. Gonna, we're going to actually have a whole different uh, content crew following him and his old man around just to kind of get everything oh. in. So uh, it'll be a good time. That nice little special announcement. And and one of our major sponsors for that tournament, Pink Whitney. I know we always mention them oh. off the hop. Uh, I had enjoyed some uh, uh, over the holidays, and I'm sure you did, Wit. And we, uh, we hope a, a lot of you did, and you uh, enjoyed it responsibly. Perfect segue because we're in between Christmas and New Year's. A lot of time off, a lot of partying. So make sure you load up in the old Pink Whitney. Don't be a deadbeat and show up empty-handed at your house parties and whatnot. And if you got no parties and no invites on the agenda, make sure you stop by your local joint, like my place, the Warren Tavern across the street. They carry Pink Whitney, and your place should too. So stroll up to the bar and order a little Pink Whitney. Enjoy for the holidays. All right, boys. Well, the NHL made it official with uh, the Chicklets crew. Uh, and again, not myself. The Chicklets crew broke last week. They announced that its players would not be going to the Olympics because of the havoc that COVID has wreaked on the schedule so far. It'll be the second straight Olympics without NHLs. The last time they played was way back in 2014. So no Sid, Nate Dogg, and McJesus on the same team. Huge bummer for fans. Patrice Bergeron said he come out. He said he was definitely going to go no matter what. I honestly don't think, guys, the protocols really scared these guys. I think a lot of these guys were willing to say, fuck it, I'm going to go. And if it happens, it happens. And I think that scared the owners in turn. But, again, uh, other guys, Stamkos and Marshawn, they, these guys have been champing at the bit for years to get there. And Marshawn, he was pretty vocal, very pointed in his comments. Gee, I think we should run that one. It's very disappointing. Um, you know, that that something that was – promise and part of the cba um when we last uh signed the deal um i almost felt like they were trying to get out of it for a while uh and they didn't want us to go um 
you know, there should be something in place or put in place where we can, we should be able to go and experience that. Um, you know, guys work their entire lives. And I know that at the end of the day, um, they really, they don't care about the Olympics. They, they don't make money on it. And that's ultimately what this is. It's a business, um, you know, and, and, and we're an asset. Let's just call a spade a spade, um, you know, and, and they don't want to risk us getting hurt over there. And, and uh, you know, so that's obviously part of it. But, um, you know, it should be the player's option to, to go play in the tournament. It's the Olympics. It's the best of the best. And if you've earned the right and you've earned the, yeah, the opportunity to go there. Um, you should have the option to go play. So it's extremely disappointing um, that the players aren't going. Uh, you know, again, I think guys have, have worked their entire lives, put themselves in a position to to compete at that level and in that opportunity. Um, and it should be guys' decisions whether they choose to go or not, regardless of what's happening in the world. If the Olympics are on and, and they're playing, then, then the best players in the world should have that option. So it's, it's, it's tough to deal with. I mean, he's, you know, flat out calls it like he sees it. Like it's the owners, it's a business where assets, they didn't want to risk it. And, you know, to that point, I think if the owners don't want this biz, just go back to the world cup, do it in the summer. Nobody gets hurt. The owners don't give whatever. We don't have to fucking pause the season. It seems like the obvious thing to do. One more thing before I throw to you, biz. Uh, McDavid said, I do think we need to find a way to get a best on best tournament done at some point here, which just reiterates my last point. So. Go ahead. You, you hit it. I was going to talk about McDavid, and he said it in his statement. He goes, we need a best on best, and I think that they really need to to evaluate this World Cup of Hockey. That way they can do it every year, maybe every other year. I, I'm not how often, uh, or not sure how often people would want to see that and how much like wear and tear it is with especially a lot of the best players going deep into playoffs, but I, I couldn't agree more. And then all of a sudden, you don't have to worry about maybe taking it uh, into countries where you're going to have to wake up in the middle of the night to watch it. You can do it in North America. If you decide that you want to go grow it and, and do it over um, over in Europe or anywhere else, you can do that. I, I would uh, recommend not going back to the split teams. I didn't really like... I, at the time, I liked the fact that they did the Young Guns and then they did the USA team and then the Canadian team. But moving forward, if they did do a best-on-best... Go to how many ever countries you're going to put in it. Um, I would assume probably what twelve wit, and and do the uh, I best. I think if you make your own, you could even go smaller. And, I don't and, think the Olympics. Need- and and I'll just touch on one more thing. The biggest thing and the reason why I would want them to do that is because then you would be able to monetize it to where then you could grow the salaries to where the top end players are making more of the equivalent to what maybe the other leagues are making. I think Connor McDavid, based on his skill set, is underpaid given the rules of the NHL. You're only allowed as a player to make 20% of your team's cap. By doing these types of tournaments and doing them in my opinion, at least to start in North America, the amount of money that you can generate through like the revenue of the tickets and the ads will keep bumping up that, that pool so they can elevate this, uh, um, help me out here. The, the collective salary cap. Yeah. The salary cap. Jesus Christ. My, my brain's fried towards the end of this rant. You here. think that tournament's going to like make the cap that I, much? I think that in, in a, in a short window here, if they were able to execute it in the next two, three years, if they could put it together. Yeah. Cause right now I think there's like a, what a, a at least three, four year gap here of the players that are going to be repaying the owners. I think this would be a, a quick way um, in order to recoup some of that money so they don't have to pay as much in escrow. I think it's a great way to grow the game. I think it's a better way to have control of it. Um, I I mean, different people have different opinions about the double IHF and how they run things. And I, we have to get what to What is a, yours? Um, I, I, I personally don't like the... F- I, I think it's odd that, you know, you get basketball and, and hockey are the only two sports where you're taking... Uh, professionals and using them in the Olympics, correct? I guess you could kind of say it on the women's side as well because they use WNBA players and then there's now professional women's league set up where they could also go play. Um, I think given that in, I would imagine in the Winter Olympics, at least for the North American crowd, it is easily the most watched sport and generates probably the most revenue and most watched thing. Would you say that's pretty accurate? Yeah, so with the, the best on best or that figure skating and downhill skiing, probably sure. those three. Yeah, but ultimately it's a big money maker for them and it's like the incentive that the NHL has to send the players over there is that it does grow the game. 
That's that, that right? Because they're not gaining any financial benefit from it. And of course, the players in return, they want to go experience that. I don't think that that should be taken away from them. I just think that we should definitely at least have that your own setup of the World Cup and making it legitimate and making people excited about it and 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 doing it over here. So I don't have an issue with the WIHF other than the fact that there's nothing being compensated back to the league for them to go get to use the assets other than, of course, they're going to grow the game. Well, in this situation, given the money that's been lost by the league, they're saying is like, guys, this is kind of a favor that we do for you of, of being able to go there. We're not we're we're, we're going to get fucked if you guys end up getting stuck over there uh, and and then you guys are going to have to pay for it. And then we're the ones who are going to continue to get bitched at because like people obviously aren't mad at the players they are mad at the owners more so in the I, I would say in these CBA negotiations. I've ranted on a while, but I, I just wanted to touch on the fact that I think it's adamant that if people are that desperate, which I am for best on best, I think that in two, maybe three years, they could already have one of these out of the gate. They could make it successful. There's tons of times to, time to prepare for it. It would make up for for no, nobody getting to experience two Olympics in a row now. And hey, if maybe it doesn't work out, you just go right back to the Olympics and or you do both. So I have I, I don't have beef with the double IHF. What I'm saying is I don't I I'm in agreement with the owners here where it doesn't benefit them. And it in, in fact, it fucks them and they never really see any benefit other than the the other argument would be like, look at franchise value and how much the game's grown. Well, it's like, well, okay, well, it's also grown in years that they haven't been to the Olympics the last two. So I, I just to contradict whoever's saying that. Um, I think my most memorable uh, as a fan moment growing up in hockey was the 96 World Cup. It was this incredible win by Team USA, and and they they got it done in Game Three in Montreal. They had lost Game One in Philadelphia. Game Two they won in Montreal. They won both games in Canada to win the little final series. It was amazing how it all worked out. And interestingly enough, that tournament I remember. I'm 99 percent sure this could be off, but I'm pretty sure there was a division in Europe for the round robin. Which made it even more special. I remember like watching Sweden or Finland play over in Sweden wow. or Finland with an amazing crowd. So this was the NH. You know, I don't, I don't. Who technically ran the the World Cup in '96? What I was it? it was Vince NHL, McMahon. No, Jeff. Vince McMahon <laughs> ran it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Canada lost, right? I, I yeah. don't know, yeah, but, exactly. but I, all your points make sense, and <laughs> it's great because it's leading up into camp. You know, guys are guys are ready. Guys who aren't going, obviously, they're going into camp. These guys who do play, they probably get a little bit of a break after when they get back to their NHL teams. The season gets started. I'm all down for that. And and you could tell truth truthfully, like the the players like Stamkos and Marshawn and the ones we mentioned and Crosby and McDavid and these guys, they were pretty upset. Like Kyle Connor, US, he would have made Team USA. He was really these guys wanted to go. So when it's so easy for fans and media and even owners to say, what the fuck are we doing? Like, this is this is foolish. Like These guys have dreamt about yeah. this since they were born. So I understand completely players being disappointed. I was even a little surprised. That I thought there'd be a couple more guys that would be like, ah, you know what, the chance of five weeks in China, no chance. But nobody had that comment, and everyone was pretty bummed out. So as long as we get a best on best at some point, any way we could make money for the league, which then makes money for the players and shortens that time, I think that what you were talking about, Biz, I thought they said in the summer of 24, they would be completely paid back to the owners the players would be. That is before all these games in, in Canada are going to have no fans and cost millions and millions a game. So that's going to even get pushed back a little further. So when you say the league can make money and the owners can make money, that's another reason they right, might really tr- tr- truly push right away to get this done. Yeah, and I think my comments even on prior podcasts and today make it sound like I'm like, ah, fuck the Olympics. No, man, like I'm, you know, I'm bent out of shape for these guys too. I wanted to watch that hockey. I'm, I'm trying to look at it big picture here and what's best for the NHL and the league. But, you know, I tend to try to look at the positives. You are going to get to watch the women play over there, um, you know, and and that's going to be exciting. And I think we're still going to end up going to the New Jersey Gambling House and doing something there to watch what's hopefully ends up being a Team Canada versus Team USA final. Yeah, one of the best rivalries in hockey right yeah. now, no doubt. Those two, those two teams hate each other. And well, I can't really say who who I bumped into up in Canada, but uh, when I was up there last week, it was a player on one of the uh, former teams, and 
I, I, I re- remarked her how much I love watching Canada and Team USA play in the women's division. And she was like, you know, you, you talk about hate. Like, there's nothing better than playing someone who not only you hate, but they hate you equally. And it just brings out the best news. So uh, it's good stuff. But uh, a couple other notes on that. Uh, Team Canada GM Doug Armstrong and Team USA GM Bill Guerin obviously both stepped down from their positions now that there are going to be no NHL guys. Uh, and it literally just came over the wire a minute ago. John Van Beesbrook is going to be the GM for Team USA. David Quinn is going to take over the coaching Quinny. duties. And uh, Claude Julien is going to coach Canada. That was already planned if the NHL had to pull out way back when. And it's believed that uh, our pal Shane Doan, donor, is going to step in as the GM. That hasn't been officially announced yet. That's been the scuttlebutt and speculation, Biz. All right. Didn't you mention that to me via text? Or I think you were, you were curious because he did it for the World, uh, World Cup last year. Yeah, I, th- I think I had asked you, but as far as legit, like uh, officially announcement, they haven't said that yet, but uh, he's probably the odds on favorite. Okay. Uh, also, C- Armstrong did confirm the obvious that Sid was going to be the captain. Uh, he said he already had three lines and two sets of D locked in. The goalie oh. situation was very fluid. Oh, uh, ahead, sorry, all right, quickly. That's all right, buddy. Every single, they should have to release the rosters yeah. that they had picked already. Yes. Come on, guys. Yes. Help everyone out right do it, now. Do it on Canadian television. Just at television. least cause a war online. Armstrong should just hammer that tweet out right now. This was my team. <laughs> yeah. Go, at, co- go put ahead. You, no, put you don't two idiots me, on it. PK Sluban, first left D. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking right. Just stir it up. I love it. Oh, uh, shit. That'd be awesome. Uh, and Well, I mean, I guess a little positive note, I guess. NHLPA Executive Director Donald Fear said he expects that players will be back for 2026. You know, obviously a few years away, but at least we'll have that to look forward to if we don't get a best on best in the meantime. But uh, any other things you wanted to add on this subject before we move along to the NHL portion of will, COVID? Will we still be uh, here 2026 Oh, yeah. We have to, I mean, we have to talk about, like, people being all rattled at RA for wanting the credit of breaking the story. I mean... Did we like not this. break the story? Am I like, I mean, like we now this story? Like, this story, sorry, this story was, in, it was, it was weird. It was like there we broke it, but I feel like nobody's getting credit for breaking it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, right, I haven't seen anyone right. be like, oh, this is the guy who broke it, so... Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought that up. And listen, I, uh, to, for the whole me looking for credit, no, it was always a we thing. I, I didn't get the scoop. I didn't get the text. I didn't say I... Because if I did, I would have I tweeted from my account and wrote the blog. I was very much, this is a chicklets thing. Someone else in the group got the text. It was confirmed. So I always said, we got the scoop. We, we, we. It wasn't uh, me looking for credit. It was us because... And I know people say, who gives a fuck? Well, you know who cares? is people who do this for a living. People in the media world. People who cover stories. Like, the, like I said to you guys, years ago like you score a goal that's the highlight for you for what you guys do well nerds like me and Grinelli who work in journalism that's that's a highlight for us getting a fucking scoop like that getting a story put your name on it and the whole world reacts to what you just broke and again it wasn't me it was us so that's the the point is just you're supposed to it's almost a professional courtesy and I know like Adrian Data a longtime Colorado beat writer he gave me props our buddy NHL room is daily he gave us props, and I think people did think, Biz, that we were guessing. It was a, an educated guess, and as far as the Andrew Peters and Craig Reve, tons of respect. They have the After the Whistle podcast. I know a lot of their fans were chirping at us saying they broke it first. Oh, and there was shit. A t- there was yeah. a tweet saying that uh, the NHL players, here's a piece of advice, don't buy any jerseys. The NHL players aren't going. So I went back and I listened to the podcast, and, and they weren't claiming it. They were pretty, they were cool about it. They said they love what we do with the fans. Like, it wasn't them, it was their fans. And I listened, and I think it was Andrew Peters who said, I'm 100% of the opinion that the players aren't going to China. And this is where nuance of the job comes in and subtleties of journal. It's like, that's not a report. That's his informed opinion. I think one of you guys probably said the same thing, and other people said the same thing on their, on their shows. I don't think they're going to go that's different than having someone who's in the the union texting us and saying it's toast the olympics aren't happening take the report and run with it and that's what happened with us so again those guys not any disrespect to them if they if they had put a report out and said hey we got the scoop here 100 percent would give credit to them i think they were giving their informed opinion based on what i looked and what i read and you know we were the first ones to say hey we got a source here and we put it out there, and I think it was easy for people to say, "Oh, we know what's happening." Well, yeah, the writing might have been on the wall, but we didn't. We could have just tweeted out fucking willy nilly three weeks ago, not when we did when we got a fucking tip. So, I'll tell you that's what, that. there's not no. I can't about even. It. I can't even argue with that point. That was masterful. It was um, like Will Ferrell in uh, old school when he blacks out <laughs> during the debate with James Carvel. <laughs> and all right, I will say I agree with you, but I still don't give a shit. <laughs> 
I wouldn't yeah, care. I, I don't, don't con- expect you to. I don't consider myself a journalist, but you you giving me that breakdown, I'm like, I'm Team RA, so I will support you in that statement. So give me my fucking credit, bitches. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, if you if there you go. You you got the text on me. That's what I'm saying. It wasn't about me, me, <laughs> no, me. It I'm was just, about us. I'm just because, kidding. No, we- I just said, hey, is uh, give us – I don't care about the credit. Just don't shit on us when we're wrong, which is like usually like 90% of the time. <laughs> yeah, well, well, again, that's where the like – the nuance comes in. It's like, okay, us saying it, well, we heard something and passed yeah. along as, and call it rumor boys as opposed to saying, all right, no, this happened. We're going to tweet about it, call it breaking news, write a blog about it. There's, you know, there's differences in how you're presenting things. And, and, and we had it. And yeah, a lot of people, frankly, didn't, didn't give credit where it was due. But I forgot all about it until Whitney brought it up. So we can move on. Yeah, sounds like <laughs> it. Uh, <laughs> I had that pistol loaded, biz. You know that he's got the uh, he's got the what's the scene from uh, Billy Madison when he's got the lipstick on and he's got his like his gun ready to fucking and he got the off list that he crossed. Thank God oh, I called Steve that Bus- guy, <laughs> Steve Buscemi. That a boy, that a boy. G G. Actually, I got one more for you. Uh, would you get uh, Alana for Christmas? Oh, I went all out. Oh, oh, all we out. get yeah. another. We get bearing another lead here. Or what? Yep. Yep. I uh, <laughs> no got our nice Lululemon jacket, and I'll tell you what. Where I uh, really spilt the spilt the bag was I got her Billie Eilish tickets. No Those way. are tough to come by, boys. Billie Eilish is like the it girl right Ocean now. Ocean eyes. I got her oh. Billie Eilish tickets at MSG. So that's nice. that's so right thoughtful now. of you, G. And this isn't like at all a shot. I. I, I can you explain to me the love for Billie Eilish? It's really depressing the songs I've heard. Like, but like she's there's no upbeat songs, right? I've mm. gone through her Spotify to see if I'm missing something, and it is like, wait, is I'll that tell a sign you this. of the times. You think her Please. fans are oh, just hard, throw, just hard, throw oh, yeah. ambient. It's it's the natural ambient. Just it, and I'm not even like I know this girl's super talented. I'm just saying in terms of how popular she is, you see all these like you know high flying, crazy upbeat music. You know, professionals nowadays and her it's just kind of like really dark well, there's a demographic for that i would put her that like, bigger one oh i i would say i would put her fandom where like maybe adele's is at uh maybe where beyonce's is at i think she's already had an apple documentary done like she moves yeah. the needle this girl i yeah. like that is it ocean eyes song oh yeah can we play can and i like some slow music that? just every song can i sing it <laughs> Slow and too sad. I, no, it's I unbelievable. Know. But there's a bunch yeah. of remixes to it. But I mean, yeah. we can move on from Billie Eilish. Yeah. Other than the fact that um, maybe I'll attend the show with her. I don't mind her. She seems like a pretty grounded individual for a young woman who's had a crazy amount of success in her teen years. Like I, I watched some of that documentary, and yeah, like what her music's probably not my cup of tea. But she just seems like a pretty, pretty down to earth like person who has a good perspective on life for a yep. kid who's a pre- She's yeah. super and, 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 and yeah. like, I actually I'm not going at Billie Eilish at all to each to each their own all I'm kind of saying is the biggest acts in the world are upbeat let's go music I've never seen that quiet and like slow and soft music be this big that's She's what I'm like saying John give me Mayer someone else who's been oh, this I'm, big at that I'm tempo. really glad you John uh, Mayer I, I'm, who? I'm I think she's like the John Mayer of like for like girls. That's a pretty good analogy. I'm glad you put out that fire with her fan base, Wick. Because if you think the fucking Islanders fans are crazy, poh, uh, buddy, you're dealing with like I would Swift, body Swift, Billy Swifties Islanders on fans. four locos. Just put it that way, buddy. You, you'd be toast. Uh, We'd be doing the podcast, just the three of us, guys. All right, boys. Uh, before we get to the, actually the NHL stuff, I just want to say we got an awesome guest coming up in a little while. Uh, we did this interview at his farm down in South Jersey when we were in Philly, what, November? Keith Jones, uh, Philadelphia oh, Flyers. Yes, I'll call him a legend of Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, he's been doing radio TV for the last 20 years. Uh, absolute beauty of a guy. Tremendous stories. Good stuff coming later. I just want to let you know, give you something to look forward to while we cover the rest of the stories here. Uh, and as you're all well aware already, the NHL's Christmas break was extended by a few days this year. The games ended on um, the 21st instead of the 23rd. There were 14 games scheduled for last night, Monday night. They've been postponed. And then literally the NHL just tweeted a bunch more have been postponed. Uh, a lot more players have been added to the sniffles list since uh, we last met. Uh, it looks like they're going to pencil all these games in over the Olympic break. I don't know. It sucks. It is what it is. Uh, and then Elliot Friedman tweeted that they're going to um, formalize some CBA arrangements or exemptions, rather, so they can carry an extra goaltender. There'll be an emergency cap exemption. Uh, there's going to be taxi squads, and I'm not going to burn you with all the boring details. Uh, but Frank Saravalli actually tweeted some information. He said that uh, the taxi squads are for, quote, readily available players and not salary cap management tools like 
teams were kind of finding the loopholes last year. Well, they're not going to allow that this year. And there's another big point, uh, Biz, going back to what we were just talking about with Marshawn and the owners. Uh, he said that seems the cost for most everything, emergency recalls, taxi squad stipends, and taxi squad benefits will be borne by the NHLPA by virtue of the player's share. So in other words, the player's share, 50% of the revenue pie, is going to add to their debt. So the players are taking this one. It's going to add to their debt. And, and I'm, I'm shocked so shocked to find we out. We went from the, summer the of 2024 to summer of 2028. Wit. We're going to be doing World Cup of Hockey's every six months. <laughs> Why? Why it's gonna think his kid has an edible in his mouth by the time the players have paid back? The owners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But did Uncle Ryder give you that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh God. So I mean, yeah. um, the taxi squad thing makes total sense. You yeah. can't. This is not going anywhere. You got to be able to continue to play these games. Done enough canceling the games. Be able to call guys up. Now, interesting enough. All right. Sorry, I was just checking my phone for some notes. I might have missed you saying you cannot call up players that make more than a million bucks. Did you mention that? I, I didn't. That was one of the many. There was a bunch of details. I didn't. Yeah, know. no, no, don't. Yeah. No, don't. So yeah. it's interesting because you can't try to get this guy who you've buried down in the Myers. I'm, I can't think of anyone as an example right now. Um, but you got to bring up a guy who's not making a ton of money and not somebody that's down there for the blatant reason of beating the cap a la what Tampa Bay did last year. So that was kind of a detail I noticed in, in terms of the, the fine print. Yeah, I can't think yeah. of one guy yeah. who would who would be making big money in the minors this year. Usually, there's a couple who get sent down. And I, I know, we're, but that we should be. There's probably twenty. Yeah, there's probably twenty. <laughs> Christmas is taking a lot out of you me. You guys do the work. Uh, what, uh, do you, what else you got? All right. I'm, the I'm last game. This. Oh, sorry. The, the last game was Tampa Bay uh, at Vegas Tuesday the twenty first. Um, and uh, my pal Derek Lalonde actually stepped in for Coop. Coop was well tested positive. I don't think he was actually sick, but he couldn't coach. So Derek stepped in and. Uh, they got the W, so I text. I said, I hope you bought Vassy a nice bottle of wine after that game because fucking he stole another one for you guys. He's fucking unreal to watch. Best He's goalie incredible. on the planet, so incredible. he has good stuff. But, but you I, know what? Yeah. Vegas, there's a, there's a couple teams that I think this whole layoff hurt, and there's a couple teams that I think it helped, and Vegas being one, if you're getting games delayed, it's more time to get Eichel back. It's more time to get more people healthy, and that team looks great lately. So even though they lost that last game, this is a good thing for Vegas. I don't want to take – I don't want to take any type of success away from anyone, Wit, but we saw it the last time. Like, depending on how many teams get slowed down for how long, it's it's totally different coming out of the gate here again. Oh, Vancouver is just completely hosed by this. Where, you know, Edmonton, Vegas, like there's other teams who are loving this. Toronto gets hosed by this. They were unreal. And they got this long. Not, so mind you, they're going to get Marner. The, Marner. Marner was injured, so uh, like maybe true. they look at it differently. True. But I mean, and, and listen, like you, you look at Philadelphia the year that everything got shut down and how well they were playing beforehand. And and you talk to some of their guys, and they said after the break they just weren't able to find their chemistry again. They just couldn't find their mojo, and and other other factors involved, like you know, staying disciplined. Fuck, you're around the holidays, man. Like that extra few bottles of wine, the getting into all the snacks and shit like that. Like getting out of shape pretty quick is not a hard thing to do. And all of a sudden you're behind the eight ball like that. So um, coming out of the gate here, RA, I think we, we touched on it last podcast. There's legitimate 12 teams that are within four points of that first place spot. So this is this is very interesting times and another reason why I'm happy that the NHL is focusing on the NHL because I think this is going to be a real fun uh, race to the finish once everything settles down with the COVID stuff. No doubt. And like you said, that three-week Olympic break, I think they can have a little bit of breathing room now where they can – maybe where they might not have postponed it a couple weeks ago now. Okay, we can postpone it. We got this time to make up. Plus, even if they got to run over schedule in, into the summer, it, it's – you know, they're only beholden to themselves and nobody else. Bingo. And not not jamming all these games in at the end of the season and then not getting as good of a product either at the end of the year and going into playoffs. So the, the definitely RA with the rest component. All right, well, we do got some fun stuff to talk to. The World Juniors started up Sunday night. Uh, let's see, in Edmonton, in Red Deer. Shout out Rick from Red Deer, our buddy. Uh, the USA is looking for its first ever repeat after beating Canada last year for the gold, and they started off with a 3-2 win over a pretty tough Slovakia team that got within a goal with two and a half minutes left. Uh, Drew Kamesso, goalie for the, uh, the States, he was under siege in the third, but held the foot. Uh, also, Sens fans wet. they got to be drooling at this kid, Jake Sanderson. He played over 22 minutes absolute stud i mean he's at north dakota now but this kid was unreal and they're gonna ride him all tournament yeah he is uh he's the real deal there's a couple guys i saw yesterday biz i caught at least parts of all the games and 
The talent level is just so ridiculous now. But that, that that Sanderson and the entire USA team, they look good. I think it's going to be really hard to repeat, not just because they got it last year. They didn't have that many returnees. And just to do that in this tournament, I mean, Canada's been able to do it. Canada's a wagon every year. But repeating is very difficult. So I hope that they can get it done. They look good. But Lehman is a good coach, man. He coaches at Providence. This guy is seems very dialed in. I think guys love playing for him. He mentioned which was, you know, it's it's a little bit of a cliche, but the, the way he put it's true in that, like, we're not trying to repeat. This is a completely different team. Like, I know, like, the, the team that won before, it's not like that team's back here. That's not, that's a repeat. This is a different group, and I, I just love this tournament, right? I think back to the times I got to play, and it was just such a great experience. One year I played, my first year, my draft year, I didn't play much. My second year after being drafted, played a lot. That's where I saw, played against Ovechkin for the first time. There's just so many different things that go into this tournament that that, that give me great memories. So I, I'm fired up to watch. Um, the guy that, that really, really sticks out to me right away, just after the first day, this Simon Edvinson that oh my Detroit God. picked. Well, that's, I was going to hop in there and say what's crazy is how big they are and how well they can move now. So, it's so fucking even, nuts, yep. that even shorthanded the goal he scored. Game. Yeah, the, the shorty goal, the, his speed. Even at the high school game I went to, which is not even on the, a, a, a level near the World Juniors, kids can move now. And I, I think like the way the game's changed, to become a good player, to play in the NHL, you got to be able to fly. So now you're seeing, you know, Biz, it's been a long time since we came into pro hockey. Generations, new generations are coming up where they all fly. So now some of them, right, they don't have the, the, the hockey IQ and the skills that other guys have, but there's no slow guys out there. There's no slow guys with sick hands out there chucking sauce. So you're going to be able to motor. And that's what I noticed about that Edvinson kid. It's like, oh, my, this guy's six six. Gazelle. They have him in Cider. Him and Mo Cider, and uh, I just – Detroit, heads up, dude. Detroit fans got their hands in their pants listening to this right now, just working Steve themselves Wright. over. That uh, kid was a joke. But uh, Owen Power then, same draft. He has the hat trick. It's just the, the amount of talent this Oh, we're going to hop to Owen just like that, just that casually. The greatest I'm just, defenseman. I'm just thinking. I'm just watching this Russian kid meet all this stud play. It's like I'm just I'm I'm kind of in my own world right now. I apologize. That, I was I was more shocked at the fact that a Canadian defenseman had never scored a hat trick in a World Juniors before Owen Power. And what a fucking debut by this kid! Just snapping it around. And I want to say it happened after that third goal where he gets that little rush up the ice and he gets it close and he, he kind of got jammed off to the side of the net, but he tries to go between the legs just like Tom, uh, Tomas Hurdle did for the fourth fucking goal. So a very special night. He's going to probably win 10 Norrises unless Buffalo fucks it up like they do everything. Uh, Canada looked uh, really good. I was surprised I maybe didn't see as much as I thought I would from from Bedard and Shane, right? But these guys are young. They're going to find their legs and, and catch up to the speed. Very impressed with uh, Cole Perfetti. Did you see that fucking backhand yeah. marinara sauce he handed to... Uh, What's the, the the other kid's name? I'm forgetting. I I actually heard Perfetti's Perfetti's name. I was like, he's he can still play. So uh, Donovan Sabrang, Sabrango's mom. They interviewed it after, and 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 she was like so overwhelmed. She was like crying on air and stuff like that. But that was the kid that Perfetti. He drew two guys in and just threw that buttery sauce. Uh, I think that ended up tying the game. So a big moment for Canada. They play Czech who uh, they looked great in that first period. If anything, yeah. they were bringing it to Canada. They were up 3-1. Canada's coach calls a timeout. They literally score in that next shift, make it 3-2. Everything got settled down. They tie it 3-3. It was a barn burner of a first. But if you're going to take stupid penalties the way that the Czechs did midway through that second period, you're not going to fucking beat Canada if you're the Czech Republic. They made them pay, and, and it was the Owen Power show, man. I would say the most impressive part of uh, the first day of World Juniors, though, was uh, Craig Button. He went with the fucking Tupac hologram. Did you see that? Yeah. What, so he's not on site and they're just hologramming him in? So he's hologramming in from the other rink, I think, in Red Deer. So he was hologramming to Duffy and Bob McKenzie's thing on a delay and just snapping it around. Bob, and, and the way he was looking at them, it actually looked very legit. But it's the it, it's not being talked about enough so uh stick taps or, or clicks for craig button he's he was a star he, he surpassed owen powers as the first star day one at the world juniors this, um, this is this is actually an ra hologram the real ra sleeping right now while his hologram oh nice you, okay so, <laughs> go, that's all those bong hits you took when you were younger thinking of all these crazy ideas uh, those two times i didn't get anything man 
I, I, uh, the other one, one My last kid bag. too on Team USA, uh, Matthew Nyes, Toronto pick biz, second rounder, flying around, dude. Like, uh, plays at Minnesota, has got like a point per game. That's the other thing. I'm all over hockey DB elite prospects watching this. I love it. Yeah, and I was a little the, bored by the USA game. I, I was kind of fading in and out. I was, Canada was fucking, was very entertaining though. Oh, yeah. Fuck you, buddy. Guys, can I, uh, too, can I bro. throw a name out there? What? Plus guy. So, Jesper Wallstadt, he's the uh, goalie for Sweden. Last year, I said Yaroslav Askarov uh, rushes yeah, goalie. Yes, the next the Carey Price. In the tournament. I said he was going to be the next Carey Price. I think he was the worst goalie in the tournament last year. So, I'm doubling down this year. I think he's Jesper still a first round pick, wasn't he? Yeah. I know. I know. He holds. Or was his he stick picked like before the idiot. draft? Maybe he was picked. No, I think he had a no, bad he was picked world before. He had a bad world juniors. He's a little. Uh, he's a little too active. He's very athletic, but very active. He gets a little spazzy in there. So, so G, he you're got doubling down. Today. He, he Askarov did. Yeah, Askarov uh, got benched today for Russia against Swi- uh, Switzerland. I'll, I'll say this. I, I, I mean, Russia has just been very disappointing. They're the fifth strongest hockey nation now. It used to be like neck and neck with with USA and Canada, and I don't know. They what's were ahead going- of USA for so long. I, right. Yeah. Hey, my question, Biz. Do you have any idea why? Why are there kids who are in this World Junior that were drafted 2020? I, Isn't I it made, you only supposed to play after once after your draft year? No, I think it has everything to do with age. It doesn't have anything to do with draft because like some like like Ovi Ovi was a late birthday. So okay, he was okay. drafted. He was drafted later on. Now I had another name written down. This kid uh, Samuel uh, Helenius. Like, I'm fucking butchering it for Finland. He, is, he had three goals in the first two games. Uh, he was drafted in the second round, six six. Another guy who moves pretty good for a big guy. He's got three tucks, as I mentioned. His old man he actually used to play in the NHL. He played with Dallas. Chris, Kristen, so, right? Kristen uh, Hellenius. No, his his dad's actually named Sammy. So his name's Samuel, and his father's name's Sammy. Hellenius, okay. I think that's how you say the last name, but uh, he was a fifth rounder of the Flames, bounced around quite a bit, but this kid uh, I just mentioned, Samuel, he was actually born in Dallas because his old man was playing in the NHL at the time. So another, uh, he looks like a great second rounder, 6'6", six, six, huge frame, um, some silky mitt, so he's had a great start to the tourney, and he was one of the guys that popped out to me, but uh, you quickly mentioned McTavish. He looks like a man amongst boys. We talked about him. He's got like a fucking, he had a hairy chest out of the womb. Um, and I don't really have anyone Hold else. Hold on, Grinelli had the Swedish goalie. Oh, yeah. I was just saying Jesper Wallstad. I think he's. That's it? Ring. That's all you got? Yeah, I think he's, I'm doubling down. I think he's going to be the best goal in the tournament. And I think that Sweden will win the tournament if, uh, if he plays as good as he can. All right. He's going to get the LVP, least valuable player. Chalk it down. So I do like Sweden, but I think uh, in the end, it's just, it's too tough to pick against Canada. Uh, yeah, Canadians, I also like I don't Logan Cooley. Cooley. I really, oh. really like Logan Cooley. USA, 2022 draft eligible. Plays a development program this year. He's unbelievable. Okay, so I got one more topic. Um, Owen Power, going back to him. Uh, did you notice the fact that he's chewing bubble gum out there, just blowing bubbles, having a good time? Is he Love really? It. Love it. You I've... ask him, Biz, have, have we seen it? it? It hasn't been common. I think it was pretty common in the 50s and 60s, and then... I remember back when I was watching Stevie Lama, who played for the Blackhawks, Rangers, always chewing gum, always popping bubbles. Brian Noonan, MJ. another guy, always chewing gum. And I think, dude, you look cooler, especially if you blow a couple quick bubbles there, Biz, a couple gifts going. If I, I can, can't I mean, wait till he anymore. fucking buries the winner in OT against Team USA in the final and blows a fucking bubble in that coach he talks about face in line. <laughs> You're blown. talking a lot of smack for just losing last year and just not even having any sort of uh, issue with like your team thinking you're just gonna get it done again. Like you guys are the favorites, but you were last year too, and you didn't win. So I'm looking forward to another night on my couch where I can wear my old Olympic jersey and go bananas on Twitter. There you go. Uh, the final score Sunday was uh, Canada six three over the Czechs. The Swedes beat the Ruskies six to three, and the Finns beat Germans three to one. And then actually Monday, these scores just come in. The Finns beat the Austrians seven to one Monday, and uh, rushes up three to one as we as we speak over the Swiss. And uh, what as your point, uh, it's going to be tough for the U.S. to repeat. When you look at Canada's roster, uh, this is from our buddy Jordi Abastul. They have twelve first round draft picks on the roster and three possible number one overall picks. So obviously Owen Powell, who we've just talked about, taken by Buffalo and last year number one. Shane Wright is the consensus number one for the next draft, and then Connor Bedard is the likely number one in twenty three. So the idea they have 
three top fucking picks overall. Yeah, it's going to be a, a, a tough climb for the U.S. But. Here's my prediction. Bedard needed one game to catch up to the speed and figure everything out, and he's going to just fucking tear it up now. Him and Wright. There's a prediction right. for you. Right. Shove that right. in your hoop. Right there, we'll see. For you. Wow. I think that Matia Mitchkev kick, I think he looks unreal. Do you see that goal he had yeah, where he came filthy. down the right side? Uh, oh, wait. We, one thing we didn't talk about was a couple things with Team Russia. Putin, and, Putin called in that goal. It was not a goal by that uh, high-end Russian prospect. What's his name again, uh, Grinnell? Did you just say it? Yeah, that's what I was talking about. Matia Mitchkev. Yeah, like Mitchkev. 17. That was not a goal. What? But according to the rule book I read, it is. He dangled some compromat fucking. Oh, oh, so the net can come off the moorings before the puck is crossed the line. So if it was going in. If it's because of the defender, if it's his fault, the net came off the moorings. Okay, fair okay. enough. Putin with, so with the, the call. So the rules seemed a little yes. crazy. Like once you see that replay, I actually watched. I was like, wait a minute. This, is, this isn't a goal. But then like, if you read the rules, as crazy as it is, it was legit. Okay, so maybe there's so, some logic behind it. Maybe they should. Uh, they should change it in the NHL. Now, the other funniest thing, uh, other than the hologram, Tupac hologram by Button, was uh, Ivan, Ivan, Ivan. <laughs> the Russian Tony, kid. Tony, Tony, Tony. And everybody thought it was a typo, but apparently someone's like, no, no, that's his name. Ivan, Ivan, Ivan. He's, <laughs> he's like the fucking... Liked, uh, spitting chicklets. Uh, who, he, who did that comment? It was when you're a, trying to... What, what was it, Crowley? Did you do a, that? Yeah, when you're oh, trying to reach Dale. the word count, uh, Dale. That's that's uh, <laughs> yeah, Chicklets memes. memes. Uh, he's the best. He's a Russian NASCAR driver. <laughs> Ivan, Ivan, <laughs> Ivan. <laughs> uh, all right, a couple more notes uh, we got on this. I know this isn't on the NHL, ESPN. The, the usual drums were beaten about TV coverage, but the only way to watch this game is if if you were an NHL Network subscriber last night was in front of your fucking TV because there's no app for it. Like, in other words, you know, if you pay cable, you get the NHL network or you get satellite, you couldn't go anywhere and watch it streaming anyway. You had to be in front of your television, obviously, unless you, you know, subscribe to like uh, Sling TV, our sponsor, or other other competitors. But so in other words, you're paying for this channel and you can't watch it anywhere but in front of your TV. Like, I don't know if this is on the IIHF or what, but the fact that it wasn't streaming anywhere legally, that's a fucking joke, man. It's brutal. It's 2022. This isn't my fucking thing about cable companies this is like the huge product and you couldn't fucking stream it anywhere absolute what, fucking what, joke what another reason to hate the double ihf add it to the fucking list buddy just saying but you don't hate them no yeah, i'm just I, i'm just saying if, if you were to hate them that's another example to throw on the list i wonder if having an app like does mlb network have an app because they're they're all like mlb network or whoever owns nhl network and the budget there isn't enormous. So I don't know, like, do you to have an app where you could stream your channel? Is that like big money for the company? I, I have no idea. They can afford it. It's I like mean, Clark or, or Griswold's just, just wife a, going to the back just, and just slipping on the switch. Just build the players like they do for everything else. That is oh, the best Christmas movie, by the way. <laughs> no lines, Russ. Without a doubt, wait. Without a doubt, the best Christmas movie. Oh, I love Bad that Santa. One. Bad Santa. Yeah, I watched um, that, but that's not yeah. love. Yeah, actually, I can't watch it with the family. Hey, yeah. love yeah, actually, exactly. Unless you're white, real white, white trash. Uh, Biz, no, we got another reason to get pissed out, pissed off at the IIHF. They canceled all January events, obviously not including the, the World Juniors, uh, but including the under eighteen women's World Championships because of the COVID stuff. Uh, the tourney was supposed to take place in Sweden, uh, but it's been going to be canceled, not postponed, canceled. Uh, for the second straight year, and people are pissed off because last year they held the under-18 men's worlds in Texas. They moved it to Texas, and this year they're still on tap to play in Germany in April. And I think the simple question is, you know, why are the men's 18 allowed to play, but the women's can't uh, are being canceled? They're, again, not even being postponed. They're making it work for the men. They're obviously not making the same accommodations for the women. Uh, the IIHF said it wasn't possible to reschedule due to league commitments within Sweden. Uh, people think that's full of shit. And yeah, it, it seems like it's pretty unfair to these young women who are, who are putting in the same work as the men and they're just having the opportunity just completely ripped out of their hands. Uh, Biz, I'll let you take it because, you know, you're more well-spoken than I am. But this is the biggest bunch of bullshit I could ever... I, I, I can't even believe for the second year in a row the girls don't get to play. I don't even understand where you... What's your defense of it? Like, Wait, I, I agree. It's complete bullshit. Now, postponing it, one thing. Different country, you know, different rules, different COVID regu regulations. Now, the Ontario Women's Hockey Association has stepped up and offered to basically handle everything from running a tournament perspective. 
if they had, if double IHF had the balls to just come out flat, say, we don't have, we're not going to donate the amount of money to provide the resources in order to get this all rescheduled. So the under 18 girls can fucking play. I'm sure that we could find enough money to be raised in order to make sure that the, the under 18 tournament gets paid. Do you think that that's a fair assumption? That if money was raised, that they could probably, you know, figure out uh, logistics and get the planes to take them over, wh- whether they're even private, uh, and just the the teams, uh, individuals on those flights. Yeah, I don't know what the fucking regulations are going to be by that point. But I'll tell you what, if they can get it up and running and they can reschedule it to play somewhere else, I'll throw fucking 10 grand of my own money in to get it going. Like, I don't give a fuck. Let's go. Right, I, I would imagine that it's pretty a pretty reasonable number to throw on a tournament for under eighteen women's in North America and get them a place where we could figure out to get it played. Even if it has to be played, you know, in February, there's plenty of arenas around, especially in Ontario, where the Ontario Women's Hockey Association has stepped up and said that. So, as I said, if they can get it up and running and they need money for resources, I'll throw fucking ten grand in. If the Lightning win tonight, I'll I'll, I'll match. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go Lightning! Let's go Lightning! Because it's fuck, it's a fucking joke. Because it's like, it, yeah, it's, it is. It, it's it, it it's is not fair. And people say, listen, if if you're some person on the other end listening and saying, I don't think women's is exciting as men. Okay, whatever. Fuck, have your opinion and 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 you know, go fucking play with your toy and leave. I think that. You, you've seen what the WNBA model has been and how much help they've gotten from the NBA and how much the quality of, of a product, it's gotten better. All it needs is the money for resources and eventually it's going to continue to get better and better. And I am, listen, when I watch Canada versus USA at the Olympics in women's hockey, I fucking love it. These are exciting fucking games. So the more more of these young girls playing at this high level of competition and growing the game and making it, you know, and, and, and eventually growing it and making it more exciting, let's fucking go. So I don't know. I, I hope I didn't misspeak and piss anybody off, but I think that this is a joke. Last year they got it canceled. I can understand with last year. We're well aware how to adapt to these types of situations. Let's figure it out. Let's get the money behind it, and let's just get the tournament up and running. Yeah, it's bullshit at the end of the day and shouldn't bullshit. happen. In, in the, and that's the another one of the list of the di- double IHF wit. They're in your crosshairs, dude. I represented my country in so many double IHF tournaments, Biz. I'm not like you. I'm not I'm not somebody that's going to sit around and chirp people you don't even know. I'm not chirping them. I know them. that federation. <laughs> I'm not chirping them. I'm saying that, hey, th- I'm not, I'm not going to shame that- them. I'm not going to shame them because they have to follow the rules in Sweden. What I'm going to say is why aren't, why aren't why isn't the time and energy being put into figuring out this situation like it was for the men? That's yeah, all I'm saying. Exactly. And it, again, it's the it's the whole canceled, not postponed. If they postponed it, even did it in the fucking summer, summer or whatever, I think the, the women would be fine with that. But uh, the, they're just canceling it again for the second year in a row. So and I'm know, not even going to bitch about them about the accounting situation if they're saying that they don't even want to buck up and pay for it. Because I think I think that if they had the balls to just come out and say that, or it doesn't make sense for them, that enough people would yeah. put money in to get the fucking thing going. So All right. there you go. Yep. All right, Atta moving boy, right guys. along. We we got You're the best fellows. Awesome <laughs> Tit fucker. Moving right along to a few other uh, news notes before we get to Keith Jones. Uh, the shitty news for our buddy Brandon Tan out in Seattle. Uh, the team com- team confirmed that he suffered a season-ending ACL injury on uh, December 18th versus Edmonton. Just sucks to see for any guy, especially when you know him and friendly with him, and he's such a team guy like Tanov. So, you know, obviously we send our, our best wishes out to him. Just uh, awful fucking news to, to see and hear. Get especially- well soon, Turbo. There you go. Uh, let's see. And uh, No dice on a new Calgary bond, at least for now. Uh, the Calgary Sports and Entertainment Corporation, the Flames Ownership Group, and the City of Calgary were, quote, unable to resolve a number of issues relating to the escalating costs of the project, end quote. Uh, so the CSEC determined that there is no viable path to complete the project. Uh, the two parties would have split the cost equally, one of those private public ventures. Uh, but the uh, Calgary Ownership Group cited un- unexpected infrastructure and climate mitigation costs, uh, the Calgary mayor countered back, said the Flames are the ones pulling the plug and, quote, on a project worth over $650 million, to have one party walk away for 1.5% of the value of the deal is staggering, end quote. That's uh, so what it seven, was? That's all it was? Well, that's, again, it's a money fight. That's the quick, yeah, basically Jeez. there was going to be going no sidewalks. And Calgary Bitch, said, you're talking about <laughs> Calgary owning Edmonton? You can't even get a rink, bro. We got a billion-dollar fucking beauty slow up north. 
And you're fucking bitching about a $1.3 million in a, in a $650 million deal. Talk about taking a loss. Holy shit, Calgary. You, what do you have to say about that, Biz? We're the type of organization the fans will get out there and help pour, pour the cement, and they'll make the fucking sidewalks themselves, man. We're not like all flu-flu needs to sit in the gold section in your new beautiful <laughs> barn. And if anything, if anything, we'll play at the fucking Saddle Dome. Why, why are you laughing, all right? You don't think I didn't know because you said flu flu, not foo foo. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, COVID brain. Well, that's how you point. say it now. That's how you <laughs> say. He it. said flu flu. I didn't even flu, catch flu. that one. Yeah, uh, shocker with um, those ears. I did. Um, <laughs> I was shocked to see though that uh, Saddle Dome's the second oldest building to MSG. Yep, yep. that's crazy. Yeah. That's and called MSG. character. Heard of it? Yeah. That that that's called. Uh, it's been a dump for quite a while. Yeah, and, and like good point. With that is going to be their home, obviously for the foreseeable future. At least it's still playable. In um, I don't know you got to think something like this. If they got this close, it should probably kick back up again. A lot of this time, a lot of this shit is just po- posture, and you know whether it be the city or the private industry, you know, because everybody wants the other party to pay for it. But if they got this far along, I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it gets revisited. And, I love. You know, I eventually love. They need a new bond. I love that building. It's not the best away room, so it pisses the other team off a little bit. The other team's sitting pretty and comfortable on the other side. It's an intimidating building to go into. And you know what it is, too, when you're getting lit up, like most teams that go in there this year, is they got those uh, those flames torches when they score. They fucking they, they get you leaking on the bench, don't they, Wit? Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a great rink to, to play in. I did really like playing in there. I just don't – I've never watched the game, so I wouldn't know in terms of, like – you know the fan base and how they they feel about going there. Um, you got to get something done, though. I mean, it's 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 been that long where MSG's the oldest, but they did a complete redo on the inside. Yeah, uh, funny times. enough, they're four, three, and four at home this year, Biz. So yeah, they're really lighting them up with the flames at home this year. And of course, once Edmonton got a new arena, the you know, value of the franchise went up exponentially. Of course, Connor has something to do with that, but you know the the property values around the arena go up so there's obviously a ripple effect with these things so like everything else we'll keep you posted if anything changes and uh it's almost time to bring on our pal keith jones jonesy uh all-time interview coming up we do want to let you know that the interview is brought to you by shopify shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big businesses so upstarts startups and established businesses alike can sell everywhere synchronize online and in-person sales and effortlessly stay informed Scaling your business is a journey of endless possibility. Believe us, this podcast started out selling and today we're still selling and we're not stopping there, Biz will tell you that, because success is a million milestones on a forever evolving path. Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale. Reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. Gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. More than a store, Shopify grows with you. So go to shopify.com slash chicklets, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. So grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash chicklets right now. Once more time for the folks in the back shopify.com slash chicklets and now without further ado enjoy keith jones all right it's time to bring on our next guest a seventh round pick of the washington capitals in the 1998 draft he played 491 games over nine nhl seasons with three very good teams of that era and for the last 15 or so years you've no doubt seen him on tv breaking down the games first with nbc and now he's raising hell with biz on tnt Thanks so much for having us here at your beautiful farm in South Jersey and for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast. Keith Jones, nice pad, Jonesy. Yeah, it's great to have you guys here. It's been a lot of fun already even before the show starts. So <laughs> exactly. I'm, I'm gassed from laughing at all the stories I've already heard, for fuck's sakes. So I don't know how many we got left in the tank here. We're going to have to repeat them and give them some fake laughs. I pulled in beautiful property, big farm, and saw some donkeys. I said, all right, we're going to have a time. Donkeys are already making some noise. How many, how many pets you got here? Well, Jonesy? we got the four miniature donkeys. We've had horses for years, but my daughter's got them down in Florida now. So uh, we've got a nice, friendly dog who you met, Leo. <laughs> He's famous around this area. He will bite. And uh, 
There's a warning that comes with that dog. Everywhere you look, there's beware of dog signs. I saw the yeah. sign we pulled in. Yeah. It's funny. Most people say uh, when you go to meet the dog, don't worry, he won't bite. I went to pet his dog. His wife said, no, 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 he'll fucking bite. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah, well, she bite. <laughs> <laughs> what breed is it? Because a lot of He's a cane corso or a bull mastiff. Okay. Um, they're extremely good dogs, but very protective dogs. Yes. If you see one and he's not yours, stay away from him. That's he's got to be over 100 pounds. Like how yeah, much? he's 165 pounds. Oh, oh, nice yeah. little that was lap. Me he's fresh like, that's a lap dog for Jonesy. <laughs> he's like a, he's a bear. Like he, when he's coming for you, like it's yeah, it's not, it doesn't end well. That's for sure. Yeah, when you don't want to make eye contact with a dog, it's probably a scary dog. <laughs> Seriously. All right, Jonesy, I don't know if you want to jump into the TV stuff, the career for us. We guys want to kick off. I mean, this guy's got stories galore. I'd kind of just love to, to, to start with TNT, right? You and Biz work together now, and you've been crushing it. I've been listening to you for years, but it must be pretty exciting to be with a new TV station and just basically see a lot of money going into a product that's looking great so far. Yeah, and it's it's a different role for me now. Like I, I'm yeah. down between the benches. It's fresh. You know, after doing studio for a long time, um, I'm, I'm happy and uh, was real open to trying something a little bit different. And I've worked with people that during game broadcasts with the Flyers where we've had a guy down between the benches. And, you know, so I have experience realizing what's important about that job yeah. and what you don't need with that job. And I think it's important to try to enhance the broadcast, but don't ruin the broadcast. And I think that we've had examples through hockey where it's, that position hasn't been used properly. And being able to watch it from studio for years and then also working from upstairs, I know what I wanted from that guy. Yeah. And I'm trying to you know provide that without overwhelming the broadcast and just having fun with it and, and getting a different perspective from, from the players down where we used to sit by the benches. You know? I would imagine the banter is not as aggressive as it once was from, <laughs> from bench to bench. It's probably a lot more calm these days. It, it's interesting. I mean, it's it's different. You know, there's when things get heated, the guys get angry. There's a little bit more, but when I played, that that place was. I mean, that was a hilarious place to be. And, and you were the guy cracking all the yeah, jokes. Yeah, because well, luckily I had seven guys that were tougher than me on my own team. So it was good to be the funny guy back then, right? But it was uh, – it's different. There's not as much of that interaction. And a lot of those conversations that we had led to, you know – might not have been me personally fighting, but someone I knew very well oh, yeah. on my team was going to have to fight. And that stuff is a little more limited than it used to be, which is, you know, it's probably a lot better. Um, but it was a lot more fun back then. I, I was going to hop in quickly with working with Edzo. Like, I, I knew that he was really involved with, like, the horse community. And, you know, he knows, like, any horse that you could gamble and on. And he gave us the winning derby pick? Give a, gave us the winning derby pick on our podcast. But you you have a pretty big love for horses, and your daughter is actually still heavily involved, correct? Yeah, she's in a question down in Ocala, Florida. She, so she's not coming back here. She's on her way. She's 23 now. The big reason I have like four different jobs is to try to pay for her horse shit. <laughs> yeah, they ain't cheap. Anyway, um, so that's that's what she's doing. I've had race horses in the past. Ed's the one I often talk about uh, the horses. Uh, we both had a great uh, love of betting on them. And I've had some good luck with some of the horses that I've owned in the past too. So I had a buddy of mine who passed away, was a billionaire, introduced me to a whole different world world on horses his name was uh, Dan Borslow and kind of opened my eyes to this world I didn't realize was out there and was involved in a couple of really good horses with him and uh, it's it's a great game it's the one that uh, is more for older people than it is for younger people uh, it'd be great for that sport if we could bring in some more younger fans but uh, the old boys still love it and uh, oh, yeah. I, I've always enjoyed it myself Breeders Cup weekend too. Say, yeah. uh, yeah, I, know I saw not, the OT. He's got the OTV bets going on in the backyard. Pool set up. It's pretty nice. I know it's not going to drop till after. Who do you, who do you like in the Breeders? So you know what? I, retro I, credit. I, I haven't even looked at it yet because wow. I've been so busy doing other things that I'll, I'll, I'll look at the race right before it starts and go. come up with who I like. And a lot of times, Edzo will send me a text and say, hey, <laughs> this is who I'm going with. And I usually just Insider trading. He, he's like an incredibly good handicapper. Really? He you can know, actually pull he's, it out that he's. I'm telling you, I've never seen anybody handicap horses like him. And as you guys know, there's race after race after race. And being patient, picking the right race. The jockey, right? That's how you survive. Like, if you want to play every race, if you love to bet, horse racing is going to eat you alive. Well, it's like yeah. betting the board in the NFL. It is. You're, yeah. right? you're not going to win. So if you're betting for fun, 
right? It's really difficult. If yep. you're betting because you're a handicapper and you, you know, you want to actually keep your money and try to make some money, you got to be really patient and you got to wait for your right spot. And a lot of people are betting because they're having fun with it and yeah. they want to watch every game and bet every game. Maybe this, they got Sunday away from the, the wife and they're going to play all day and you're going to lose, but <laughs> you're going to have fun doing it. And that's really what it's all about. It's like the NFL if there were a new game start in every time zone, every, every 24 hours. I mean, you could bet races in Australia, Japan, all night. You got to be careful with that TVG or so I heard. Oh, yeah. I would go back to the between the benches for a sec. Like, Jonesy, what else can you pick up there other than the audio element? You know, what guys are saying. What else do you pick up at that level that you can't see up high? Yeah, you can see the conversations with the coaches okay. to the players. Uh, you can tell when a coach is irritated. Uh, when a coach is happy about something. You also gain a lot of respect for how difficult the job is for the officials. You know, sometimes you're looking at a puck over the glass play. Well, there's one happened the other night. Yep. And I was positive that it hit the pl- other player, the, the defending player's stick and went up and over. And after the fourth look, I finally realized that, hey, it, it didn't. It was, it, there was a double clutch was a with double Kopitar. Clutch, right? Kopitar should have got the 2-4 of the glass, but oh, I hear you. he didn't you. get it? He, he, sh- he didn't get the penalty, but like you said, it was so close, and it looked like it had hit the defender's stick where, or, or the offensive player because it was in Kopitar's yeah. own end. And like you said, it's just like everybody wants to rag after watching all these replays, but it's like the f- pace of the game. No wonder these guys are making mistakes every night. Yeah, that's that's one thing you really see down there. And there's bodies in front, moving in front of those guys. That's a, that's an incredibly difficult job that they have. So I guess that's one of my biggest takeaways being down there is just because uh, I could be hypercritical when you're covering it from way above and right. you can see everything or you're watching on TV. And you, some ways, in some cases, you have a better look than even official that's at ice level. So uh it makes me back off a little bit on some of the officials that miss a few calls, and it makes yeah. you, you know, happy that they have replay reviews like we have now. It's it's important. You need it. I, I think it's important too because like even if you're Edzo doing color, like sometimes I found that game to be a little bit boring yep. at yep. times. And getting that perspective between the benches when you're sitting there between the benches, it could be a boring game. But, but it's, it's not so, as boring to those not, guys. It's not because it's so fast and there's all these different elements to it that then you can describe on the broadcast. So I love the fact that, that they got you in there. You guys have awesome rapport. I remember there was a broken stick on the ice at one point and then they were just giving it to you oh, about yeah. how that's used, how you used to collect points and shit. So <laughs> the, 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 the banter when games do get a little bit dull is amazing between all you guys. And of course, Kenny Albert's a beauty as well. Yeah, and Kenny started doing... Uh, uh, I knew Kenny when he was covering Baltimore Skipjacks games. When I first arrived in the minors for my first experience, he called my first goal. That's where he started. Yeah, that's where he was at. And he, the guy's been everywhere. Yeah. And and one of the great things about those days were the the reporters and the and the play by play guys hung out with the players. I mean, they were part of the family. You guys, you did everything with them. They traveled on the bus. He roomed with Barry Trotz. Barry Trotz was the head coach of the team, and Kenny Albert was his roommate. No so, shit. I mean, that's, that's how it used to be, right? Oh, and then, you know, Marv Albert would show up at a game. We'd go to dinner. It was just it was an incredible um, family-type atmosphere that really, at the minor league level, really made you think, this is something I really want to do. And, and fortunately, I was able to do that. Because you have your day-to-day with the Flyers. You're doing the pre and the post, and you're doing doing the games obviously but when NBC Sports was kind of lame duck and you realized that their broadcast was going to be ending I don't want to say you might have been nervous but like how did you get involved with TNT did they reach out first and you were like oh yes I got something yeah, else coming too I was nervous I right? really was cuz I didn't see it coming I I was kind of in the dark about it all I just thought you know the Olympics are coming yeah. you know NBC's got that it would just be just didn't didn't see it coming so I was like wow, I better get going here. And I always, you know, Brian Boucher is a good friend of mine as well. We played together here in Philly and he, he went on to ESPN, right? And I'd always be telling him, bugging him about his agent, you know, who used to be my agent I, I at NBC. I got rid of him. I can do it myself. You know, I thought it was a big <laughs> wheel. And I'd always be telling him, well, you're going to you're gonna wait uh, to that day when you're writing those checks. I keep telling him, right? Well, listen, I called that guy. <laughs> I need you back. That's it. <laughs> uh, so the first day, Boucher is calling me. He's going, how are you going to feel when you're writing those checks you know <laughs> but i it, it was lou oppenheim and i needed him and he came up big for me but otherwise wow. you know like it's it was just it was a scary moment for me as and i obviously i still had the flyers i still have radio i've been really fortunate with all the things i've been yeah. able to do in my career and post-career but 
it's uh, I'm real. I was real happy to land nice. at TNT. Yeah. yeah, you transferred out uh, unbelievably. Uh, okay, so we talked about the American League stick, but the fact that you brought up negotiating your own contracts, weren't you your own agent even as a player in the NHL? I, I was, and you would show up t- t- to the to the meetings with an empty briefcase. <laughs> this is uh, it's an incredible thing when I think back on <laughs> like it. Like Ben Affleck and uh, what's that movie? Good Will Hunting. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yes, suspect <Yeah>. retainer. <laughs> yeah, I was with the Capitals. I was. Uh, Going on my second contract, my first agent was a guy named Gene McBurney, who was out of Toronto. He used to be Ola Nolan's agent, and um, he was a great guy. He had one eye. He used to take out his glass eye at parties and scare people with it. The, the Put socket, it in drink. Yeah, he just have his socket sitting oh. there. It was a scary thing. But anyway, he did a great job. He's a, he is a billionaire now. Like he, he was not suffering after I let him go, I can tell you that. <laughs> extremely, Thank God. Extremely successful Cover the guy. dead weight. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so I told David Poyle, for one reason, this was the end of the lockout year, the shortened season. I had like, I think I scored like 14 goals in the 40 something games I played, right? So I was thinking I was pre- pretty good, right? And, and Rob Pearson was on the team. He was traded from uh, Toronto to Washington, and he scored one goal all year. And Rob Pearson was a pretty good player in Toronto, goal scorer. I think he had 25 goals or close to it. And uh, he had the one goal, but he was making five hundred grand, and I was making, I was making three hundred thousand, and I was so focused on this five hundred grand that Rob Pearson was making that it consumed me. So I said to my agent, Gene McBurney, I still had another year on this deal. I think at three thirty, and I'm like, I got to get rid of you. I got to do this myself. You're fired. He goes, what? I go, yeah, you're fired. I'm doing it myself. So. I called David Poyle on the phone. I go, David, it's Jonesy. I'm representing myself now, and I'd like to sit down and talk to you. He's like, like yes. You know, he's loving it. He's loving it. He's going to make less next So he's contract. like, you know, we got the – it was the – the um, unveiling of the Capitals jerseys that turned the blue. Remember, they went from the red, white, and blue, yep. and they turned into the blue, the ugly jersey. Yeah, ugly, Ovechkin ugly. rookie year jersey. It was yeah, brutal. Yeah, that's brutal. it. Yeah, so they were making the switch. It's got to be 94, 95, somewhere there. It was after the lockout. So I go uh, to this event where they're doing it. It was at some place down in D.C., one of the bars, Planet Hollywood or something. They're unveiling the jersey. So David's there, and I go, hey, is this a good day to you know get together? He's like... Yeah, this is a great day. Stop by the office. So I drive over to the cap center at that time. Are you nervous? No, I'm okay. excited. <laughs> I'm excited. Like I, I, I went just, to Western I Michigan. I can do I, this. I, I can't wait to do it. Like it's a, it's just a strange thing. So I've got a pair of flip flops on. I've got a pair of shorts, and I got a t-shirt on. And an empty briefcase. <laughs> so I walk into his office, and I can just see he's like, he just can't wait to see me. And I'm thinking, he must like me, right? But he's thinking, this guy's an idiot. So I sit down, and, he's, and he starts bringing his secretary in with um, uh, notes on different players. And he's discussing, he goes, John, you know, Keith, this is a uh, this is the hard part of the job. This is where it's you know usually important that you have an agent to be a buffer because I got to tell you what you do poorly now, right? Oh, and I'm no. like, David, I'm Keith Jones, the agent. The player is outside the door. <laughs> <laughs> He just starts, I can just see his face, right? And he's trying to keep a straight face. And I'm like, yeah, this, uh, this is happening. You know, this is happening. So he's, he's like, he's, what an idiot. So he gets a list of uh, all the players, you know, the comparables, Bill Lindsay, Travis Green. Um, he's going over a whole list. Michael Renberg, he says, you can't, you know, you, you can't get Michael Renberg money. This, you know, it's, here's his numbers. And so some of the players he would name, I'd go, uh, I never heard of him. <laughs> the guy would have like a 20 goal season, right? I go, yeah, it's, I never heard of him. <laughs> let, me, let me look at this up. And I would open up my empty briefcase. There is not a piece of paper in this briefcase. And I would look in it and I would hesitate. And I pretend I'm like really interested in something. And I would look back at him and I go, David, if I played with Eric Lindros and John LeClaire, I would score 25 goals, I'd have 30 goals. You know it, I know it, and we would go back and forth like this through the meeting. So at the end of it, I finally said, uh, David, 
if I have to make less money than Rob Pearson next, this is the only thing that's <laughs> on back my to mind. Rob Pearson. It's the only thing that's on my mind. The that whole was time. only written in your briefcase. It's like the, I could have, I should have had that written down. It's all, it's just consuming me, right? So I said, if I have to make less money than Rob Pearson, I will not play hockey again. I will quit. And I thought I meant it, but looking back, I obviously didn't. So anyway, he says, "Okay, Keith, uh, thank you. This has been a really good meeting. I'll get back to you." So I shook his hand and I walked out and uh, one week went by, <laughs> two weeks go by, no phone call, nothing. I'm thinking, I thought he was going to get back to me, right? Now we're in the middle of the summer. It's like the end of July almost, right? I'm like, this isn't going very well for me. So David, uh, Dave Poulin calls me out of nowhere. He was playing for the Caps at that time. He calls me, he goes, Jonesy. I go, yep. I was in Brantford in my hometown. He goes, are you still representing yourself? And I'm like, yes, I am. He goes, you're an idiot. He goes, you can't do that. You should use my agent. His name's Steve Mountain, and uh, he'll get your deal done. I said, okay. And that's I, how long you lasted. That's how long I lasted, two weeks. And I hadn't even talked to this Steve. I never talked to Steve Mountain. I agreed to a deal with him through Dave Poulin. I said, tell him to go ahead and get the deal done. So I get a call like three weeks later from Steve Mountain. And he says, yeah, I got your deal. You're getting 500 next year. No way. Yep. So did they rip up the so contract up of the you deal making and I got three... a one-year deal no at 500000 so, And I was so happy. So you didn't have to play through that last year nope. of the contract? Nope. Three... That's wow, how it that worked back then? That wouldn't happen anymore. Yep. That's nope. NFL style. Yeah, so I got the 500 Now, I'd like to think that it was my, you know – spirited conversation with David, but it was obviously, it, I think it laid the groundwork to be honest yeah, with you. Same here. Yeah. He probably respected so, you for it. Yeah. I, like, well, he knew I was not like, we had so many, so many things that happened in my days in the early days of my career where I did stuff I would never do again. And I would example. Um, uh, uh, well, one time I kicked the coach off the ice in practice <laughs> And I can all say it because I used to say it like I was bragging about it. Now I say it because I'm embarrassed about it. So that was the start of this very season. It was like nine games in. I never did anything during the lockout. I was convinced we were going to be out all year. I skated like twice the whole time, like for four months after, because we went out after training camp. So we had training camp oh, and then, and then we went out. And then it was like four months and you kept here and it's going to be a year. We're not going to be back. So I took it like, it's probably going to be a year. So I'm going to have some fun. Jonesy time. Yeah. So I showed up. I wasn't in very good shape. Nine games in the season. I'm struggling and I I know it. So a lot of times to disguise my poor conditioning, I would just cause some chaos and get (laughs) some distractions going in a different direction. Right. So Jim Schoenfeld's the coach and he says, Hey, the the words you never want to hear as a player, as you guys know, get a skate in. Right. You're not, we're going to play the next night. I'm not going to be in the lineup. Right. So I'm going to be a healthy scratch. So I'm real, I go livid about that stuff. Number one, I hate skating at the end of practice. Probably the biggest part of it, to be honest with you. And number two, you're embarrassed because you're getting sat out. So we're doing drills. Olaf Kolzig's in net. Randy Burridge is on the ice with me. Ken Klee and a couple other guys. There's like five of us. And I take a shot from the middle of the ice. You're supposed to shoot the puck, skate to the boards, skate back to the middle ice, shoot again. You know, you're working your legs, but you're also a true bag puck. skate. Yeah, it is. Those are the worst ones when you got the puck. They try to disguise it. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the hidden, sneaky bag the hidden bag skate. So I missed the net by like an inch. And Keith Elaine, who's the coach at Yale now, and has had a real good career after, he uh, comes up to me and he goes, hit the net. You know, and I'm like, oh, okay. So the next shot I take, I put it like 30 feet wide. And I look over at him. Now I'm like going wild, the head's spinning, right? And I'm like, is that close enough for you? <laughs> and he comes over to me and he goes, you know, you're you're an a-hole. <laughs> I go, yeah, yeah, I am. I said, but, uh, you know, you're you're Shoney's guy, you know, like it's just, I said some really bad things. I, I, I wish I could take it. You went personal. I, I just went nuts about it. And Shoney was a guy, a fitness nut coach. And he'd always do his pushups. He was in way better condition than I was. And they do sit up. So I told Keith, I said, why don't you go and uh, help Shoney? I think he just finished his sit ups. You can help lift him up off the ground, you know? So <laughs> it's really terrible things to say. So we're going back and forth and now I lose it. And I go, why don't you get off the, F and ice, I'll skate the guys. And he left and he went off the ice. And now I'm looking around, I'm going, all right, now what? 
right? I know I'm in a lot of trouble. So, I didn't think he was going to leave. Yeah, and he left. So I started skating the guys. So all of us are doing the suicide. You know, it's just a blue line back, red line back, blue line back. And I've never hustled and worked so hard in my life. So it ends, and I know I'm in trouble, right? So come off the ice, and Todd Button was the assistant coach at that time with Shoney, and Todd's waiting for me. He goes, hey, uh, Shoney wants to see you. And I'm like, uh, really? I, that's uh, surprising to me. So I got my shirt off, got my hockey pants on still, my equipment, my guts hanging out over my pants. And I, <laughs> and I walk into his office, and he's like, did you say that I'm such and such? Like some of the things I said you would never say to a boss, and, I, no. you sh- and you should never. So I said, yeah, that's correct. And uh, he said, so then he started going over how it, you get to the point where you're a healthy scratch, and he's explaining it to me. Here's what we rated you the last game, two out of five. Keith had you two out of five. Todd had you two out of five. I go, hold on here. All three of you guys came up with the exact same number. I can't believe that these two guys have the same number as you have. Right? <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> so I'm not done yet. Like I should have just shut up, right? Oh, so man. he's like, get uh, you know the hell out of my office, and I left his office. It turned into a long few days. I can tell you that. But uh, how many games you end up getting scratched? You just remember? the one. Okay. Just the one. And and to be honest with you, the story gets a little bit longer. But we lost the next game in Boston. And now we're in New Jersey, and we're staying at the um, the Embassy Suites. So you can see everybody, everybody's room. You know, you're, you can see where everyone's at. Shoney, we're, but now we're losing. So he's like, nobody leave their room until you meet with us in the conference room, and then you can go do whatever you want to do in the day. We're not practicing. We had a whole day off. So I'm like, okay. So I, I sat in my room from 8 a.m. to 11 o'clock at night. So Didn't every mean. player went in, and this is, oh, this is hanging over my head because I've had this outburst, right? So I get a call from Joe Juno. He says, hey, hey, Shoney asked me who I wanted to play with, and I told him I want to play with Jonesy, right? So two hours later, I got Michael Pavanka calls me. Hey, Shoney asked me who I wanted to play with. I, want, I told him I want to play with Jonesy. Another two hours, Dale Hunter calls me. Hey, Shoney asked me. I told him I want to play with Jonesy because I had told him I want to be traded and everything. This I just had this crazy outburst. So at eleven o'clock at night, I get the call to come down to this conference room, and Shoney's an intimidating man. He's right across from me. And he looks at me and he goes, "You still want to be traded?" And I said, "You know, I did, but <laughs> since all the guys called me and said they want to play with me, I've, <laughs> I've decided I'm going to stay." <laughs> <laughs> so you've now tripled down. This is it. Like, I just can't stop myself, right? So he, lo- so he looks like, at me. He looks at me and he gives me, a, you know, the fist, the hand fist, you know, like inst- he wasn't a handshaker. He'd give, he'd give you a little fist thing. The hairy knuckles. He was a germ. He was way ahead of his time. He was a germ. Germaphobe, yeah. yeah. Harry, Howie oh, Mandel. Oh, that's why he did it. Yeah, yeah. Like so, oh. he gave me that, and I give him this one. I you're, yeah, you're bowing. Yeah. So that I walked out of the room. I gave Keith Elaine a wink on the way out of the room, and no. I, was, <laughs> <laughs> I was back in the lineup. True story. Oh, like, that, that is that the craziest thing? And I was making at that time three hundred grand a year. I thought I was rich. Like I thought I had. The I, world you know, by it's the obviously balls. great money, but I thought this is like, I'm I'm set for life. This is what I was thinking. I was so brain dead. Now we know why Shawnee went after Coho so hot. He was a fitness nut <laughs> about the donuts. I was thinking that too. <laughs> Have another donut. So did it get awkward when um, Jonesy the player had to fight Jonesy the agent? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was uh, the, the agent handled it a lot better than the player. That's for sure. The agent chucked he chucked the briefcase, yeah. and that was it. But you, me- you mentioned in that story, Brantford, Ontario. So I, I, I guess you're the most second most famous hockey player ever from Brantford. There's about nine more ahead of me, man. I've been looking at that list. I, I told Gretz one. Dropping. I told Gretz one night. I said, "Hey, we're the highest scoring duo in the history of the NHL from the same town." <laughs> And, and then I looked it up. There's like nine guys from Brantford ahead of me. So oh, I couldn't fuck. even claim that. Chris Gratton's from there. Oh, uh, no way. Doug Jarvis is from there. The Iron Man. Like, it's yep. incredible the number wow. of records are held from guys from Brantford, right? Small but, town, right? It I mean, is. There's 77,000 people. Um, I would say that I was probably the least likeliest to find my way to the NHL. I played junior C hockey. At what I, age I, I read your. I read the, at least the beginning of your book. I, it takes me a while. You read the through. forward biz. I, <laughs> he fell asleep. I read two the, seconds. I in. got the Coles notes, but yeah, like 
you were never super hyper focused on it where you would take your summers completely off. You, you enjoyed just being around the guys, especially during your junior C days, you guys were playing 30 games a season. Yeah. So you'd be done by, by the end of March and you, and you know, you would take from then till training camp completely off. Uh, what was the title of that chapter? Beers and chicken wings. Was it? Yeah. I, don't, I can't, I haven't read it. I don't, I don't recommend anyone reads it. <laughs> Well, it was a grade five reading level, so I figured it was right up my alley. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. So I was, uh, yeah, I played hockey because I love playing hockey and I didn't do anything else. I mean, never I, thought of the show. Never. Th- I was playing junior C hockey. I yeah. was 17 years old, then 18 years old. I went back. You know, I tried out for junior, ble- junior B on a team that Rob Blake played for in my hometown called the Brantford Classics. And I thought I'd make the team. You know, I, I was a good hockey player like, through midget. I was good, but I wasn't great. I was smaller because I hadn't grown yet. I was a late bloomer. But I just thought I'd make the team, and they cut me. And I was like, oh, now what do you do? And then I got a letter in the mail, Junior C Hockey in Paris, Ontario. It's like 15 minutes outside of Brantford. I'm like, well, I guess I'll try out there and see what happens. So I tried out for the team, barely made the team. And then all of a sudden started to grow, started to become a better hockey player, got a new pair of skates, which kind of helped too, because I kept falling <laughs> down all the time. Like it's, it's amazing the little things that had to happen for, for me to kind of navigate my way out of, out of playing junior C. But I played junior C for two years because Brantford was kicked out of the league after the season that I got cut for a huge brawl. What? I was at the game. It was Brantford against St. Catharines. Half the St. Catharines team left the ice. The other half that stayed got pummeled by every player on the Brantford team. The other half I mean, didn't two, come back to help? Nobody came back. They left. They left their teammates on the ice. Holy shit. And, there was, and Blakey was on the team. Todd no. Francis, a guy named Todd Francis, was like a second-round pick in the NHL. Was playing junior B after being in the major junior A before that. And I, I'd never witnessed anything like that. I felt yeah. really bad watching it, to be honest with you. So they kicked that team right out of the league for wow. a full year, the entire Where league. did he catch a guy with a drop kick? Would it, like, would it well, he, he, I re- in the book, it says that guys were holding down other guys' arms and another guy would just be wailing on yes. him. And, I mean, I guess rightfully so. It, they got completely tossed for a full season. It, it, this, I never heard of that. This really, this, this really happened. And they were, literally, there'd be guys holding guys' arms behind their back while somebody filled their face in with punches. <laughs> I mean, how angry do you got to be to yeah. do something like that, right? And I'm like, oh, well, maybe I don't want to play hockey yeah. that bad. <laughs> so I, that, that team wasn't available to try out the next year. I said, I'll go back to Paris and play again. Why not? And I played. Played really, you know, played really well. There was fights every night, but I never was in them. I started them, and then I got out of the way. <laughs> and it's like I had luckily had friends on my team that I'd like to protect you know protect me and I learned how to kind of play that way and I'd never had a fight in my life away from the rink or on the ice until I played in the NHL no shit never had a fight not even in the streets not in the streets you you, after your few years in junior C and I I was going to bring up the fact that you actually started your agent days um, negotiating the contract for gas your second year of junior C so let's quickly get in that one but then you went off to play uh, in Niagara Falls yes. near my hometown for junior B for a couple years yeah you would get ten dollars in gas uh, from John Sunoco that was the, the sponsor if you if you were the player of the game in junior C right and they try to divide it up and stuff I'd have a game where I get nine points I wouldn't get player of the game I'd be so <laughs> angry about it. I didn't get the ten bucks I need right? that gas money yeah, yeah, it would drive me nuts the whole time so I went in and I told the guy that was running the team my second year, I said, hey, listen, like, this is really important to me. I need like 50 bucks gas money all the time. And uh, so they agreed to it, the guy that ran the team. You barely got your own sticks. Like, I mean, they had, it's, it's very primitive back then. You rode a school bus to the games. You'd wear sweat. Hey, hey girl, girlfriends were allowed yeah, on the bus. Girlfriends were on the no. bus. Oh, yeah. oh, well, Some that... guys were married. Some 20 year old guys on the team were married. The girl, their wife would be with them. The beers would be on the bus. You had sweatpants, a pair of cowboy boots, t shirts. <laughs> like, it's like, it was un- it's unbelievable. Seat. What is this, 92? This is 1985. 90- oh, yeah. Back Eighty-five. Yep. The year I was born, Jones. Yeah, there you go. See, that's that's a, that's a strange thing, man. Like, it is as you get older. But looking back on it, it was just an unbelievable experience. Had a great time, and then got a chance. I tried out for junior B, and uh, Gilbert Dion was on that team. The uh, the Niagara Falls. 
The Niagara Falls Thunder, thunder not Thunder. It was Canucks. The Niagara Falls Canucks. And the two owners were twin brothers, Tim and Terry Masterson. And they really changed my life, to be honest with you. They were awesome guys, real guys. Like, you just – they – uh, they just wanted you to be a good teammate and play and have fun. So I, I showed up there, barely made the team. I remember telling my dad, we went out to dinner. I said, hey, this is, uh, this is awesome. I, I made junior B hockey. I can tell my kids I'm playing junior B. So he's like, oh, that's great. You know, that's awesome. So we played the year, and all of a sudden, I just caught fire. And I think I had like, 100 and, I, I had like 140 points, 150 points, played in all situations. Our team was awesome and about midway through the season uh my coach tells me hey there's a guy from uh, the washington capitals that wants to talk to you and i'm like who's fucking with me yeah okay Which guy's fucking okay because i would go to maple leaf gardens as a fan i'm 19 years old i'm watching eddie olchuk play for the leafs and i'm not ever thinking in my mind that i would actually have a chance to be on the ice right it just does it's not even in the back of my mind so this guy says um I'm with the Washington Capitals. His name was Jack Button. Um, I would uh, Todd Button's dad, ironically. He said, uh, I came here to watch a guy play named Jim Sully. was a guy playing for St. Catharines. He was like 14. I'm 19. He said, and I, I can't stop watching you play. He goes, you fall down, you get back up, you fall down, you get up, and you <laughs> score. And he said, like, you, you can't stand up, but... Like, you're, you're in terrible shape, but you just keep doing something, right? And I'm like, yeah, okay. So... He, t- he tells me this, and I think I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell anybody I know because I'm thinking this is like, this ain't right. You know, I'm 19 years old. He goes, no, we're really interested. We'd like you to go to college, and we, we're going to set up some visits for you. Now, most kids, as you guys know, they commit to college the year before. Oh, yeah, 17. I'm 19 yeah. years old, and this is February, and I'm going on recruiting trips for the following season. And I'm showing up, and these guys are like, you know, the guys are taking me on the recruiting trip. One one guy's smoking weed. The other guy, I'm like, what is this all about? You go on the packy fall. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is crazy. You're like, I commit. <laughs> yeah, so I go to Western Michigan for my first visit, and um, I meet the head coach, Bill Wilkinson, great guy. He became a big factor in my life as time went on. But I meet him. He says, you know, Jonesy, I, I got to watch you play again, to be honest with you. I've only seen you a couple times. Most times they commit to you right then, right, at the meeting. Yeah. So I said, okay. Right. So I went back, and I was going to go to Lowell and to Northeastern on visits. But I really didn't want to because I didn't really enjoy the flight to go to Kalamazoo. I'd never really flown much before, and I'm like, I don't know if I want to do this that badly, right? <laughs> so, And I wasn't in school. I was out of school for a whole year. I, didn't, I was 19 years old, just playing junior B hockey, making $70 a week, and my mom would give me money. And you're loving it too. I, it was the best time of my life, right? It was, <laughs> it was awesome. And so now I'm thinking, I don't know how badly I want to go to school because I wasn't a great student. And I go back. So I'm getting ready to go to Lowell and I'm going to see Northeastern on the same trip. Just as I'm getting up, I'm, I wake up, I'm hung over from drinking the night before and having chicken wings. And just, this is what I did. We practiced once a week playing junior B. That's it. One oh practice. Played two games a week, practice once. So I, I get up and the guy's like, uh, it's Bill Wilkinson, my roommate tells me. So I pick it up. He goes, hey, you know, I've reconsidered it. We want you to commit to Western Michigan. I'm like, yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. So, <laughs> so oh, I never ask. Yeah, so I tell him, and that's how it happened. So I go there, and at the start of the next season, and I've, I've talked about my physical conditioning, right? I've never – now, I get – I should back up a little bit. I get drafted that summer. Oh, by okay. The I was going to ask you. So yes. you were drafted by the Capitals. So they did fall through they and felt, they set yep. up the, the call. And you're like, wow. So Button loved you. Yeah. So, yeah. And I didn't know. There's another guy who loved me named Sam McMaster, as the story goes. But I um, I don't go to the draft. I'm obviously. I don't even know when the draft is. Like, so I'm at Flamborough Downs betting the horses, right? This, I, I get back and my dad's sitting on the porch of the house and he's like all excited. And I'm like, What's wrong with him? You know, and he's hit the, like, hit the trifecta. He's, he goes, what? I go, he goes, you've been drafted. And I'm like, are we going to war? <laughs> he's like, no, you've been drafted to the NHL. And I'm like, really? He says, uh, the Capitals want you by the phone tonight at eight o'clock. And uh, they want to talk to you. And I'm a little suspect about it, right? And I'm like, I don't know about this. So 
My mom tells me, yeah, they're going to, they called me on the phone. I go, what happened? They go, so there's a draft list of that, that time, like 3000 kids and I'm not on it. I'm not on the draft list. So they call my mother from the draft in the seventh round and they say, how old's your son? They asked for me and she says, oh, he's not home. So how old's your son? She says, well, he's born November the 8th, 1968. Good. Listen to this. So they held the phone up and they announced the Washington Capitals select Keith Jones with the 141st pick of the draft, right? And my mom got to listen to it on the phone. That's, That's awesome. awesome. So she's excited, you know, and I get home and they say, 8 o'clock, be, be there. They want to talk to you. So I go downstairs. Was there not a slight delay because they had to verify that your age yeah. was, in fact, they, your age? Because yes. you wasn't on this list. Yeah, I'm not so on you this. probably could have been drafted the year before. Yeah I, well, yeah, I was eligible the year before, yeah. for sure. Yeah. So now I'm, so now I'm drafted the NHL. So at 8 o'clock, they're going to call me, right? So I'm just... This junior B guy that never works out. Here they call, right? And I'm like down in my parents' basement. I'm getting on the phone, you know, and I'm like, this is unbelievable, right? So David, uh, uh, Brian Murray gets on the phone at that time. And he's like, hey, we know we drafted you in the NHL. There's one man we want you to talk to that uh, fought, for the, fought for you to be drafted. And I'm like, yeah, put him on. So it comes on. It's uh, my name's Sam McMaster. He said, uh, you're going to play in the NHL. And that's I'm pretty like, cool. And I'm like, me? You know, that's what I'm thinking to myself. And I go, thank you, sir. You know, and he goes, uh, I know that you're going to make it to the NHL. And I look down, literally my arms, I don't have a muscle on me. I got no chest. I'm no like, one's ever a, wanted you on I would, I'd be in, I would be embarrassed to play in a skins game, like in basket, you know, in basketball. Yeah. Or so I, I'd be the guy, I'd be like, I'm on the shirts. You know, like it's... <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> and, then, and now I'm drafted to the NHL, and this guy's telling me you're going to play in the NHL. And I'm like, I don't know, buddy, is all I'm thinking to myself, right? <laughs> so I show up at Western Michigan a couple months later. And you got to take your shirt off for the physicals. And my coach is standing there. He looks at me and he goes, what? what's going on here? You know, and I'm like, what? He goes, uh, we got some work to do with you. So everyone's getting ready for the fitness test and they're all working the weights, right? They're warming up with 135 on the bar. And I've never left. I've never done bench press. I'm drafted to the NHL. I'm 19 years old. I'm in, going into my first year of college, and I've never done a bench press. And I'm going. This looks pretty easy because they're all whipping it up back and forth, warming up with it, right? So I get down there. Mike Eastwood, who played in the NHL, was, yeah. he was yeah. a sophomore at the time, so he's spotting me. And I'm down below that bar, and I'm looking up at it. I go, this looks, this looks all right. So I lift it off the bar. I can't get it off my chest to do one rep. I get halfway up, and it's tilting. And, you know, he's grabbing me from – like, he's helping me, and he lifts it up. And I go, I'm embarrassed. Like, I want to go home. Like, I, I'm thinking this, ain't, this is not for me. And uh, to his credit, he says, don't worry, man. That was me last year. You know, and he said, and, and he was. And he, if you're going to Western Michigan and you're going to make it to the NHL, there's a good chance you haven't lifted weights before <laughs> <laughs> because you're raw. Like, you're as raw as you can get. Like, everyone's going to the big schools. Yeah. You go to Western, you're, you're, you've got a chance if you haven't worked out before. So that was my introduction to the weight room. And, and ironically, your first ever uh, viewing experience for an NHL game was at the Maple Leaf Gardens against – it was Toronto versus the Washington Capitals. And I want to say, it was it your girlfriend at the time? Her family had tickets? It, that, that was later on, but that was my neighbor's parents that had tickets. But they had two by the bench, and they had two up in the second bowl. And, and thankfully, you and your buddy got to sit by the benches. And that's what really made you feel fall in love with the NHL. It, it was incredible, right? So I, I'd never heard language like that in my life. So we had literally the two seats right behind the bench. The stink of the players' equipment was off the charts, man. It, was, it stunk so bad, but it was so good, right? Yeah. So we watched the first period there. The deal was the parents would watch the second period there, and then we would come back for the third, okay? We watched the first. I mean, these guys were animals. The language was, like, off the charts. I was so excited. I was, like, 10 or 12 years old, you know, and I'm like, this is, this is crazy. This is great. So now we go up for the second period. We're way up top, and I keep watching his parents. I'm like, I can't wait to get back down there. So we meet up with them on the way back down. They go, no, no. <laughs> oh, because they heard yes. that song. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh, you no. guys are not going back there. <laughs> nope. So we, stopped, we stopped dead in our tracks. We had to watch the third period up there. So that was my first introduction 
to watching NHL hockey. And then my dad would give me for Christmas a pair of tickets to a Leaf game. And I would stare at that pair of tickets for hours a day waiting for that day to get the chance to go watch the Leafs play. And then when you say Western Michigan, you know, being a guy who wasn't highly recruited going there who can't lift, from talking to guys who played college, and I did, that's where you get strong, right? Over those three, four years, you must have all of a sudden changed completely into a man, right? Like, without Western it, Michigan, you don't know if you're ever playing in the show, right? Yeah, no, I, that, I would never have made the NHL if I didn't go to college. And, you know, your first year, you're playing limited minutes. You're, you know, you're lucky if you get a little penalty kill time. Your role is different. So you learn as a freshman how to play the game that uh, might serve you well later on if you if you're not as great as every player in the NHL second year power play third year you're doing it all you know fourth year I wanted to leave every year to be honest with you but yeah, they the weren't school. taking you didn't like the school yeah, but I just yeah. I just didn't like the yeah I, but my coach was great uh he allowed me to have the freedom to just get by yeah like he didn't like push me to get your great you know he just let me be me which was just stay eligible Keith. stay and that was it and then by my senior year, they came out with a new rule that they said we weren't going to do accumul- we weren't going to accumulate your uh, grade point average till the end of the year. Okay, we're on a semester system at Western Michigan. So I said, I'm done with school. I can guarantee you that. So I I went to like three classes the first semester. I got like a point. I want to say I got a point six zero Delta like, Tau Chi stuff. This is yeah. a, like this is a fact. The next, the next second semester, I got like a point four three, right? And so I leave. Not all scholastic. No, I, 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 I could probably have done it if I. I just never liked to read, so it's a problem when you're in college. I literally would get. I was on a scholarship, of course, and they you had a book allowance, right? They would give you your books, so I would go to the bookstore. I would pick up my books. They'd be in a bag. I'd bring them back to the apartment. I'd set them on the in the closet. And at the end of the semester, I would bring the bag back, and the books have never left them. And I got through four years of college <laughs> without ever opening opening a textbook <laughs> oh, ever, <laughs> ever. So, what, what uh, did you major in? I started. This is good. I started in phys ed. I thought we'd run around the gym, <laughs> and then I realized it's all health and education. Body. So I pivoted quickly, and I went into communications. There you go. And this is the best part of that story. Is I thought it'd be easy, you know. And then they say, hey, "Everybody, this is your chance. Get up and talk in front of the class." And I froze. I mean, no, really. I mean, I sweated. I sweat through my shirt. Yeah, and I just was so uncomfortable. Even just this was just like an easy assignment. Tell us about yourself, and I just I froze. So now, about three weeks later, we have a field trip to a TV station, and we're all going to get to give the news. So I'm in line, and I'm thinking, I I don't know, man. I don't know if I want to do this. So it's just a simple project. I got so nervous by the time I got to the front of the line. I looped back to the back of the line and left. I didn't want to speak in front Come of Come on. Yep, swear to God. So I dropped out of communications, and I went to sociology. Oh, well, that's beautiful. That was my man, major. Yeah. That was beautiful my subject. Idea. Beautiful <laughs> thing, right? <laughs> Study of Play humans. Well, you Play just, degree. All you do is outright the professor to the point where he gets so bored he gives you a seat. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I did. What a model. Yeah, so I stayed in sociology. But the, ironically, right, the, the T, like, the um, communication thing was which is bizarre because of, of what your career has transpired to be. Yeah, and it's, then, you seem like such a natural. I would have never guessed that. I was when I start when I first retired from the NHL and I started at ESPN. I was brutal, really, and, and I was one of those guys that ripped everybody. Like I'd watch the guys, and you know, it's, NHL, not, it's, it's, it's way harder than people think. Oh yeah, and I'd be like, look at that idiot, you know, like he's terrible, and you know, just like everyone does for me, right? It's the way it works. <laughs> but I was one of those guys, so. Now I'm on there, and I know I'm horrible, right? So it makes it worse. I'm really starting to sweat. Yeah. I, you know, I got this ill-fitting suit on. I gained like 50 pounds like three months after I retired. I ate everything in sight. <laughs> like it's just, I'm just like a monster on there, right? And I'm like, Job of the hut. I'm looking in the – you see yourself on TV, and I'm like, God. Ugh. It's horrible, man. Oh, hearing your voice. Just everything. You try. It's true. Like I, and then they're saying, well, be yourself, right? Everything. 
be yourself. What, am I that bad? Like, I, 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 you know, <laughs> have fun out there. Have fun. The worst thing you can ever tell anybody in TV that's just starting after they've done a couple segments is, hey, hey just, just have fun out there. Because you, you're telling the guy you're stiff you, as a board. Yeah, you suck right yeah, now. Yeah, you're terrible right now. And somehow you got to make me look good that I hired you, right? So <laughs> that was my first experience at ESPN. And uh, John Buchigas, who wrote the book, was real helpful to me. Darren Pang came in and, like, saved me and just made me a little more comfortable. I was not ready to do national TV at that time. And luckily, I came back to do flyer stuff just in a real, you know, like biz started with Arizona. With the Coyotes. Yeah, you were in a more relaxed environment. It's um, it's just less intimidating. Oh, I, hey, even just doing radio for the Coyotes, I was intimidated. And I'll never forget, we were, uh, you know, you're trying to be positive when you're involved with a team. And Rick Talkin had just started head coach. I don't think we won a game the first, like, 10 or 11 games. And we were playing the Flyers. Things haven't we changed two, in Phoenix. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> we were up 2 nothing in Philly, and then they pulled a goalie, and they ended up scoring two with the goalie pulled. And when they scored their second, I on the radio, I just, like, I froze up. Yeah, you're like, I got nothing. I felt like the biggest loser and idiot because I could just like I had nothing to say and like those were ha- those moments were happening a lot in the first probably half a season I started and it's hard but then like once you stick with it and you break through it then you find your rhythm it just then it 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 slowly gets better but it, there's a very very empty feeling when you first start that job in knowing that you like we know we're not doing good yeah. We know it. Yep. And and that's why I always thank Bob Heathouse because he took me under his wing and always made me feel comfortable. And he was the guy saying, you know, just have fun and like being supportive as opposed to like, yeah, you froze up and you sounded like shit. Biz is like, you want me to be myself? Do you know what I talk about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I don't Heater, know if you want I'm that. like, Heater, that could go the complete opposite way where we're both out of here. <laughs> Jonesy, this is insane. We haven't even gotten to your career yet, but throughout Pro all the career. Yeah, pro career, excuse me. You're right, Biz. This is the current career, doing what we're doing right now. But you in college, you didn't work out. You didn't really do much. You get to the pros. You must have thought, oh, my God, these guys are even bigger, stronger than when they when I got to Western Michigan and couldn't bench 135. Yeah, it's funny. The, uh, the summer before I went to Washington's camp, at the end of my senior year, I literally was playing – about 30 minutes a night at Western Michigan, and I was burned out. Like, I was done. When the season ended, I was done. And I took in a month off. month off turned into six weeks. Six weeks turned into two months, and all of a sudden training camp was around the corner. And I literally took the summer off. Now, I've just signed this contract. I've got a... I got a, a signing bonus of 75000 This is a great story. So I get seventy five grand. i have never really had a paycheck before. Like when I went home in the summers in Canada, if you're a college student, they don't take taxes out of your check. So I worked for the school board. I cut grass. I had this mower I used to drive around town. <laughs> <laughs> I'd race other cars with it. That was the gas <laughs> part. <laughs> He used the gas story. card. He used the gas card for, from junior. Like, to yeah, yeah, I was yeah. in Brantford, so Gretz would drive by in his you know, get the fuck Mercedes, and I'd be riding my lawnmower. Around. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get you, man. This guy's not playing in the show. Exactly. So anyway, so that was the, the so I get this money, seventy five grand signing bonus. Oh, this is the best. Oh, yeah. So I take the trainer on the hockey team with me to the car dealership. I'm gonna get a fancy car because I I want everybody to know that I'm gonna make it. Right? <laughs> so I go back to. I go back to Brantford and uh, put this sports car. But I take the the, the trainer, uh, Hap Zarzor, his name was. He went on to become the trainer at Duke football. So a little tiny guy. And I go, hey, Hap, come with the car dealer. Like, okay. So we go in. I go, that looks like a great car. It was a Mitsubishi 3000 VR4 twin turbo. And I'm like, that's that's got my what name. What color? On, it was red, bright red. <laughs> Had a fin on the back. What a donkey you were. Oh, it's terrible. So I don't know how to drive stick shift, right? So I said to Hap, hey, <laughs> like, you drive it. So the trainer drives my the drives the car. I'm sitting in the back seat watching him drive it. I go, How's, how is it? He goes, it's great. I go, we'll take it. I'd never even driven the car before I took it. It's like Rocky II oh when he God. pulls so, out. So I got this red sports car. This is the best. I go to Vegas with my buddies. First time I've ever been to Vegas. And we're having this great time. I brought a few bucks with it from the signing bonus, whatever I had left. The whole, remember, they give you the whole seventy-five grand. I don't know. I'm not thinking about taxes. Oh, I can no. tell you that. So I spend the whole thing. I think I lost thirty grand in Vegas. Right? I don't have any. That's the first money I've ever had in my <laughs> life. I spend it all. So it actually played into why I made the team. So anyway, so I go to Washington. Now I, I have to borrow money off my sister to get to training camp because I got no money. 
And, I, and someone's telling me you got to pay taxes. I'm like, oh, this is terrible. Right? So <laughs> she must have been like, what, what, you so have now nothing I, left? I, I've put myself in such a position that I got to make the team, man. Like I got to find a way to make this team, no matter what it takes. So I should have done the work in the summer. Did not to the point where I showed up at training camp. My first day, I'm standing there. Michael Pavanka, Peter Bondra are there, and they go, "Hey, kid, can you grab my sticks there?" Right? And I'm like, "That's kind of a strange request." So <laughs> I walk over and I get this Pavanka sticks. I bring them over to him, and he says, "Thank you." And I walk away, don't think anything of it. The next week or so goes by, and I'm sitting there on the bench with them during a preseason game, and. Uh, Bonjour's laughing. He looks over at me. I go, what? He goes, remember when Pivo asked me, asked you to get his sticks? I go, yeah, what? He goes, he thought you were the, he thought you were the equipment guy. <laughs> Cause <laughs> you got this milk, equipment kit. Yeah. you got this milk bag I, body. I, I, so but he's I'd like, be the first, uh, and you, you know, you were in camp. I'd be the first guy uh, off the ice, the practice and I'd leave. And they're like, where's this guy going? Like, who is this guy? I don't know. Number 41. He's not supposed to be here. Right. And I'd jump on the trainer's table. I'd get on the massage table, and all the veterans are going, what's this guy doing? No, you were oh, tough. Yeah. Yeah. Tough summer of drinking. It didn't, it didn't affect me at all that there was this pecking order of how it was going to work. I'm like, yeah, I'm here. I'm and that's back it. in the day when it was oh, like yeah. you eat last. Yeah. you get it, all That stuff used to really matter. Do you, do you think that they embraced the fact that you were so naive to it all that they could sense that you were completely naive to it all? Uh, Did I, they ever end up talking to you about Oh, about, yeah. So – now I'm like I'm I'm trying to make the team. I got no money, right? I'm making thirty five thousand in the minors, and I've got I'm a hundred and forty in the NHL, and I just spent seventy five grand. So I'm like, what am I gonna do, man? So I'm looking around. There's this tough guy was out of the lineup. This guy, and I I told you guys early, I'd never had a fight in my life, ever. So I'm thinking I better start. I better try it, right? So. I, Darren Banks is playing for Boston. He's trying out there, big, guy. tough guy, right? And he's skating around. I'm chirping at him. And he thinks I'm joking around. He's like, this guy's not going to fight me. And thank God he thought that because I didn't. <laughs> and Steve Leach was on the Bruins at that time. And that was my first ever fight. And he punched me in the head hard, man. I'm like, eh, I don't know. I don't know if this is uh, going to work for me. But I'm like, I got to make this team. I need the money. Like, I got to pay back my sister. So that's the only reason <laughs> that I ever started to fight in my first year in the NHL. You just, actually think and you were it, not in debt. Sorry. Yeah. If, you, if, you had, if you hadn't spent it, you don't think you're going out and fighting that game? Uh, no. I, I, I think I would have figured it out eventually. Yeah. But it was so much... My incentive to get there was... And at the time, I, f- I feel like organization, that was the, the extra factor as to why they would keep you. 100%. It's crazy to and think if about. I, if I didn't do that, I was a scorer in college. You know, I had 30 goals my last year at Western Michigan. But I was like, I got to do something different here that's going to give me a chance to make it. I'm number 41, right? So I made a good impression in camp. And then got sent down, had a, another argument with David Poyle where he's never seen anything like this in his life. I, I, he said, I, I was the last cut. I was the last guy cut. All right. And all and the guys were broken. practicing. We shared the same practice rink as the Capitals, the Skipjacks. So they're right across, the, right across from you. You're looking at them, right? And I had a good preseason. So I'm, the first game of the season was going to be against the Toronto Maple Leafs. Oh. The only meeting of the year that the Capitals would be in Toronto. Told you earlier, Leaf fan. Everything I did was a Maple Leaf fan. I want. I just want that game. I don't know if I can play in the NHL, but I, if I'm going to play one game and fail, I want that game to be in Toronto if I never make it. So I have this argument, not argument, but just this convincing conversation with David Poyle about why I want. I made the team. I want to be on this team. You know, I, I don't know if I made the team. This is just what I'm saying because I want to play that one game. So I leave the meeting and David tells others later, I hear that he couldn't believe he's never had a meeting with a player that wanted it so bad. <laughs> but I just wanted to show my buddies that I made it to the NHL. Yeah, it really, get a few it really wasn't that complicated, right? <laughs> I just want to swear so some yeah. kid behind the glass like me can go running up and talk about it. Exactly. Yeah. So I got sent down and... I'm thinking, man, I want to get back up there quick because riding that bus wasn't fun, man. I played, I played the first eight games of the season with the Skipjacks. And, you know, Friday night game, Saturday night game, busing in between, and then busing to an afternoon game yeah. on Sunday. I'm like, I'm 23. 
my window's small. I gotta, you know, I gotta do this. What right? are your stats in those eight? I had. Uh, I think right, you were a point yeah, a game. Yeah. yeah. What was it? You had seven goals, three assists. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So, the last game that I played for the Skipjacks for Barry Trotz, we lost ten to eight against the Utica Devils. Okay. I had two power play goals in the game, and I was minus seven. <laughs> Hey, but you had a great one after. If you're in the shower, no. you still had two. Oh. Minus seven, okay? The last goal goes in the net, and the buzzer went before the empty netter and to make it 10-8, and the buzzer went. I'm still upset about it. So I'm chasing after the ref. <laughs> right? We're like, the game's over. And I'm like they're yelling at him, and Barry Trot grabs me. He goes, what are you doing? I go, I'm effing <laughs> minus seven, <laughs> right? That's, that's the only thing that's on my mind. So that was the last. Saying that to the coach, too. yes, Jonesy, you're yeah. a fucking idiot. Oh yeah. So I'm just <laughs> yeah, you were fucking I'm, out of your mind. I'm crazy about it, right? So he's like, ah, whatever. So the next day, I had two roommates that I live with in the minors: Rob Leesk and Trevor Halverson. And Trevor Halverson was a first round pick of the Caps. And um, so they're my roommates. I have the loft upstairs in this apartment. I knew the Capitals had injuries. And I'm thinking, I, I, I'm getting yeah. close, man. I'm arguing with Barry Trotz every day. I got to get called up. That's, I just, I, I don't know why I was <laughs> so people nuts. just and crazy about it, right? Every time I'd score, I'd be looking at him. It's time. You know, it's time. <laughs> so, so <laughs> this, is, this is comedy. So hour, now man. I'm, li- so I'm listening. I had a yellow Walkman. Remember those things? Oh, yeah. God, I'm yeah. up in the loft because I don't want my roommates to know that I'm such a geek that I'm listening to the Capitals game, hoping that somebody gets hurt or something bad happens that I'm going to get the call. <laughs> Right, and they're playing in Vancouver, so it's a late game. So I'm listening on the radio, my Walkman, and all of a sudden I hear Kevin Miller gets a five minute major for Spear. And I knew he was kind of in the doghouse, you know. I'm like, that's good because he was just traded for Dino Cicerelli the year before and wasn't playing well. And I'm like, oh, this is all right. So that's good. And then I hear Mark Hunter just leaves the game. Dale Hunter's brother, he's, he blocked a shot. I'm like, oh, this is good. This is good. Still have, still have my Walkman on, right? So all of a sudden my roommate's tapping me on the shoulder. And I'm listening to the Capitals game when this my roommate tasks me. He goes, hey, it's David Poyle. He's on the phone for you. As I'm listening to them play a game in Vancouver, he says, I go, hello? He goes, hey, uh, it's David Poyle. Uh, Keith, we want you at the airport tomorrow at BWI in Baltimore. You've got a 7 a.m. flight to Calgary. And I'm like, Yes. Right, this is amazing to me. I can't believe it. So I'm so excited. I don't fall. I don't sleep the whole night. Right, I get to the airport. I'm get there. I go through the check in. I look over. There's Steve Connor Walchuk. <laughs> I'm like, damn, he's going too. Right. I'm like, am I in or is he in? Like it's like fucking me the whole way on the plane. Right. I fly all the way to Calgary. We get there, and. Uh, Terry Murray's the coach, and he's like, it brings us both in. He's like, and we're not sure if you guys are going to be playing tonight or not. I'm like, well, what's, what's that all about? He goes, we just don't know. Go get a rest. And I haven't slept on. I'm not going to sleep now. So go back to the hotel. Still don't know if we're in the lineup or not. Get to the game. And he tells us when we arrive, you're both in. You're both playing tonight. And I'm like, I can't, uh, this journey like to get Let's here is, is here, right? So I get my uh, jersey on, and I'm like, so I, 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 I'm so excited to do this, right? So I look in the mirror in Calgary, the little small rink there, and I'm looking in the mirror, and I'm just like, I can't believe this is going to happen, right? Step on the ice, warm up, can't, they can't make a pass. Drop it. <laughs> it was embarrassing. Game starts, first shift, go up to hit Theo Fleury. He elbows me, breaks my tooth in half. <laughs> First shift in the NHL. the NHL. And I'm like, yeah, I, don't know. I don't know about this, man. Maybe this isn't for me, right? And it really hurt. So I just uh, remember chasing around like Gary Roberts and all these guys that would just kill me, right? But I just wanted it so and you're bad. you're chirping, right? Non-stop. Chirping all night. That was always always part of it. Um, and then that, I, Oh, really? So no, it was nonstop every shift yeah. trying to scrum it up yeah. in front of the net. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, again, was just to try to gain an advantage and make myself more important than just being an average player. And all of that, I played better when I had fear, and yeah. it pushed me it's to another good, level. to play for. Yeah. Like, like, like the money to your sister. That's like, it. Just It was yep. all about, like, I have to stay here, right? I, hey, same here. I played scared my whole NHL career. Yeah, and it's no Every fun. It's, it's, not a, it's not a great feeling, not a comfortable feeling, but it brings you. It brings something out of you. It does. Well, well it's, it's the saying, like, you're getting too comfortable. It's yeah. just 
there, I, I certainly, I certainly got that way. But w- you have such an incredible memory. You remember all these. Oh, it's yeah. great. I wish I could. I wish I had that talent. But you got to tell me about the first goal because I'm sure it was yeah. something that you'll never forget. Yeah, well, it's true. It was a game in Indianapolis. It was a neutral site game. And they I had those. Yes, no we shit, used really? to play two a year. Trying to grow so, a crowd in Indy? It was, yeah. So they would try to make the, we went to Halifax before. They'd play 84 games in the regular yeah. season, not 82. Yeah, they went to 84. So they would add these yeah. two games, more revenue, and try to build the game, right? So it's in Indianapolis. I've never been back. It's the only time I've ever been to Indianapolis. <laughs> and my puck actually has like the neutral zone, you know, the neutral game emblem and rather than a team's mm-hmm. emblem that you would have if you scored, you know, in Toronto, Maple Leaf, whatever. So it was no it was my third game in the NHL, I think. It was no I think it was November third, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, we're playing the Chicago Blackhawks and in the warm ups, I have a couple buddies come from college because Western Michigan's not that far away from Indianapolis. And I'm skating around the warm up, no helmet on, you know, I'm looking at myself in the in the glass thinking I got it going on, you know, like this is cool and skating around and my buddy yells over the glass, Jonesy. And as he does that, I look up, I step on a puck, and I go head first into the boards. No. And I'm like, oh, my God, this night's not going to go well, man. So I get up, I get, I'm okay. And my first shift of the game, I score, and it's against Eddie Belfour. It's a scramble. It's a terrible goal, but it's like it happened. Matter. It happened, man. Like it, it happened. And I'm battling with Dirk Graham all night that night. Another he was a mean bastard. He was tough. Yeah. He As was a tough. coach guy said he was mean too. Yes, he was, and he was mean to play against. But I had that's I had to do that right. So I ended up uh, getting a goal and two assists in that game. We won, I think we won four to two or something like that. So I'm like, this is awesome, right? It's like my third game, and then. Um, I ended up getting nine points in my first 10 games. And I remember thinking to myself, like, is this really the NHL? Like, <laughs> I'm thinking, this, this isn't that hard. Like, like, I can do minute. this, I'm, right? I'm, who are you playing with? I'm I was playing line. with Dale Hunter and Pat Elenick. And, uh, you know, we were the third line. We got the good matchups. He was getting a little older by then? He was, but he was still a great player. Like, and Dale was really influential in my career great advice. And I took his brother's job. Mark hurt himself, broke his thumb. And that's how I got the job. When he left that game in van. Yep. And Dale took me under his wing and just like, he said, you can play. You know, he just told me we got a two second rule. If someone's on top of me, you got to be there in two seconds to make sure, <laughs> you know, that's, that was the deal. And we both played, you know, a, a pesky style. Oh, yeah. And neither of us really wanted to be fighting heavyweights. So yeah. we would just make sure if there was one out there, we would do enough Help to each other. distract yeah. them. And then, and Dale told me a great story, which I'll, I'll share with anyone that's listening. When I looked a little hesitant to fight one night, he said, the next day we're at dinner, I'm sitting at his kitchen table at his house, and he goes, hey, Jonesy, I go, he go what? He goes, you want to stay in this league? You know, you want to stay here? I go, yeah, I do, really badly. He goes, well, here, I want to tell you something. If somebody walked into this kitchen and there's 500 grand on the table, if they grab the money and walk out, what are you going to do? Are you going to fight them for it or are you going to let them walk out? And I said, I'm going to fight them for it. He goes, good, start fighting. Yeah. Yeah, that's and that was the advice that what I. A, what a veteran to sit there and tell a guy who like and he who could probably br- tell you yeah. wanted it. Yeah, and, and he's like, you know, it's not an easy conversation to have with somebody. No, but something you never forgot. No, and and again, I took his brother. I was taking his brother's yeah, job, job, who was yeah. still down sent down to Baltimore at that point in Mark's career. He'd already won a Stanley Cup. He had a great career, and all of a sudden he's in the minors, and this you know twenty three year old college kid out of nowhere is playing with his brother on the same line and you know getting massages before me yeah Dale exactly. knows the business you know yeah he's the, he's the best yeah he was, dale hunter was very influential which guys, arena oh, which, which arena was it in indianapolis by the way i got it was it that's a great question i really don't know um I, it had to be where the with the with Indiana Racers were. Gretzky, I think well, Gretz played that's for them because we when we just had our street hockey tournament in Detroit, the Coven, Covington, uh, Kentucky, this crew actually went and got the boards from the uh, the uh, oh sorry the camera the, from the Gretzky Arena, the place where he played in yeah. Indianapolis. So I was wondering if it was I the same it, arena. I, it had I'm to sure have been it right. It was yeah. right downtown. I think it was Mar Mar maybe Mar yeah. Arena maybe. Yeah, it rings right. a bell. But I mean, when you're playing, you show up. Yeah, and you're yeah like, exactly. Where's yeah. the yeah. locker room? Where's my equipment? Let's go. You know. Um, were guys like hacking darts when you showed up? Like, yeah, you had Al, Al I afraid yeah, on the team. Uh, played with Al. The planet. Al would oh, smoke. On, Al would smoke on the plane. This is when we flew char- <laughs> We flew charter flights, right? And With three rows that could smoke. Four, yes, uh, roll fourteen, right? Yep. 
and the, the back rows would be able to smoke and Al would smoke on the plane and was just an incredible guy. I mean, cause I was a rookie and Al was Tough a story, storyteller, Tough 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 storyteller, but have your back and pay for everything. Like really? extremely generous guy. If we went to dinner, he'd know that you didn't have a lot, of, you know, he'd buy, he'd always carried it like a wad of cash in his front pocket and would just give it to everybody. He didn't like any clicks on the team. He was always like, you know, we do this together. We, you know, he was just an awesome and a, and a character beyond belief. He'd he'd light his cigarettes what? after the game of the blowtorch. He'd break <laughs> yeah. off the filter. Yeah. He'd break the filter off <laughs> and he'd smoke it. Um, the All Star game, he brought like well, one stick with him. They asked him why'd you do that. You know, he said, "Well, the, my others would get jealous if I have too many." You know, it's some like some of the craziest. He's like WWE answers. with the hair too. Yeah. You yep. mentioned, man. Oh, well, he, Al was like very conscientious of his hair. Oh, and it was terrible. terrible. Think? So we're, we were playing. This is unbelievable. We're playing against the Devils, <laughs> and the long boards there that extend inside the zone on the Devils bench, the glass, the barrier there before they put the curve in there. He gets hit, and he's riding the end of the boards on his pants, right? And then he runs into the stanchion with his helmet, his head. His helmet flies off, lands about 10 feet away, right? This guy wore his helmet in the warm-up so people wouldn't see that he was going bald. Like during the national anthem, he would wear his helmet. So the helmet's 10 feet away, and we're all watching. How's this going <laughs> to play out, right? So he's down on it all fours, and he crawls <laughs> 10 feet, right? He gets his helmet, and he... Puts it on his head and collapses. <laughs> no. Then he decided that you yep. needed to go. Ten feet he went and collapsed. It was one of the best moments ever. Imagine being on, imagine that being on video now. We could ever get. It's got to be. Well, he, you know, he he oh, you're, he shit. didn't always though because the best picture of him online. He's in warm ups. You can tell with yeah. no bucket. Oh, with the little. Yeah. But he's got the flow at the back. But then he's got the circle ball, little hair up top. But yeah. To, to, to know he cared that much, he must <laughs> fuck. It's like a Rorschach test. The, so he like would, a, he literally would show up for <laughs> practice about five minutes before it started. Throw all his gear on. He was a natural. He was he'd throw his gear on. He jump on the ice, and he he was unbelievable. Really fast. His shot. Right? His shot. shot. Over, he was like he was the guy. One oh five. Right? One oh five. He would. Uh, he but he shot, was fast, right? He could skate all day. So he raced in Washington at our practice rink. He raced a uh, female speed skater. They're going to have this race, uh, uh, Battle of the Sexes race or something back in the day. And he races her, and he loses by like three full arena uh, 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 trips around the rink. That's how, like he gets he gets passed three times, and he's a smoker, right? He's he was good for one lap. His little feet were going as fast as he could, and it was uh, it was unbelievable. But he was open and willing to do anything that he was asked to do. So uh, he was another phenomenal teammate that uh, we played with. And they had Kevin Hatcher back in Washington in those days. Yeah, Ally Afredi and Sylvain Cote, and all three defensemen scored over twenty goals in that season. I think Hatcher first time had, ever. Yeah, it had to be. Hatcher had thirty four. I afraid Kevin, Hatcher, Kevin had Hatcher had thirty four yeah. goals one year. Yep, we'll have to look it up because that's my my yeah, memory yeah. is. But and I afraid he had you know twenty something, and Cote had over twenty, and Callie Johansson had twelve. That was and, our uh, defense. The only yeah. other guy that pops in my mind we haven't talked about from Washington was Barube. Yeah, he's the best. And you play with him a little bit on because oh were yeah a, 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 a lot a bottom six right. Yeah, I play with him and. He he did more to defend me than any person in the world. I mean, this guy is one of, one of my well, – he's my best buddy. He's, he's the best. So I remember when he got traded to the Caps. It's one of the first TV broadcasts of the draft. And it's on TSN, and I'm sitting at home in Brantford, and I'm like, we could use a little more protection around here. It's like one of my second year, right? <laughs> you call Poyle. My list was getting a little short, yeah, you right? you call Poyle. You're like, yeah. hey, we need hey, some protection. Yes. So I'm on the phone my agent, Dave. Yeah. So I look, at David, I look at David Poyle's – I see – I read his lips. Craig Berube, he's talking to the guy from Calgary, right? The GM. And I'm like, yeah, do it. Do it, man. So all of a sudden they announced uh, – Capitals have a trade to announce. They've acquired Craig Berube from the Calgary Flames. And I'm like, that guy's going to be my best friend. And, I mean, as soon as you meet Craig Berube, he is their, the consummate teammate. 
Uh, we watched hockey together all the time. Dale Hunter, myself, and and Chief, we sat around, you know, grabbing a few chicken wings, drinking beer, and all we did was watch other games. And I we watched the Sabers a lot when Ray, May, and Barnaby be fighting all the time, and I'd be telling Chief, "Those guys are gonna kick your ass," you know. And it was just everything was just about the game, and it was a it was a beautiful time in all of our lives because that's that's what we did, and. Uh, and then like Chief, best buddies busting balls yeah, like, all the time, yeah, and just... I would he would be betting me he's going to score more goals than I am that year, and uh, he, I got him, I got him a suspension for ten games once playing the Rangers. Nick Kiprios, I was due up. I'm on the bench. I got one leg over. Bondra and Pavanka, my line mates, are already on the ice, and Kiprios kind of clipped Bondra. So I say, Chief, you're up, right in the middle of the, the middle of the shift. So he gets up, he jumps on the ice, he skates over to Kiprios and attacks him, right? <laughs> he gets a 10-game suspension for leaving the bench oh, yeah. to get in an altercation. Shoney, the coach, gets fined, and they're, they're trying to get him for a suspension as well. Uh, it cost Barubi like twenty five grand in the in the thing, but the caps ended up back in those days. You could kind of you could make those things okay. You could even things up, not in the salary cap era, right? But he, that was what Chief would do. You anything that the team needed he did and that's why he's you know had a great career and is doing such a great job as a coach as well you must have chatted with him since like watching him win the stanley uh, cup like i the, saw i saw you have the poster with him raising the cup in your in your man cave the outside yeah. near the pool like just a, a great friend forever huh? yeah he is and that was that was for me as close as i came to winning the stanley cup i was there covering it obviously i'm i was being partial but i wanted that i wanted to see him win that thing and when he did it was it was a great thing it was the only time i've ever gone downstairs in the locker room after a stanley cup championship and just to congratulate him they very it was on the road so there was very you know few people there and just uh you know share a bud light there and then talk about that experience was that was a great thing very very uh great moment for him Oh, go ahead, Ari. I don't know if you have one more. I was going to say closest to the Stanley Cup might be a good segue to the Colorado trade unless you had something well, else. Well, Washington. I wanted to hear about how the trade went down because I read that story in the book as well. And, like, <laughs> of course, it, knowing you more now through the first half of this interview, I understand why it went down the way it went down. So getting traded from the Avalanche to yes, the Flyers? Yeah, when you, so, were, when you were sick, where you were oh, very oh. ill for a few weeks. Oh, that's so that's from the that's the Capitals. That's when I got well, traded from the Caps to the Avalanche. Well, yeah, that's what yeah, I want to hear trade about. I want to so, talk about, yeah. yeah so I was... Shoney and I were fighting again because I wasn't uh, wasn't playing well, and I was he, one day I'm laying down on the ice after practice. I'm counting the lights up in the seal, and I'm just laying on the ice doing like snow angels, you know. And he's he comes over, what's wrong now, you know? And I go, I said I'm exhausted. He goes, that's it, you're going to the Mayo Clinic. Or I, I, well, I didn't feel that exhausted, but okay. <laughs> so I went down the street to get blood work taken. It wasn't the Mayo Clinic. It was like the local guy with a, could stick a needle in your arm. So I get that done. I'm waiting for these results. I am feeling pretty run down, right? So it's on my mind. I've been thinking, maybe I hope something's not really wrong. I didn't think there was, but maybe. And I don't hear anything. A week goes by. I get to the game against the Islanders on the road. I've got a toothbrush in my suit jacket. That's all I brought. It's, it's a, a one, night, trip. one night trip. And uh, I wasn't great, big on packing stuff, and I wasn't a clothes horse. I wore whatever, whatever I had, and I would wear it, you know, for a few weeks in a row. <laughs> so really. turn your underwear inside <laughs> out. Yeah, whatever it took, you know. Leave the underwear there in the laundry bag, get it clean, oh, yeah. take oh. the laundry, right? Oh, it's, you know, the, all the old tricks. So I, I'm there, and I'm wondering. I keep asking the trainer, staying long. I go, "Did you get the results yet?" You know, no, no, we didn't. So the game's getting ready to start I'm in the dressing room getting ready for the pregame skate I go on the ice I come back off the ice after the skate and I've got one skate on one's getting sharpened and a Shoney walks in he goes hey I step in my office and I'm like this is kind of this is bizarre at this time of the night you know I'm just getting ready for the game I'm sitting beside Huntsy and I I look over at him and I, he's he just didn't know what was happening. So I walk with one skate on, one off. I walk in un- un- unbalanced as usual. And uh, he-, he sits me down. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm going, he must have got uh, the results and they're bad. That's all I'm thinking. This is bad. Like it's something my heart is like dropped right in my stomach. So he sits down. He looks across. I look at him. He goes, I've got some terrible news for you. And I'm like, oh, my God. It's, <laughs> it's happening. Like, there's nice. something. Yeah, I'm dying. Right? Oh, so he's God. like... Uh, You've been traded. And I go, oh, thank God. <laughs> and he's like, well, you're taking this a lot better than I thought you would, right? And I'm like, oh, oh this, is the best. this is amazing. To who? 
<laughs> and he's like, you got, you're treated to the Colorado Avalanche. I go, oh, even better. <laughs> right? He's like, I can't. I thought, a wagon. Would, I thought you'd be a little more upset. I go, no, no, I'm not upset. I said, I love you as a person, but as a coach, you know, that's, I, had, I had enough, you know, and he's just laughed. So um, I go, who'd I get traded for? We can't tell you. I go, well, I want to know who I got traded for. I want to see what value I have, right? I've been fighting my whole career thinking that I'm a better player than I am. Tell me who I got traded for. So can't tell you. So I call my wife, who was my fiance at that time, Laura, and I'm like, hey, uh, I couldn't get a hold of her because this is like payphone times. And prior to that, I had no money, right? And so the team's like, go upstairs in the, in the arena, like walking around where the crowd is. And uh, call the avalanche, right? And I go, for what? They go, well, to get, you got to get on a flight. You're, you're leaving. So all the fans are in the corridor walking around. I got my hockey bag on my shoulder. I got three sticks in my hand. And I have a quarter that I borrowed from the equipment guy to call the avalanche. I call Pierre Lacroix. And I'm like, uh, hi, this is Keith Jones. Hey, how you doing? Uh, we got a flight for you out of JFK. I'm thinking, where is JFK? Like, I, I, don't, I wasn't paying attention to anything. He goes, well, you need to take a taxi. You need to go there, get the plane. So I go back downstairs, and I'm like, uh, does anybody have any money I can borrow? The teams are already on the ice. They're playing. The game started. So the trainer gave me like 50 bucks to pay the cabbie, took the cab to the airport, walked up. They're like, here's your ticket. And I look at it. So this says coach. And they're like, uh, yeah, no, I don't know. That's a mistake. This is uh, first class, right? And they're like, going to the Avalanche. Yeah, here. yeah. Come so on. they're like, no, no, it's going, no, no, it's first class. Okay. So it put me in first class. So I'm sitting there. I'm stopping in Atlanta. I still don't know who I'm traded for. That's all that's on my mind now. Who'd I get traded for? So I'm having a cocktail on the plane. <laughs> and I, I land in Atlanta. I haven't got a hold of my uh, fiance or wife now uh, to tell her, you know, I've just been traded. So we've been traded. So I get there and uh, land in Atlanta. I call her and I go, hey, uh, I've been traded. She goes, yeah, I know. I go, well, how'd you know? She goes, I saw it on the bottom line. My dad saw it on ESPN2 on the bottom line. That I go, well, who'd I get traded for? She goes, uh, Chris Simon and... Uh, somebody named Curtis Lecision. I go, well, that's pretty good. Those guys, <laughs> guys from- yeah, yeah, those guys. And a first rounder went with me, right? So Simon, toughest guy in the league at that time, or one of them. And Lecision was an alternate captain. They just won the Stanley Cup. I'm like, that's pretty good. I like that. So uh, I don't know if the Avalanche liked it by the end of it, but <laughs> anyway, I land in Atlanta. So I get on the plane, land a fly to LA, show up there. Next morning, they're having it's an afternoon game at one o'clock. I don't even know what time I got there, so I go down to breakfast. They just won the cup. They've got Patrick, Patrick Waugh, Joe Sackick, Peter Forsberg, Adam Foot, uh, Valerie Kaminsky, Dead Marsh. Adam Deadmarsh, uh, Scott Young, Mike Ricci. I mean, this team's awesome, man. So I walk in, they're all eating breakfast. You know, it's the first time I've ever been traded, and I'm really excited, right? So I come in there, I sit down, and I'm they're all talking to me. I go, Don't worry, boys, I'm here. Here. <laughs> cup number two is on the way right and they're just like start laughing and you yeah, immediately welcomed into the locker room because i had bothered so many guys in that team oh, yeah. for a long time especially when they were in quebec forsberg included so they were like all right this guy this jerk's on our side and then they i think came to, to came to like me as a you know a person well they life. had two now they had you and claude lemieux yeah and peppy was there too and he was hurt at the time so right. um so anyway, it was just a, an incredible start. I had like three game-winning goals in the first four games and had a, my best season ever as far as goal scoring went and all the rest of that. So, but it was so awesome. They uh, – what? Oh, my God. You, I love you. No, I'm just thinking of that team. 96, they, they win it. Yep. And Lemieux get, buries Draper from yes. behind. So then you get there the next year. Detroit goes back-to-back. Back. What did that playoff end like? Because one of them, Biz and I were saying on the way out, was seven games, seven nothing, right? Yeah. That, was that it, that it year? Was. So, was that later? So that I th- it could have been that year. So what happened with me is the Detroit thing was is a, an incredible story. So – I arrive. I'm not part of that, right? Because I wasn't there. Yeah. Right. So oh, you're thrown yeah. into. You get in the midst of it. You're thrown yeah. into it. And the first three games against Detroit that year, we beat them every time. And it was they were tough, hard fought games. The Red Wings were a tougher team than us because Simon was gone. Right now, it's I'm not fighting those. I'm not fighting Brennan Shanahan. I, I, McCarty. You know, they, they'd love to fight me, but I'm not the guy to go against. I mean, we we lost that element. Um, so we beat them the first three great games. So many talented players on both teams. 
the fourth and final meeting of the season was that March 27th game. And before it, all the hype is coming in, right? And But it was the same hype for every game. But now it's the last game of the regular season. We're in first. We're ahead of them. We've owned them all year. We go up 4-1 in the game. 4-1 we're winning. And then all hell breaks loose. And it was the most well-timed attack that I've ever seen. And I don't think Detroit wins the cup that year. I think we do. I don't think it, so many things happen in that fight. Patrick Waugh hurt his back. Yui Krupp hurt his back. We had some injuries that came in there and wow. all the tough guys. Like everyone says the Red Wings Russian five won the cup for They were great players, obviously, but they won the cup because of Shanahan. Biggest reason was Brandon Shanahan, his toughness and his ability to score and get goals and Darren McCarty and Joey Cole. They, that's why they won those cups. Those guys were so tough that they put them over the top that without plan, them. That plan attack was by McCarty, who jumped Claude Lemieux. Uh, Patrick Waugh ended up coming out in his defense. I think Shanahan ended up grabbing Waugh. All the time, bro. Every time you see these clips yeah, come out, it was it, it's all this stuff and that rivalry. Why did it, it take was, till that last game of the season? Because it's that Scotty Bowman, man. He said, let's wait. Tone. We're going to wait to it's get just, them all year. If you're going to do it, do it where it's going to change things. Like, why do it in the first game of the regular We're season? We're going to get you back. We're going to wait. And then it's gone, right? Yeah. So they gained so much momentum from that. We had injuries. And then we started the playoffs. We started with the Blackhawks. And um, I, in the fifth game, or fifth game of that series, I blew my knee out. That's when my injury happened. So I was not there playing when the uh, conference finals rolled around against Detroit. And I think it was a 4-2 series win, if I remember correctly. But I was kind of... You know, when you're not playing, you're yeah. hurt. It's, like, it's the memories of that stuff don't stick with me like they did when you were involved in it. So that was a uh, disappointing end to that season after having yeah. a great year in Colorado. So in that game, you went down 4-1. They ended up crawling back after. And then, of all people, Darren McCarty ended up scoring the OT winner. Yep, wins it on overtime 6-5. to five. So that's, I mean, that's where the history of the Red Wings – turnaround happened changed you know they they were a great team before that they got yeah. swept by the devils right bingo 95 Flyers, yeah uh, the uh the the um avalanche and mm. dallas stars and detroit were miles ahead of everybody in the league at that time those and three teams in the west no one in the east no one them. was going to come close and the flyers found that out when they were swept four straight say jonesy prepper for this interview i was shocked when i pulled up the box score from that game and saw no pims for you and and Two for Sack again, Eagle, yeah. Larry, because they happen to be on the ice. It's, like, it's a great question. So Mark Crawford, after the game, he's like, the next day he comes up to me. No, on the bench, actually. This is awesome. So <laughs> he's like, everything's happening, right? And he's he looks and he goes, hey, to me, he says, if McCarty gets one more fight, he's out of the game. Like, <laughs> you know, okay, go ahead, right? I go, no, no, that's not accurate. I said he only got a double minor the first time. <laughs> And he okay, did. So Mark, he did. <laughs> right, right. It was that, a double minor. Was, so that was the biggest thing. He should have been out of the game yes. by the end of yep. it because they gave him a double minor for jumping Claw the Muir, and he should have got the instigator, all of it, and thrown out. But he stayed in. And, he got, and, and like you said, it was kind of like the turnaround. Yeah, that was and the and momentum. I, I, it completely I'll be changed. Honest, I'll be honest about that situation. As as crazy of things I've done in my career, I knew we were doing the wrong thing. I knew that Taking we did not need to fight that team because we weren't built to beat them up. Yeah. I played on tough teams in Washington, especially with Ruby, Alan May. I mean, there were seven or eight guys ahead of me to fight. On the Avalanche, I'm looking going, geez, there's like four of us that are in the same category here. Like it's, It was an entirely different team, and it was a big mistake. And I had a conversation with Mark Crawford about it after. I said, "That's, you know, we did the wrong thing. Yeah. We should have let Claude get beat up. You take a few punches, okay, and let's move on. But the fact that our guys were so competitive, and yeah. just, they were just, and they were invested in it probably more than I was because I wasn't there the year before. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. it's a, I had a different perspective on. Uh, what, uh, what about? Um, I feel like the most interesting man in the world, Peter Forsberg. Oh, yeah. Like so many people wonder about him, but he's not in the public eye. But when he was on. I mean, one of the greatest players ever, and you witnessed that right in the yeah. In the prime. I, I got I played on the same line as Peter because Claude was out, so I was my line mate when I arrived there. And I've never, I mean, I had so many tap ins, it was crazy. And he was such a great guy, and he loved when I would get 
other players going on the opposition. He knew that I'd have his back. I, I had to fight that Todd Simpson once, a guy in Calgary, because he hit Peter. And I jumped in there and I got killed, right? But that's that's what you want to do. I always tell like the tough guy on the other team, you want to fight me, hit our best player. I'll be right. I'm going to, I got to fight. I'm not going to fight you because you're asking me to fight yeah. you. That ain't happening. But you do something, I'm going to fight you and I'm going to lose, but it's okay. And that's the way. And Peter always liked that part of it. We were great friends. He came to Brantford with me once we landed in Toronto. He goes, where are you? you live around here? I go, yeah, just down the road. He goes, let's go. And we went and stayed the night in my hometown. And he went, you know, out to the bar, local bars, Woody's pub and grub, like all, like, and there's Peter Forsberg and these guys. And, uh, couldn't believe that they would see him in that environment, right? And so friendly to everyone. Just the best. You know, he was a That's he's just awesome. a great guy. And Joe I roomed with Joe Sackick and played with Joe. We were on the second line. There was Adam Deadmarsh, myself, and of course Joe in the middle. And then we had Forsberg at center on the top line with Valerie Kaminsky, Claude Lemieux. And we had Mike Ricci, Scott Young on and Renee Corbet. I mean, this team is it's incredible Lord. that we, you know, the, the, the one thing through the book that surprised me was like how you, you said that Patrick Wall was far and above the best leader that you'd ever played with and probably the most intense guy you've ever played he, with. He was. He, he, Joe was a great captain because he allowed other people to lead as well. And Patrick was one of the best leaders with Dale Hunter as another one that just commanded everyone's attention. You you may if you had a good game, it wasn't that you scored two goals or it was if you did all the little things right and he recognized it. Like you could have a game where you didn't have a goal and he'd come up and he'd go, Hey, you had a great game tonight. And he and you did. Like it wasn't bullshit. So, so you're saying he, he would so he would be dialed into the, the whole the whole play all game. All game. His mind was what separated from That's everybody why he coached, else. probably. Yeah, and he I think he's like he would be such a great coach, especially now that he's had experience in yeah. the NHL. He was phenomenal that way. I have the utmost respect for the way that he handled a locker room penalty kill. He was in charge of. He'd bring the guys in and draw stuff up. I'd, I'd never seen that from a goaltender. And you know, if I know they've pasted a few C's on goalies before in the past, but he was a, a true captain. And Joe was a great captain because he allowed other people to to lead, and he didn't have to be the only voice. And that's a great part of leadership as well. Is that because guys of who they are or how they say what they're saying? Is it a little bit of a combination? It's it's about how they say it. Like it's just the fact you know when you've done something a small thing really well that helped the team win. Right. And maybe it's a block shot. Maybe it's a simple play along the wall, getting the puck out of the defensive zone. Uh, any of that, or maybe it's staying disciplined at a time where you you may have retaliated. He saw all of that, and I I hadn't seen that before. Like, especially I could, from a goalie, from a goalie, yeah. right? And I and I I've always you know felt like I was a smart enough player to know what was needed at a certain time, and he just had he took that to a whole nother level. Uh, actually, you know one one part of that ESPN game, well the uh, Detroit Colorado game, the replay of that night. Remember ESPN used to replay the game later that night. They actually edited out that whole the whole fight sequence because I was in college at the time and we all watched it live. Of course, we didn't know what was going to happen. This was pre internet, pre whatever, and we all put the replay on at three o'clock in the morning because we were still in college. And they edited the game like, really? for, like, and they took that whole fight sequence out of the game and they replayed it later in the night, which is. Kind That's of crazy. Little fun fact. All, yeah. forgiven. Little RA high at three in the morning. Fun fact. Just yeah, I like it. I like wake it. And bake it's only three buddies. in the afternoon. No, he actually, now, but... he actually bet the game, but he forgot who won, so he did just watch it again. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> uh, boys, I don't know if you want to move to the reason we're here in Philadelphia, if you had any more Colorado questions. But, well, again, it's a shitty it's a shitty one, but you guys had a 3-1 series lead to Edmonton the next yeah. season. Well, you guys are still a cup contender. You blow that lead, and you're out in the first round. I mean, that's, yeah, you, that's I have a lot of those memories. Actually, thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> well, so we go I both was, sides, yeah. I, I was on three teams, three different organizations that were up three one in a series and lost. Shit, yeah, wow! I, it happened to me in Washington. Actually, happened. I really the reason I think it happened is because my first year in Washington, when I started in the minors, I got called up for the playoffs, and I knew I wasn't going to get in the lineup. And we're just skating every day. Barry Trotz is skating us, and. The Capitals are up 3-1 over the Penguins. This is in 92. 
And I'm like, man, I don't, I don't know if I'm enjoying this a whole lot. Like I'm not really part of the team. I wouldn't mind like this thing ending sometimes so I can go home and enjoy my summer. So I'm basically doing a little low five every time the Penguins <laughs> score, you know? So they come all the way back Pittsburgh and they win this seven game opening round series and go on to win the Stanley cup. That's how close the capitals were. They're up three, one Dino Cicerelli scores four goals in game four. They win eight to four. They're up 3-1 in the series, heading home, and the Penguins come all the way back, win that in seven, and go on and win the Stanley Cup. It's did a, Mario take over? Yes, he did. And they, I think they won one nothing the last game. They, they had a new scheme. Um, and it, it, Anyway, it was amazing to watch. So the ne- that, so I, I'm thinking that's I hexed myself forever because three, three other times I had it. Once with the Capitals against the Penguins, uh, they came back and won. And then it happened in Colorado the second time. We were up 3-1 in Edmonton. I had missed a lot of time after my knee mm-hmm. injury, so I was not I, I was not in 100% health. And I got ran over by Mike Greer as well. He hit me Oof, from behind and my train, shoulder yeah. went out. I just remember I could barely get out of bed. I actually talked to Mark Crawford going into Game 7. I'm like, Crow, I don't – I'm okay if you want to use somebody else because I can't move. And he's like, no, I want you in the lineup. So I took a stupid penalty in the first period. Edmonton scored on the power play, and now he wishes I wasn't in the lineup. <laughs> Billy Garen, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's true. It's a fact. So then, And then it happened again with the Flyers. Uh, you know, in that conference final, my last ever playoff series was a 3-1 lead. Devils. With us, yeah, with us a chance to go to the finals. And the Devils came back and beat oh. us the year that and the Devils well, and they won it. The Devils won the cup. So let's go to the trade to Philly um, because you're in Colorado yep. and you know a couple of years. But how did it all go down when you found out you were coming here? So my knee was never came back at 100. percent So we went through a lot of stuff with the Islands, just trying to get it right. Um, it was never going to be right, but it was going to be. It was good enough to play. So. I wasn't shocked that I was going to be traded. I had heard that it was going to happen. We played in Arizona the night before I was traded. Um, I had an A on my sweater. It's the first time in my NHL career I had a letter on my sweater. So I knew I was getting traded the next day. <laughs> <laughs> we got to show God. he's a good leader. Swear to God. We had an A on my sweater. And so I skated around that night. And I, I was, we were playing against Rick Tockett, uh, Keith Kachuk, Jeremy Roenick. They were all on the same line. And I was talking to them all night. I could, I'm not, I don't even worry about you guys. I'm getting traded. Look at I'm a, I'm a leader. <laughs> I kept telling them, right? And they were just like, this guy is nuts. So anyway, the game ends and we're getting on the plane. And uh, it always suit and tie, right? Well, I wore my sweatpants and our sweat shirt and a pair of jeans. And I walked on the plane. Everybody's on the suit. And Patrick Wall goes, what are you doing? I go, ah, don't worry about it. I go, I wore an A tonight. I'm a leader, and you guys can follow or not, right? And it's like, it's just like I knew it was going to happen. So the next day, I'm at, at the practice rink, and I open up the newspaper, and I said, uh, Keith Jones <laughs> traded to the uh, Philadelphia Flyers for Sean Podine. I'm like, really? So no one's told me. This is a newspaper. So I walk into the practice rink, and I go, hey, I, I've been traded. Hey, guys, I've been traded. No, you haven't. I go, what's right here? It's in the paper. No, you haven't been traded. I go, what's right here? I, I'm reading it. You want to see it? Look at it. It says right here. No, you haven't been traded. So I go to the trainer room. I, I, I got traded to the Flyers. No, you haven't. I go, well, well why is it in the paper? Uh, oh, we don't know. So two hours go by. They're checking all my knee stuff, like x-rays in Philly and stuff. Like it's not official. So I don't know. I'm just sitting there. And so I start getting my equipment on again, like I did against the Islanders when I was traded the first time. So I'm starting to put my gear on. And Patrick was sitting beside me. He goes, why do you want to be traded? I said, Patrick, I don't want to be traded. I've been traded. It's right here in the paper. He's like, <laughs> he's like I don't think so. I go, no, it's here. Like it's, it's all... Then uh, Johnny Martin, the PR guy, comes down. He's like, uh, Pierre Lacroix wants to see you up in his office. I'm, uh, I told you guys so I was traded. So you're probably smiling at yeah, Patty I said, and saying, hey, fucking so told you. I'm thinking Lindros and Leclerc, right? Like I was telling you guys earlier, like <laughs> yeah, if I played with Rimberg. Lindros and Leclerc, I'd get you know, a certain number of goals to David Poyle. So I go up in his office and Pierre Lacroix, I sit down, you know, you, we traded you the Flyers. Bobby Clark wants to talk to you. Now, when you hear Bobby Clark wants to talk to you, that's pretty cool, right? So I go in the other room and I, hey, Mr. Clark, you know, he's like, uh, hey, Jonesy, we we uh, we got a game against Florida tonight. We don't need you for that. So, t- but we do need you for tomorrow night. We play the Devils, and I'm like, 
um, you might want to rethink that. And he's like, what? And you go, have you ever seen my stats against the Devils? And he goes, what are you talking about? I go, I played them 23 times. I have no goals. And he's like, what? And he goes, no, I go, I, I, I don't know. You might want me to wait a couple more days before I arrive, right? And he just laughs. He goes, no, we need you here for that game. Get in here. And I played Brodeur so many times when I was with the Capitals, I could never score on him. So I arrive. Roger Nielsen's the coach. I remember flying into Philly, looking down around, going, man, another, this is cool, another experience, another chance to keep playing. And I was just excited for another chance to put on a different uniform. And I look and I don't know much about the city. And, you know, 25 years later, I'm still here, right? So as I pull in, talk to Roger Nielsen, he goes, we're going to try you with Lindros and Leclerc tonight. I go, what do you mean, try me? He goes, well, we'll see how it works. I go, Rog, it's going to work just fine. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he's like, what? And he's like, yeah, I go, yeah, just don't worry about it. So the game starts and it's like, I'm, it wasn't working fine for the first two periods. Third period comes around. I end up scoring my first goal ever against Marty Brodeur. Picked up a couple assists along the way. We beat him six to one with this great third period comeback. I end up getting, I think, 12 points in the first five games playing with Lindros and Leclerc and everything's great, right? It's oh, like, you're this loving is incredible. it. Incredible. And uh, that's the season kind of went like that after because they were struggling at the time. They I never practiced like I, I they they would put a big lounge chair out for me and I would why because the knee was so the bad. knee was shot but it was just and they just thought I was goofy I'd just tell them I ah, don't worry like I got away with stuff that a normal normal human being would not <laughs> and uh, I would sit there with a cigar in my mouth during practice they'd all be skating and I'd have the Gatorades get and, the fuck and, uh, out there was a picture in the paper and it that, didn't bother guys no they just because. Loved- and I, the guys in the team, Rod Brindamore, right? Workout fanatic. He'd laugh. He would laugh so hard because we were the polar opposite. He'd be lifting every weight, knowing the mankind, and I'd be lying underneath the trainer table taking a nap, you know, as all this is going on. So it was a real contrast, but had so many great leaders on that team as well, Brindamore being one of them. Baruby came in. Talk it came in. A lot of these guys, Luke Richardson, a lot of those guys became coaches. We're going to skip to golf quickly. You, t- you told us an unbelievable golf story. It involves Rick Talkett. Let's hop into that quickly so we don't miss it. Yeah, so this is post-retirement, and Talk's got a buddy who was a, a good golfer, and Talk loved to golf, and we would be betting on the course. I'm not a great golfer, um, but I didn't mind betting a few bucks with a handicap. Why not? So we're playing. Al Morgani's with us as well, and I'm struggling. I'm all over the woods, and his buddy starts giving it to me verbally you know during this round so by the 13th hole i had enough and i said uh, hey buddy i'll bet you a thousand bucks a hole and i'll play with my putter the rest of the way and he's like yeah yeah that sounds you, good yeah, to me you can't back i haven't hit a drive all day okay so i grab my putter i tee it up i stand over the ball i, I take my swing back and i crush it 250 yards <laughs> middle of the fairway Middle of my only, I hadn't hit the fairway all day. And, uh, and you've never done this. Never, never done this. It. Never done this. And Al Morgan is like, and I left my leg up and farted after I hit the shot. <laughs> <laughs> really loud. Oh, cherry right? that's really loud. And Al Morgan is losing it. So I say to the talk, I say to Talk's buddy, and you ask Talk this biz when you see him at TNT. Oh, I'm going. I, I said, uh, you're up. You know, so he comes up. This guy had been just all down the middle, just killing me all day. He slices it so far into the woods that you'll never find it, right? I walk up to my next shot. It's a par four. Hit with my putter in the fairway, roll it up, tap it up onto the green, and I get my first par of the day. <laughs> first par of the day, right? And this guy's losing it. Next hole is a par three. I, it's over water. I tee up high with my putter. I take the shot with the putter 130 yards, and I put it, it lands on the green. On the green. This guy's this, panicking. Oh, this guy puts it in the bunker. The next <laughs> shot, I win again. I won all five holes again, with my putter. The guy owed me five grand. And I <laughs> every told hole you beat every, him? Beat it's him the every best hole. part. Beat him every hole. I told the guy, just keep it, buddy. You buy, you buy dinner tonight. And that was it. I just owned you, though. Yeah, that's oh. very more rubbing it in than anything. He didn't even want his money. Just, like, yeah. pick up the mail, you know? Yeah, that was it. And then uh, and talk will laugh. And I'll, uh, we, it comes up a lot. Like, it's just, it's one of those things. It's probably 
15 years ago that it happened. So, hey, so, so the, 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 you putting your leg up and farting kind of uh, reminded me of the, the story of when you did the roast for Rick Tockett. Oh, yeah. And yeah. you got to talk before he went on yeah. stage, and there was another story with that. Yeah, we would give talk. We would always rib talk about that. He loved those protein shakes, right? So, so you had the farts. Yeah, so I told a couple fart jokes that were funny. I, uh, I wouldn't uh, – not worth sharing here but anyway i would tell him and then al morgani was also part of this roast he got me one of those fart machines so i stuck it under the podium so it was talk's turn to come up and talk and i i was i was about the third speaker so this is like four later but everyone obviously remembers the jokes right so he's up and he starts talking and i hit the thing right <laughs> and he's like what and he's looking and the next it had like eight different very variations <laughs> It was a classic, and it kept coming out loud. So finally, he looks over at me, and he's like, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and he really meant it. Like It was like one of those moments where I'm like, yeah, he means that. So yeah. <laughs> that was the last one. But I did get him eight times with that. Yeah. we uh, we got to go back to Philly. Two, th- 2000 playoffs. I know you guys yep. come up short, but very eventful. The Stevens hit on, on Lindros. I mean, you had a front row seat to that, you said. I, I did, and Lindros had just returned for that game. Um, he had not played in the playoffs. We had a group of guys that – really rallied around each other, and it was kind of us against the world. Mark Recchi was on that team, Keith Primo, uh, Rick Tockett, Barubi, who I talked about earlier. Uh, we just had a, a really close-knit group. Luke Richardson on the back end kind of managed everything there, and Eric Desjardins was a great player. LeClaire, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a long list of talented players on that team. So we just kind of had this thing, we're going to get this done. We were up three games to one bringing it home, we lose in game five, and Lindros was not available in that game. And that's the one, that was the game we should have won. And we we didn't. We played poorly. They beat us easily. We head back to New Jersey, and Lindros plays for the first time. And he scores the only goal that we scored. He had another goal disallowed that happened right after the buzzer. We end up losing 2-1, to one, if I'm not mistaken. Now we got a 3-3 series. We're one game away from going to the Stanley Cup. Would have been my first time ever doing it. Um, and now we're playing game seven. And early in the game, Lindros gets hit by Stevens, and he's out. And it's, it's, an, it's ugly. I, I'm sure most people have seen it. And now we got to play. We're going to play this game seven. We had played without him for the whole playoffs, and we played a great game. After he left, it was like, I don't know, what, but our team was a very close-knit group of guys. That, you know, I played on some really good teams, but this was an interesting group of guys that just got each other. And that Chris Terry and another guy, a real funny guy. Um, and we came back, and we, we had a great game. Talk scored the only goal it was, for us. It was a 1-1 game, and then with two minutes – Something left in the game. Patrick Elias scored the goal uh, against Brian Boucher, and uh, they beat us two to one, and that was it. So we came that close to having this what was seemed like it was just going to be this amazing story just fall a little bit short, and that was the last playoff uh, game that I ever played in. But earlier, before that, uh, earlier series versus Pittsburgh, five overtimes. Yep. Keith Primo. I mean, you. I, I lo- looked it up. Thirty-seven fifty of ice time you had. You must have been you talking out on a bum knee. <laughs> so yeah, and I talk and I went to the movies the night before in Pittsburgh. Right? What'd you see? Uh, I can't remember. <laughs> I, I know we saw Mission Impossible the day before Game Seven against the Devils, and it proved that it was too. <laughs> but uh, but we did. I can't remember what we saw in Pitt. So anyway, we come out of the theater, and uh, I'm thinking I don't play much anymore anyway like it's i was playing like 12 minutes a night right so we come out we locked the i don't know how we did this we left the rental car running with the keys in it and locked i don't know how that ever happened because well, it's like impossible well, to do back so then you couldn't you could do that now, i guess now yeah that they make it so you can't do that anymore, yeah so that's yeah. why it happened so talk and i were standing outside in front of a car in pittsburgh at the movie theaters and we can't get back to the hotel so we had to wait for a tow truck it came we got it so anyway we get to the game the next night I'm playing like you know, I was saying, twelve minutes a night. I the game before that everybody wants to forget about. I did have a goal and two assists <laughs> and helping us come to get the series to two to one on one leg. But anyway, <laughs> so we get to overtime now. I that game sheet is in my basement. Actually, it was a gift to everybody on the team. I have no shots on goal, zero block shots. Zero hits. It's almost impossible to do what I did in 37 minutes and 50 seconds. You were an absolute non-factor the whole night. But I was on the ice (laughs) for the goal. The Keith Primo goal, he scores it. 
I'm actually on my way to the bench. I never saw the goal to the next day. I was staring right at the bench at center ice, cutting across, looking, and Rick Talk is jumping on the ice for me. And all of a sudden, they're all celebrating. And all I could think is, we're going to get too many men on the ice. Why is everybody leaving the bench? <laughs> and sure enough, Primo scored this incredible goal, and we all had uh, a great celebration. Now, that's t- that tied the series at 2-2. We were down 2 nothing, lost the first two games at home and won the next two in overtime, one being in five overtimes, and then won the next two rather easily and beat out the Penguins four games to two and then headed to the conference finals against the Devils. Ah, oh, great, great stuff. Now, wow. I know you retired uh, November. We were talking before we interviewed you here uh, about how all your career milestones seem to happen around this time of year, two trades. And, of course, you retired in November of uh, 2000, and Bobby Clark had a very succinct announcement when you retired. Yeah, so r- remarkably to me, we I had a press conference, and I'm like, I didn't know this was going to happen, right? So we were at the practice rank, and Clarky sits everybody down. All the players came up, which was great, great teammates. And he sits in front of the microphone. I'm sitting beside him, and all he says, uh, okay, guys, uh, Jonesy's done. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? <laughs> that was it. That was the Everyone end. Gets so, up. That was the end of my career, so and that's how for your career. Yep, Jonesy's done. They used was, to play it on the he's radio. He's got away with words, eh, Bobby yeah. Clark? Oh, he was the best. He, he didn't need yeah. a lot of words from Clarky. Just a, a, utmost respect for him. But it was a something they played on the radio here for weeks after. Jonesy's done. So. I want to I want to ask more of a generic question. You played a, a, such a great era of the '90s NHL. Of course, the video game explosion happened then. But you know, Mario was still around. Big E, who was the toughest guy to play against or defend in that era for you? I would say Lindros. And yeah. I, I mean, Forsberg and I, you know, I, when I played with Peter in Colorado, he would ask me, he'd say to me, you take the draw. Like he was the centerman. Lindros would plow you over every time. <laughs> like he would bull you over. And so I would end up going in there to take these face-offs. And we were, we were talking earlier. I actually fought him when I was playing for the Capitals against the Flyers in a, in a preseason game. Lindros. And huh? I went on the ice with two minutes left in the game. I I had Alan May on one wing, Craig Berube on the other, and I'm at center. I never played center. I'm like, why am I out here? Right? So it's Lindros, and Lindros is thinking, I'm not fighting Berube. I'm not fighting May. I'm going to fight this stiff. And I end up having to fight him. He hits me with like 18 rights in a row. And then at the last second, I kind of pop out this little left, and the linesman kind of trips him, and he falls down, and, and I skated off the ice. <laughs> I had my arms in the air at the spectrum like I wanted. <laughs> it was the best, man. Gets pumped. <laughs> oh, yeah, I lost it. I, 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 my head hurt and everything, but I got one in. Uh, Booing you off oh, the yeah. ice. You fucking yeah. sandbag. Yeah. Oh, it was great. And so that, that was my – and then David Poyle, after the game, told me, he said, hey, uh, maybe you should leave your gloves on. Like, And I'm like, yeah. Uh, I will. I'd be happy to do did that. I appreciate it. Thanks for the thanks for the support. Did you ever uh, talk to Lindros or give an opinion on if it was nowadays? Maybe he wouldn't have come back then. Like, did he possibly come back a little early? Could have. I mean, there, but I'm, I'm sure if you're he him, had a few at that time, yeah, right? Yeah, and I'm sure if you're him, if you're looking at the run we were on, you don't want to miss that. I know. He'd been I know. Flyer, that's exactly. And the whole playoffs, he'd been out, and you're that close to get the Stanley Cup. And he Cup skate final. with you guys, obviously. And he so skate, and he's probably feeling okay, but. Yep. Yeah, in retrospect, it was probably too soon. Did you know that 22 of your 117 goals were game winners? Almost 20% of your goals were game winners. Yeah, that's fluky, though. I eh. mean, some of them were probably made the game. I'm like, trying to pump your tires yeah, here, Jones. Call some of them would be, come on. It'd be a couple late goals. I'll tell you my best game-winning goal story. Uh, playing for the Avalanche, Patrick Waugh's return to Montreal. Big night, right? Oh, yeah. So this is when you could put money on the board. It didn't go up against the cap. There's $30,000 on the board. 25000 from Patrick. Mike Keene had a couple grand. Uh, the GM had a couple grand. It was like all... Thirty grand, and when I was in Washington, you you know you score the game winning goal. That's your cash, right? So I'm excited. So I get on the ice and I tip a goal in that made the score. I want to say it made it three to one at the time. We extend the lead. Now we're up five one, and there's like eight minutes left. Montreal scores. Now it's five two. Right? I'm sitting on it. I I got the game winner. Right? If it ends, so I've never blocked more shots in my life. Like I I was diving. I would have bit the puck with my mouth if I had to. Right? You think you're getting the whole thirty k? Yeah, I'm fired. I, I still. I, I so I'm like, this is awesome, man. So buzzer goes. Game over. Right? So I'm the first one in the room. I'm up there taking the money off. They go, what are you doing? I go. 
game winning goal, boys. You know, it's mine. No, it's not. I go, what do you mean? They go, no, this is a team fund. We share it with the team fund. I'm like, that's not how we did it in Washington. <laughs> They're like, well, that's how we do it here. So I lost out of that. The next night was my return to Washington. It was like your signing bonus. You'd yeah. already spent it. It's Oh, yeah. I was thinking. <laughs> Between periods, you'd spend it. <laughs> it was in my mind. I'm like, yes, I'm going to the casino. Uh, so the next night is my return to Washington. My first game back, right? Back-to-back games. So I put a dollar on the board. <laughs> I go, there you go, boys. You can fight over it after at that, <laughs> at that team party. Oh, yeah. We, lo- we lost. Like, they were so, everyone's so fired up for Patrick. My first night back. Like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, okay, no. Fuck still. Jonesy. We <laughs> wasted the good surprise on Patty. I'm like, thanks for the help, That boys. is such a good way to end this thing. You got to get uh, yeah. going. You got to game. Mean, yeah. we'll have to catch, you, I think like, that we can just do this again. I mean, yeah. you know, this just catch up more. Yeah. Absolutely tremendous, Jonesy. Yeah. We can't thank you enough for having us here. It was nice to change it up, boys, the yeah. venue and everything. And uh, awesome interview. Everyone's going to enjoy it. Thanks good. for the hospitality. Yeah, thank you, guys. Keep up the great work, man. We Same will. to you. Same thanks, to you. Thanks, Jonesy. Wow, man. Absolutely the biggest thanks to Jonesy and his wife for the hospitality of that day and an absolutely tremendous interview. And also big thanks to Al Morganti showing up to show a little chicklets love. A guy uh, we used to watch in the douche years ago. It was great to finally meet him. Never realized he was a Boston area guy. So, I mean, Jonesy, uh, just an absolute all-time interview. Bruce. I think that's so, so good. easily a Mount Rushmore after the feedback for sure. That was oh. I, guys. I'm not gonna lie. I was in rough shape. I got buckled at Jonesy, and I actually hit it with RA outside. That mm-hmm. was so much fun sitting and down and sitting down and listening to that guy. I was actually able to read about half his book. That's as much as I could get in in the short time I had to read it. Um, six years. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Butchagross talked about it when he was on the podcast, and he wrote it, folks. And give it a read. It is fucking hilarious. Just like him. Some of these stories with it's. The fact that he could get away with it was fucking remarkable. It is amazing the stuff that he would pull off. And yeah, I mean, I knew it was going to be a great interview when we showed up, Biz. Al Morganti was there. I remember watching him. Those two are really close buddies. And all of a sudden, we're getting into the story before the interview. And that's when I'm like, oh my God, we got to start recording right now. So Jonesy did not disappoint. He actually exceeded these expectations, which were ridiculously high to begin with. So thank you so much, him. Looking forward to catching up with him again. Yeah, hey, do how not... about him beating that guy with his putter on the last five holes? Oh, I yeah, asked that's... talking about it, and he was like, yep, I was there to witness it. Son of a bitch. Striping Two... it down the middle. 250 yards down the middle with a putter. And didn't even skip a beat. I don't even think oh, he... Oh. Didn't he say he didn't accept his money either? He's like, don't even give me your money. No, he didn't even get no. yeah. the cockiest move ever. No, I... <laughs> so I think the one thing that Talkett said about it, he goes, he forgot to tell the best part of the story. And correct me if I'm wrong, because he didn't tell this in the interview, is after he drilled it 250 down the fairway and picked up his tee, he let out the biggest, juiciest fart. No, he told that. <laughs> no, he, he says that. that. Oh, he says that. Okay, <laughs> fuck, fuck. Okay, okay. Never yeah, mind. Yeah, never yeah, mind. Yeah, that. That the- <laughs> never mind that. Yeah. Cause all, I, cause, all-time rack on tour. No Because talk, it. Talk, it talked about it. Maybe I retold it, and he goes, oh, did he talk about how you let out the biggest, juiciest fart? So, <laughs> sorry, folks. The brain wasn't clicking uh, as well that day. Fuck, was I in rough shape. But uh, it was yeah. good time spending uh, some time spending with the donkeys on yeah. his, and his, and his, and his I, wife. Do not break into this man's home. He has a, a, a dog oh. that oh, yeah, is what the show, a man. colossal raptor. <laughs> fucking that thing was a T-Rex. I don't know what the fuck it was. Scary as fuck. Uh, I mean that that, that even if that, that dog like, was a yeah, person, he'll bite he'll bite you yeah. too. They were like, heads up for that dog. If that dog was a person, he'd be six eight, three eighty. Like <laughs> fucking scary as shit, man. Definitely he'd be DJ dog. Metcalf. But with like a Tyson <laughs> brain. Mike Tyson, that is. Uh, oh, um, all right, Biz, one more note. Uh, in addition to that interview, this podcast is also sponsored by a better help online therapy. We talk about better help a lot in the show, and this month we're discussing some of these stigmas around mental health. For example, some people think you should wait until things are unbearable to go to therapy, uh, but that's not true. Therapy is a tool to utilize before things get worse, and it can help you avoid those lows. Many people think that therapy is for quote-unquote crazy people, but therapy doesn't mean something's wrong with you. It means you recognize that all humans have emotions and we need to learn to control them, not avoid them. And we've been taught that mental health shouldn't be part of normal life, but that's wrong too as well. We take care of our bodies with the gym, the doctor, and nutrition. We should be focusing on our minds just as much. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. 
It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. So give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp Online Therapy. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and our listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash chicklets. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash chicklets. Don't be shy, folks. Check it out. It's never, never, never a problem to ask for help. We all do at certain points, so give better help a whirl if you need to. Uh, um, all right. right. I was going to ask yep. you guys a, a spontaneous question here about uh, the lady who asked that question to Bill Belichick about his New Year's resolution. <laughs> I didn't so catch that. I didn't catch it. Um, what was it? I, I'll, right. play it. I'll, oh play it. I'll play it. Oh, my God. You now. have not seen. I want to watch you watch this in real time. This is fucking unbelievable that you haven't seen this. Uh, Grinelli, roll it for him. Hi, um, football aside, sorry, but I'm doing a story about New Year's resolutions, and I was just wondering if you had any you wanted to share with your fans and our readers. Yeah, no, not right now. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I mean, that's vintage Belichick, but like, I saw people chirping about this online to talk about it. That, that person had to be put up by their boss or something. Or like, like she said, she, she was working pretty on pretty legit. Story. I don't know, man. If he had well, said, if he had said, stop the run, it would have been an all time, <laughs> um, like ridiculous. I never thought press of that conference moment. Yeah, I never but thought that of would have an been him giving in to like not being furious as to how bad the team played yesterday. Yeah, he must have been fuming because they. Yeah, that, it's not like his defense to get ran over like Dude, that. Dude, he had. I, um, no, well, it's his kids' amazing. defense, past right? Games, their, their past two games, their D's brutal, but he just last week, I think, apologized to the media for being so mean to him. I don't think know, that that. I think I, that was a very kind reply by yes, him. Yes, actually, yes, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. it could have been a lot worse, and I think he probably realized like this. You know, this isn't someone who's normally here, and it, and it was. She wasn't asking like a gotcha question about like fucking any of the stupid trumped up controversies they've had. It was just a silly resolution question. It's probably not the right person to go off on. I mean, hey, especially after even, that loss, he didn't even crack a smile. I mean, <laughs> hey, I tell thank you, God guy, she didn't yeah. ask him that the week before when he actually like had to apologize for how me he might have exploded. Yeah, he was at before. boiling point. Yeah. Right? Last time yeah, he that, does that after that game. Yeah, what a difference a week could make is that yeah. like a, is that isn't that like a saying for a brand or something no oh, resolutions are silly anyways fucking time and cal- calendars are so arbitrary it's like how, he it. was like he was like in press conference mode for how you drive like after you get pulled over driving away from the cop you know how you get back on the highway and you just go straight 55 just for like four miles <laughs> two, while he's two and ten you know that's him in the press conference right now after his apology yeah yeah you're, you're like, signaling shit. over the, the the rumble strips like where else are you gonna go to get back on the road you fucking idiot the cops um, just laughing as you're driving away. Every time I go over those rumble strips, no, oh. hopefully it's not too much. But granted, you know, you hit them once in a while, rider. What is that? What is that? I'm like, bud, this is like quitting. six months now. It's the rumble strip. I've told you this. <laughs> Come on. What is that next day? <laughs> they work, kids. though. I mean, darn kids. Hey, so I, I think a, a guy from Michigan invented the machinery in order to do that, and he patented it. And then sold it. So he's fucking not working. Johnny anymore. Rumble. <laughs> so he's on a yacht somewhere. Um, uh, I think. You, uh, you know oh, you know who else is? Gonna, you know who else saved? is going to be on a yacht? You know who else is going to be on a yacht? Fucking Mario Lemieux after the sale of this Pittsburgh Penguins team. Yep. And there was a, 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 a thread online. I know we're out of order. Ari hates my <laughs> guts right now. No, I love it, Biz. You keep me on my toes. I'm conducting a symphony here, and you you decide to stop playing the violin when I don't expect it. I love the, it. Go ahead. I mean, Mario Lemieux's story is as fascinating <laughs> as anyone in pro sports, given with what he went through health-wise and came back and what level he was able to play. But the the business side of how it was all orchestrated and, and, the, and the whole sale of the team, and he kept it out of bankruptcy and forfeited salary to now what it, he they sold it for, this is like... I fuck bro, bravo the magnifique. That's uh that's a fucking boatload of cash, man. And that is one savvy businessman. Yeah, and to give you a little background, uh there's a, a Twitter feed uh at Joe Pompliano, P O M P L I A N O. He's he had the a cool a, Ravel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, they do the same that, thing, but this guy's a, not annoying. He's not like this guy yeah, is so much such a better fall. I hate Ravel and cool don't belong in the same sentence together unless you're talking yeah, fucking temperature. What a loser. 
But anyways, uh, he had an unreal tweet thread about basically how Lemieux became pot owner after he got stiffed by the previous owners on his paychecks. So he finag- not finagled. He come up with a, a deal, got some investors, and he was able to poly that into owning uh, the Penguins. He's still a, mi- a minority owner, but of course we mentioned this sale recently to the Fenway Group, and Lemieux is basically going to pocket. I don't know if he's going to pocket or he's going to make three hundred and fifty million off of this sale, basically because he took. Uh, pot ownership after the previous owners couldn't make couldn't make his check couldn't make his payments on it because they I don't know whatever shitty ownership shitty business practices so he became owner now he's going to get three hundred and fifty million but also Biz Monday was the twenty first anniversary of him returning to the game after a three and a half year layoff yeah. I mean this is a legit goosebump moment Mario yeah. I mean I, I know I fuck with Penguins fans now but I was always a huge Mario guy loved them him coming back after you thought he was done man you didn't think he was going to play again three and a half years he comes back. He gets a goal, two assists, five nothing went over Toronto. And then it was interesting, boys. That was the last season he played with Yaga. And you think to that that much talent, it's crazy that they only won two cups together when you see, you know, how good they were and how much chemistry they had. It's kind of like almost shocking, I guess, that they only won two cups. Yeah, well, and then the, it's the, well, I was gonna say it's fascinating that given him saving the team, they end up winning uh three more and getting Crosby and Malkin and, and Flower in the draft. So so many things changed when he ended up taking ownership of that team uh for the better i mean obviously there was some some a couple rough years there what was the generation x wit were you part yeah i was part part of that i was part of that uh me or pick pick, uh army flurry and i don't remember who the other guy was well there was a couple Uh, no no i wasn't generation x that was like jackman rico fada or pick constantine koltsov but we had another name i think um Speaking of that year, Lemieux came back. He had seventy six points in forty three games. I remember. I remember exactly where I was, who I was with when he came back. It was against Toronto. It was snowing that night at the Igloo. He got points right away. I. I. I I'll, that was a memory I will never forget. And the fact that he was able to do what he did in life and that thread's pretty cool. The one thing I was confused about was he mentioned on the Twitter thread. Uh, he messed up as it's, far as goals and, and assists, I think. Or, no, no, or there was a mistake was, somewhere by he, accident. He, he, he mentioned something uh, about instead of choosing to, to go battle in court for what he was owed from the previous owners and getting pennies on the dollar. And I started thinking, like, even though they owed him $26 million, is there a chance he would have not gotten that money? Like the league one, like can't get I don't. It, I don't think it had to get to that point. With I think he, no, I know, I, but like, imagine yeah. if that was the case. If a, I, I can't imagine nowadays if somehow an owner went bankrupt, guys wouldn't get their salaries. I don't I mean, know. It's I, just, mean, it's, I mean, I mean, that's why hey, we got to get them on. Someday that's what we're, we we're getting there. Oh. We're getting there next. We're backing up the 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 Excel date to to to, to a summer of twenty twenty eight. He's that's top the next three move. interview. If if I could give my top three, he's one of them. Oh yeah, I don't think he, I don't think he's a big interview guy. Although he goes on Madden yeah. show all the time. Well, well, Crosby and Neely weren't either. We got them. So that's true. Mario, if you're Who's listening. the top three for each of you guys? I feel like we've never really talked about this before. Um, obviously, Wayne. I would say Mario. I mean, number four. Mine's I mean, or Lemieux, and then the the third is to be determined. Maybe I like would say Justin I would say Miser. Stevie Y because I know he would never, and we can't. Yeah. Because he That's seems the thing. like a, f- a lot of the guys I would love to have on. Like they, the stories they really couldn't even I, tell. So I. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's, McGillney would be a great one because the whole like defecting from Russia when during the middle of the Cold yeah. War and you know basically under I don't know if we're death. ever getting a Russian on that. Yeah, I don't know, know. man. You, you ruined that for us, but we can't do one live. <laughs> yeah, yeah, live. From, yeah, they'll they'll have us in a cell in we Siberia. We do one in <laughs> Moscow. I just get beheaded. Are, uh, at the end are of it. like uh, so? Uh, who's the first uh, goal you ever scored against? <laughs> Guy kicks down the door, bullet in the back of the brain. <laughs> <laughs> You're asked that question too many times yeah. already. <laughs> we have been asked to go to Moscow. We have been asked. To you've go hit to your you've hit your limit on that <laughs> question. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a little odd job. Uh, speaking of mobsters, I can't keep this secret in because there was one more thing that we were going to release other than the rest of my lineup for this ball hockey tournament we have coming in Vegas on February third and fourth. Right, aligned with the NHL All Star Game. The Danbury Trashers have Uh-oh. a team. They're coming. AJ Galante, who, by the way, thank oh, you, boy. AJ. All class, man. All he, class. He's he's been 
emailing and texting G nonstop. So G's G's like basically uh, partners in crime with them now. Uh, he is putting in a team for the ball hockey tournament. So things are going to get very, very interesting in Vegas. So, and thank Yo. you, AJ, for the cookies that he sent for Christmas. I, oh, yeah, huge thanks, man. I, I, I got a package. No idea where it's from, what it is. I open it and, and nice handwritten card. Thanks for everything, AJ. And it's like, man, it was just, just all class, just a classy gesture. No one else sent us cookies, and this kid did, and it was uh, just a tremendous gesture. G, what do you got for us? I was just going to say, and we still do have spots open in the Chicklets Cup, so you Not want to AJ. Not many. They're selling out quick. we got about 10 to 15 spots left. I think we're going to have about 60 to 65 teams. And uh, boys, like I, this might be rude to AJ as a, after I said thank you for the cookies. I did have Katie test them, and, and I waited five minutes just in case because we are competing against each other at the ball hockey tournament, and we know how this fucking guy rolls, man. He's putting stinky fish in the, in, in the heaters. We know what these clowns are up to, so I oh, look forward to... Oh, is T-Bone to, coming? Uh, probably. Oh, oh boy. Probably. Oh, He's God. probably going to ask Imagine us to book T-Bone him a first-class Imagine T-Bone and Terry Ryan too. facing off. Oh, oh Jesus. I'll have, to, I'll have to corral them we'll see. together with them. We'll see. But um, Katie's all right, and uh, thank you for the cookies, AJ. Biz, that's not the only news you're breaking. Um, we got a big contest winner who's going to get to hang out with you. I have the name right here. Guys, we did this contest uh, around uh, Black Friday, and this is fun. We're going to start doing more give backs with our fans. So we did the contest where you entered on the Barstool store. We were going to fly you and three buddies out to Arizona. We're going to pay for your hotel. And we're going to get you a suite at the Coyotes game, and I'm going to go play golf with you guys. So we're going to have our own little fucking sandbagger. You better bring your cash. And I got the name right here. Oh, Grinelli, you sent it to me. Connor Keelan is the Arizona Experience winner. This guy is all the way in Virginia Beach. So we're going to be flying him out. And uh, he's been like, he's been a hardcore fan for about three years. Grinelli said, obviously, he looked him up and he's been getting merchandise all the time. So for all you hardcore fans that support us and buy merchandise to, you know, support us, like, you know, filming more things and having bigger budgets to do more crazy things on the YouTube side, we want to keep giving back to you guys. That's why we we, we did that Go Puff thing. So, you know, we, we just want to continue rolling out the red carpet for you fans and you loyal ones at that. So, uh, Connor, Virginia Beach, bring two good golfers because I'm going to fucking take all your money if you don't, boy. Are bring you your cash. Guys, That's we're doing a $5 con- Nassau Biz Nasty special. <laughs> What's that mean? The most you can lose is like 15 bucks. Nah, uh, with presses, you could still somehow lose a lot of money if you had a real degenerate playing. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, let's see. Moving right along, we want to send congratulations out to Derek Nesbitt of the East Coast Atlanta Gladiators on playing his 1,000th pro game last Wednesday versus the Jacksonville Iceman. Derek's in his 16th pro season. He's 39 year old forward. His sixth with Atlanta. Uh, he's a Ferris State product. Uh, let's see my last note here. Yeah, Ferris State product. He's also played in the Colonial Hockey League way back in the day, the AHL and Austria. So, uh, Biz, I, I know you got together with him. You uh, did a little something with him, correct? Yeah. So it kind of segues back to what we just talked about, like doing more things. And and uh, you know, Derek played in his thousandth game in Jacksonville the other night. I ended up playing with this guy at the All Star game, not a big deal, in Boise, Idaho, when I was playing in the ECHL. And then all these year, years, uh, Jesus, these years later we've kept in touch and then sure as shit when the ECHL season got canceled and then we ended up doing that ECHL player relief fund he was a guy where like if he wasn't involved in helping out as as you know many other guys did and people donated you know if he's not one of the guys helping out like who knows if it gets off the ground so I found out he's going to be playing in his thousandth game so we sent Sean a videographer who we've had on now for over a year you know he's in the trenches getting the YouTubes up and doing all this stuff he went out to that thousandth game got some very emotional content we didn't want to take away from that night other than just having kind of you know Sean be a ninja and, and take it all in um, we wanted to have a celebratory thousandth game in Atlanta on February 25th, where we're going to try to sell the building there and, you know, com- com- commemorate, com- that's the word, commemorate. You got it. Not a boy, busy boy. Get it back on the rails. Uh, commemorate him for his thousandth pro game and just kind of like giving back to like a, a league and, you know, elevating these, these professionals at lower levels who, you know, they've, they've been huge members of their community and, and provided entertainment. And he's a great guy. He's a father, husband, unreal teammate. 
Uh, we have some unbelievable footage that we're going to capture. So if you are around in the Atlanta area, come on the 25th of February. We're going to do a, a chicklets night. We're going to present them on the ice uh, for his thousandth game, and, and we're going to do it upright for Derek. And this is going to be all part of this jungle series that we're going to do. You know, I played life in the jungle. It's, you know, it's uh, the ECHL is, is, is a special place in my heart. So we're doing a game with the Orlando Polar Bears. And we're going to do a Pink Whitney night. We're going to do a night in Wheeling at some point. We're going to mention these dates and we're going to get special people to show up. We're hoping that everybody could show up to the Pink Whitney night with the Solar Bears. Um, we're going to do a fun night with the, the Wheeling Nailers where we can maybe get KB no swag. And, and and the other dude from Wheeling. Pat I'm, Midler. I'm, Nick, Midler. Nick, Nick. Uh, Nick, Nick. Yeah, he's a beauty. So we're, we want to keep doing these fun videos and, and get some behind-the-scenes stuff in order to keep growing the game, you know, and, and, and doing some fun shit. So, um, so Wait, congratulations to Derek. Where did you play with uh, Nesbitt? How did you so, know him? I, I I don't know exactly where he was playing at the time, but he was picked for the All Star game, and we we were oh, on the same okay. team in in Boise, Idaho. So you do the skills comp, and then you do the game the next day, and it was a cool experience, man. I, I actually when the the Wheeling owners, it was me and uh, Jensen from our team who ended up going, and they were like, "Hey, we're taking a private plane." So I got to hop in a private plane with the owners of the 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 Nailers. And, you know, it took seven hours to get there because we were going against the wind and, you know, you got to stop for gas. You had a, prop, still... you had a propeller plane. <laughs> <laughs> we took a helicopter. It took hey, us three days, see? but we got there and they had. Dude, the, he's uh... still producing, though. He's <laughs> thousand games in the AHL. And the yeah. Post is so to see amazing. that he's still fucking playing, I'm like, oh, my God, how do you do it? I asked him, how's the body holding up? So we're going to get some fun stuff with him there. And uh yeah, man, we appreciate your guys' support. We want to keep doing more of these fun videos and video projects. He so once with again, it's too, dude. Yeah, yeah with because he played at Ferris State. But yeah. uh, thank you to Sean, our videographer, who went there and captured all this stuff. He's guys, crushing it. He's crushing it. There's so much stuff that happens behind the scenes that he helps out with that you guys don't see. So he's kind of like a Grinelli, where he's like a, you know, he's a man and yeah. man in the. What he's that di- direct man of many hats. Yeah, there you go. He's and direct, guys, this uh, will all be uh, released on the Spit and Chicklets YouTube channel, and, and we, we'd love for you to go like, subscribe, share that channel, because the Chirp more me. you do that, the more we can do video content. Do whatever you got to do. Just show up and subscribe and, and, and like it. All right. Well said, Biz, and congrats to Connor. I uh, hope you enjoy your night with Biz. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's like, like with oh, that. fuck. He's like, I won that <laughs> thing. I'll defer. Um, all right, and, and that's yeah. and speaking of the YouTube channel, that's where we're going to be doing the, the Wicked Lot of Fought and um, uh, Yoga instruction. RA is going to put the nice, uh, speaking of Lululemon, Granally, he's going to have a full-blown uh, track suit on, the tight one. Like Polly Walnuts? Th- not not my brother, the, the real Polly Walnuts. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, fucking tap biz. So, again, congrats to Connor. Good stuff coming. Uh, let's see. A couple more notes here. But, but, uh, oh, yeah. Did you guys see this clip of uh, Dylan Larkin during warm ups? He, he knocked over a fan's beer. So, he went over to the uh, locker room attendant, Zuby, his name is, and hit him up for a 20 and had him run it, go over, run the $20 over to the fans. But, I mean, if you're sitting on the boards, that's got that's a rookie move leaving your glass on the board on the boards on the dash even during warm warm-ups. up, even warm up. All right, okay, yeah, man, yeah, yeah. I mean, a puck comes whacking in, guys bump into it. It's uh, I think that it, down I, there, I think it's so doing. rare behind the net, but I guess a shot could have might have done it. But I think that's right away why Larkin's like, I gotta go buy him a beer. What am I well, doing? He, throwing he hits and he just up? ran. He just ran right at him and buried the boards. Right? Maybe subconsciously, he's like, I just want to fucking crush that thing right now. And, yeah, and, like, and, du- and double fist it and he just he actually tried to get it with his fucking head he got a broken nose I don't know if you guys heard but, uh, hey Zuby like, comes back he's like where's yeah. my beer he's like what I thought you wanted to buy that <laughs> no I wanted one yeah exactly but like, it was a cool clip because it, it did highlight Zuby and you know guys like that who work in the locker room the, yep. the equipment guys who you know tend to get unheralded you know and I've said before on the show these are the these are the grease and the gears of the NHL without those guys the league does not function so Thank it was cool know. to see him get a little bit of love there uh, let's see. We got a follow up on the Omaha Lancers story from several weeks back. Of course, the you know, players had complained they decided to boycott a couple games. The USHL uh, launched a third party investigation. Uh, and per the USHL, they said uh, their investigation found that, quote, multiple media reports surrounding the situation in Omaha to be unsubstantiated, end quote. Uh, the USHL president and commissioner Bill Robinson said that we are satisfied that this matter has been fully and thoroughly investigated to its fullest extent through a neutral third party. 
Um, kind of, you know, kind of, well, I don't know if you blame the media, but he said media reports for wrong, were wrong. And uh, Chris Peters, who I've been following for a long time, I've never met him, but he's got a pretty damn good re- reputation as a reporter. Uh, he tweeted that he stands by his reporting, what he said, you know, he stands by it. And, you know, and I, I think this is another case, Biz, where, you know, sort of nuance maybe should be brought up where, you know, if a reporter is told something and they report it, it doesn't mean they're wrong. They're, they're actually being told something. Now, whether what he was told was somebody spin on something or their version of events is a different factor. But, you know, I don't think people should beat up on the reporters here. They, they reported something they were told. The league did their investigation uh, th- via a third party, and, and that was their conclusion. So, you know, I, I don't go beating up the reporters for, for doing their job, I guess is my point here. And, I, I guess know, the gonna- only time you can uh- – you can fire back is is was the other side asked about it and i guess ha, ha, was enough journalism done on the other side to provide uh, well, a case from b- both sides is, is that yeah, I, th- I think they got the, t- the probably the t- uh, typical no comment you know they they talked to the players i, I oh, thought that okay. they ran in a brick wall i don't think they were getting any, anything yeah. back you know they, they well, reported what, what they were hearing and you know they they didn't make it up out of whole cloth no. i mean I'm, I'm sure chris talked to people and those players i don't know if they're going to come out and have further statements, but either way, it looks like the USHL yeah. is going to move on, and we yeah. shall too. Uh, this is crazy moment, guys. I, I don't know if you clicked on the link when I sent it. And the Swiss League uh, players, uh, I, I'm saying the name right, Ar- Arnaud Montadon or Montadon and Tyler Higgins. I, uh, Higgins hit this Montadon dude or Montadon. They both fell. It ended up crashing the doors through. They fell into the Zamboni snow pit. First of all, I've never seen that before. Second of all, did you know that pit was that deep? That guy was up to his fucking well, chest. Well, that one is. It's not every, ri- every yeah, ring. No, okay. One. That okay, was like fi- falling down like a, a subway crate in that NYC. Was it was gr- Why is it right off the ice, too? I've never seen that either. Is that normal? Yeah, sometimes they dump them right there. They just get it over with. It depends how the rink's built and their, their whole system. But, oh, my God, that was funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean. I hope well, everyone's all right, but fuck, well, that was a funny they, picture. They were. It was crazy. Well, well the quote from Martha Don, he said, imagine, and this is translated, imagine that at this moment I am in full effort. I'm hot. My gear is hot. And in a half a second, I go from a temperature from 37 to 38 Celsius to, I don't know, probably close to zero. Frank, Frankly, luckily, I was on my feet. If I had to swim, I don't know how it would have ended. I mean, picture how much he shit his pants in that moment. You get oh, yeah. checked. You go through <laughs> doors, and now you're fucking underwater in a fucking snow in a Zamboni pit. I, you know, that's like life be- fla- you know, life flash before your eye type of moment for about two seconds, no? Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> yeah. mind, if you're that's... minus three, though, you're like, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. I can put some snow me. on, bury me here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. everybody's thinking about you getting dunked and, and not your your two pizzas up the middle. Good call. I was asking if you're okay uh, instead of I'd be fucking... skate the next day when the team the team's off. I'd be looking oh, for shit. those crates. Like, get, uh, get me uh, out of here. All right, moving on to the uh, et cetera push and the non-hockey stuff. Uh, I'm not sure. You guys must have seen the Staples Center. They had a name change. And, dude, this is fucking weird. Like, I'm not picking on L.A. or the Lakers or whatever, but uh, they but played the are. Staples Center. But I'm going to. But they played in the Staples Center for, you know, last whatever, fucking 15, 20 years, whatever. Now they, they're going to be the Crypto.com Arena, which, by the way, it's going to cost them $700 million over the next 20 years. But they brought out all the trophies, all Hall of Fame players. I mean, the building wasn't closing or nothing. They changed the fucking name of the building. I've never seen a ceremony for a fucking built a corporate name change to another. I just thought it was fucking weird. I think weird that and what they did was they said, let's, like, if we're going to spend this tag, we're going to roll out the red carpet to, to, so everybody's talking about this name change. And here we are. Fuck. Should have told me that in the fucking reply. I wouldn't I would have left it out, cocksucker? I think it's guys. unbelievable I think you marketing. Just a way I, to own you on the show. No, oh no. I just thought of it, uh, guys. You think I'm that fucking smart? No, I just <laughs> thought of it as you were going through, and I'm like, yeah, they did. And 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 of course, it's a crypto company because I think that they're trying to really tell people that we're we're going to be around for a while and we're not going well, anywhere. Whether you if you believe in crypto or not, I I'm not very bullish on it. I don't own much crypto. Big crypto guy, right? Yeah, here. well, I mean, Huge. Uh, I think Miles Wood said that he was he was heavy into crypto. I was talking to him a little bit about it. Like, there are people who are are making you know serious investments into crypto, and they're transferring a lot of their their net worth into it. And I I, I personally wouldn't have more than three percent of my net worth into crypto. I think that you're, you're fucking mad if you do that. I actually bought an NFT this weekend. I bought okay. my first well, NFT. There, Is that another, why you switched your like, Instagram picture like, to that NFT? <laughs> Yes, I did. That I NFT, think... that stuff, I have no idea how these like pictures are worth so much money. I think it's the 
I, I actually think it's amazing if people are making huge dough off these things. But to try to explain it to me, I don't know what I, I don't even know where to start and yeah. asking questions about this. Yeah. Like, yes. what do you know about that? Why? Like, so that's a picture that anyone could see. What does owning that do for you? I saw Justin Bieber promoting it, so I said I'm all in. Okay, Anything that's, Biebs that's great. touches turns to gold. So you no, can't but, even but, explain but, it? But, but, the, but, no, there, but they're there geniuses rarities. for doing it. They're geniuses for doing because they're getting in it at the top of the market and at the top of the food chain. Like, well, of what course, do you mean? It, if these, uh, so you're saying you don't think these things will be worth much more money in 20 years? Uh, <sighs> I, I think, kind of agree with you. I don't. I don't. I, I think we're, we could be so off on this. Well, I, I I look at it like this: most people are kind of becoming one with their phones. So it'd be like this: imagine having a whole card collection where you can show everybody your cards on the on your phone, and obviously they're you know if you lose your phone, they're probably locked where you have the password where you can reaccess them with your with your whatever phone you you have that's new, but. It's kind of something that's it's it's essentially being created out of a thin air, and. You know, there's obviously a market for it where people are, are seeing value in this, where you can get mm -hmm. one of one. But like, I see them, and you look at them, and most of them kind of like look like ass, and it's just like that's what you're paying all that money for, and and anyone much can see it. So what is it? Be what is it? What about owning it? I don't. I'm looking at it whenever I want. Well, I think right? it's. Yeah, you're able to look at it whenever you want. It's kind of like in your safe. Some people it's like owning a piece. No, of I'm art. saying if you don't own it, biz. Though I apologize. Like if oh. If, can uh, well, I, can I, I not look at that picture? I think anytime? that you could see what it looks like from a certain distance, but you can't open it the way that the owner can open it and view it. Sometimes they're doing it where it's like a clip, like a clip of a LeBron dump, dunk, and you own that one clip of that LeBron, LeBron dunk through that company, and nobody else owns that one of one. And then they'll do one that's like a, a, a one of 10. They'll do 10 of them. But... I just there's just like so many of the different companies and so many of these different spaces where I'm like I just see this as, as wasted money. I think I there's just it's just rich people with too much money and they don't know what to do with it. Yeah, I said a few episodes we were talking about if you could buy stock and you know future things. If I could buy stock and say that there's no way that building will be named the uh, Crypto Arena in 2041, I would put a million dollars on it. Yeah, no way. I mean, remember the Astros' new field was called Enron Field. Years ago, and then you know, then obviously, I'm not saying crypto is going to go the way that Enron did. I just don't think that it's going to be the fucking same name in 20 years from now. I'll be shocked if that happens. Right. I I Far think that the, I personally think this is a phase, and I think that there's too much. I think there's going to be like a downturn on this. But I I the reason why they probably did this whole shebang bang was to for because this is like the crypto uh, community saying you know we're here and we're for real. And I'm like, okay, well that's a that's a pretty fucking bold investment to tell us that. That's Grinelli, a bold... What how, what yeah. percent of like your money is 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 in? Not a lot, not a lot. The crypto. I, uh, but I'm, I'm just banking off that Bitcoin that we won last year in March Madness. I still I haven't just, received oh, that. I, I still have mine too. It's gone up I and still down like a yo-yo. So I actually, yeah. who do I call about that? Ghostbusters. We'll talk yeah. off the air. I'll okay. Get it for you. People, people are probably punching the steering wheel right now about me trying to break down crypto yeah. and, and, and NFTs. So I'm sorry about me rambling That's on. All right. But but there, I, I've formed an opinion on it based off like enough things that I've read. Off a tweet, might not in, be in Reddit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I did. I love you. <laughs> no, buddy. I fucking. Where else are you going to get the information? Uh, Books? anywhere else. All right. Uh, couple last notes here i i know you, i asked you guys you haven't watched uh the new leo dicaprio movie don't look up it dropped on netflix i believe christmas eve day um it's uh well as a purported satire basically leo dicaprio and jennifer lawrence play scientists who discover that a, a comet is going to hit planet earth in six months and they're trying to sound the alarm and it's directed by adam mckay who of course directed anchorman and um stepbrothers and uh talladega nights oh, also so directed oh it's a comedy well, it, yeah, it's it's a attempt, I guess, a, a satire or maybe an attempt at a satire. And, you know, of course, he did the big short a couple of years ago, which was was a pretty big success. Normandy for Best Picture did a great job of breaking down the whole economic collapse for like dummies like like me who don't understand that shit. Uh, as far as Don't Look Up, I mean, I thought it was just okay. I know some people are raving about it. Some people love it. I thought it was an attempt at a, at a satire along the lines of, um, I'm going way back here, Dr. Strangelove, which is a satire of the Cold War that Stanley Kubrick, made and directed in I think 1965 at the height of the Cold War which was took a tremendous amount of balls to make that movie at the time and also like uh, Network which is a satire of the uh, 
in the 1970s, I think 75, about the news industry and how it was out for profit. If you watch them now, they feel like you know they're almost like regular movies. But this movie, I don't think it. I think it missed the mark. I don't think it hit those, those points like it intended to. Uh, it felt like Idiocracy. Remember the movie Idiocracy a few years ago that Mike Judge directed. You never saw Idiocracy? Oh, for three, holy shit! No. And basically, he was kind of like it was a movie about the dumbing down of society and how people are so like you know so just paying attention to other things that they that they shouldn't be. And I felt like it was like more NFTs like NFTs and Bitcoin. Yeah, like that type of shit. Basically, like people out to lunch, they don't pay attention to important things. I, I just thought it missed the mark. I didn't think it was a great movie at all. Uh, I don't, I'd be shocked if it gets really any Oscar nominations. But uh, definitely, I think you, should, you guys should check it out. We can discuss it yeah, more it in depth like next, I can't wait next to show. Watch it. And I'm sure a lot of people, our listeners, did watch it. And I'm sure people liked it. It wasn't a bad movie by any stretch. But considering the cast and the pedigree, and by the way, the great there was a great cast. You know, Meryl Streep, uh, what's her name? Um, Kate Blanchett was terrific. Mark Mark Rylance, who's uh, who was in Bridge of Spies, I think he won an Oscar for it. English actor, he was awesome. He played like a sort of a Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Elon Musk hybrid of kind of these billionaire tech guys. And I thought he was probably the best in the movie. It's worth a watch. It just it it didn't hit the mark, the satiric mark it was going for. Like I said, I, th- I think that idiocracy maybe was closer to that. Uh, you know, good job, good effort, but wasn't that great. You guys catch anything recently? The, the, good? the only Leo movie I've ever watched I didn't like was Shutter Island. Yeah, it didn't didn't do a ton for me. If, I, I, I remember being it. a little confused and not uh, super overwhelmed with that one. Yeah, it was, and I it was, came out. At, I believe it came out after Inception, or I watched it after Inception. So I'm like. I, it kind of has before. a similar was, premise here. I think it was here. way yeah, before, before yeah. Oh, was it? Okay, well, then I watched yeah. it after, and I'm like, Inception, maybe maybe that jaded my mind of the fact that, because he was like imagining shit on this fucking island. I, I, I was just actually not... owns a Shutter Island <laughs> N- NFT, so he's trying to... <laughs> I was, I was within a half all, about it. a half inch collar of uh, being an extra in, in Shutter Island biz. Yeah, I went to a casting call for for that, and I got called what, back. What was going to be your um, your? I job? was going to be one of the I was going to be one of the COs on Shutter Island, one of the corrections offices or screws or whatever you want to call them. Uh, it was like months after they started filming, and they say, hey, "You still interested in, in being in it?" I said, "Absolutely." And I drove all the way down to Plymouth, Mass, for a costume fitting, and I put the sc- the screw outfit on, and I put on a size sixteen. It was like choking me out, size sixteen collar. And then they gave me a size 17, and it was a little, little looser, but it was comfortable. I could have worn it at a wedding, and it would have been, wouldn't have looked bad. And uh, I says, well, let me see if you have a 16 and a half. And she comes back, and she's like, no, I don't have a 16 and a half. Uh, she's like, you're all set. And I was like, wait, what? That's it? She's like, oh, that guy. And she points to like a 70-year-old guy who was probably the same height as me, but we looked nothing alike. But because this guy fit the uniform better, that's how particular Scorsese is about his like minor details. The game of inches. This- the, literally, this guy got the, the the extra gig over me because of the the, the call of fit him slightly better than me. So I was like, I was oh, almost, fuck. I was crestfallen. The lady's like, "Well, you still get paid." I was like, "But I wanted to be in a Martin Scorsese movie." And then I get in the car, no oh, yeah. bullshit, hand to God, put the radio on, and it's the Stones who are always in Scorsese movies, and they sing and can't get no satisfaction. I probably told the story before, but it was like the Lord was playing fucking tricks on me that, that day. Is a, wow, I would have bet anything you were about to say the song that was playing was You Can't Get All You Want. Is that the that, same song? That would have been the cherry on top, and I didn't know. Is that the consider. same song? I, it's, you can't well, it's You Can't Always Get What You Want. What That's, you yeah, want. The, like, that, oh, the name yeah. of the song is... You, Isn't that you can't always you can't always get what you want? That's the name you of the just song. said no but, satisfaction or something. Did I? Holy fuck! Did I really? No, no. Wit wit w- wow. ended your story. This is this Holy episode a Rolling gone. Stones Wait. story that he fucked up. <laughs> wow! Go <laughs> Fuji's Actually, win again. Wow. You know? Wow! Now hey, I'm playing over my if head. If Scorsese like, knew you messed that up too, you would have had no chance. Anyways, I think that the craziest I, thing is uh, oh. being an extra. Like that takes a lot of work. What would you have gotten paid? I was cheap. Cheap. I, I oh, mean, okay. Yeah, they don't pay it because you're not in the union. If you don't speak, like, wow. Now I'm thinking, like, did I? Was it satisfaction? Or you can't always get, like, hope your your memory plays tricks on you. Ten years later, yeah. wow, it because you know what? It could have been satisfaction, or it could have been said. you can't always get what you want. Hey, I, I watched it. something I last night that was pretty interesting. Have Holy you seen fuck. on Netflix? Uh, Fourteen RA's, Peaks. Ra's matter about this than not getting credit. We got to give them a minute. No, here. no, no. I'm I'm rattled in my head. Go ahead, Wit. I'm, I'm rattled. Uh, in my Fourteen head. Peaks. No, um, is about. One of the most insane human beings, animals, legends I've ever seen in my life. Um, it's a guy who, so there's 14 mountains in the world that are over 8,000 meters. 
And uh, there was, I think, I, I don't remember exactly. I believe there's one guy, the first guy to ever climb all 14 uh, was a was a dude who did it in 16 years. Yeah, Talkin' this, told me about this. This guy in this in this show is trying to do it in seven months, and the amount of like footage they have, and then I guess this other show, the Alpinist. Now this is climbing when you're you know you got a rope and everything. The <laughs> Alpinist is a dude who's just free climbing. So if he slips, he's dead. This guy, if he Crazy. slips, he might catch the rope. I really liked it. I'm gonna watch the Alpinist next, but I recommend it if you're looking. At, and this guy was. Prior in his life, he's done a million incredible things. So I'll ch- check that one out. It got a little boring at the at towards the second half, but I still enjoyed the overall like experience. I think it was an hour and forty minutes or something. Um, yeah. Can I ask a question about television shows? I'm hearing that Succession is either the best show they've ever seen, or some people saying it's the worst show they've ever seen. Well, people saying it's the worst show they've ever seen. You can discount their opinion yeah, on that's... anything after. Uh, it's a great show. I, I think their first two seasons were terrific. The third season, I thought it kind of treaded water for a little bit, but the, it finished very strong. Uh, it's it's a tremendous show, and anyone okay. who says it isn't good, I mean, they I said know that, we all They said the opinions, acting but... is not that great. but huh. Who the fuck said that, dude? Like, if any, I mean, that's the strength. Who is of that, Biz? Like, I need like, to know who said the that. writing. My dog Lloyd. Like, oh, seriously. I'll tell him. Yeah, I'm Probably. gonna tell him. I'm gonna All tell right. him to wake the fuck Give up. Give him another well, bone, dude. Yeah. Speak. No, I, I'm gonna put him up for adoption. Cheer um, up. now great finales in Succession. Uh, uh, another one that I was gonna check out that yeah. I haven't started. So I'm either going Succession or Yellowstone. I've given <sighs> Yellowstone one watch, and I've said many times in this show. I think. Uh, Breaking Bad took me my third time, and Game of Thrones might have been my second or third time in terms of, like, I hated it the first two. Yellowstone, first episode, I've watched once and shut it off 20 minutes in. I haven't gone for my second try yet. I, 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 I don't know. Sorry, what? I mean, to cut you. No, you didn't. Like, I didn't really have anything uh, else to say. I just, I got to give it that second chance because everyone, everyone's telling me it's great. I'll never give Game Two. of Thrones a chance. Two, biz, Succession versus Yellowstone, two vastly different shows. Uh, Yellowstone's kind of a, you know, popcorn it's a it kind of a, a western yarn. It's a story where succession's like deep plot heavy. You got you if you get up to piss, you really get a pause it because you might miss a pertinent detail. Uh, succession's a way better show, I think. Yellowstone is, looks good, but it can be a little cheesy sometimes. Some of the like the plot can get a little off the beaten path, but definitely would recommend watching it by okay. uh, by all means. And Whit, I'll uh, tell that person uh, who said that that they're a fucking idiot. No, I just want to know who it is because I'd like to ask them like how who was bad, who acted poorly in your opinion. Katie. <laughs> Katie, you were just defending your lady. Come That's here. honorable. You got engaged oh, last week. Come here for you. Sora. Uh one one of the HBO note I I know I brought up before the the show Insecure had this series finale Sunday night and you know, I'm definitely wasn't the wheelhouse. I'm a middle-aged white guy from Boston it was a show about like young black professional women in LA. But I think if you were in your twenties and thirties and you're trying to find your way in the world, that's basically what the show is about. You know, it didn't matter like what color you are, what you do for a living. It was just about being post-college and like trying to find your footing in life. And that's how I related to the show. And, and they had the, the finale Sunday night, man, terrific show. If you, if you had never seen it, I'm sure you probably heard of it. If you're on social media, highly recommend it. This uh, woman, Issa Rae, she started a web series biz, like, just, you know, making her own fucking show on YouTube. It ends up getting reached. Someone from HBO reached out to her, and sh- this show became like a juggernaut. It's a huge show. She's like this, like, multi-million dollar producer now. Like, wow. Got a bunch of other shows running, and, and they actually have a documentary that they, they uh, dropped after the finale, and it's about how this show is like they put all these other people to work who never had chances before in the industry and they give a lot of people their first shots and it's basically it's it was really a hot woman That's documentary awesome. even, even if you never saw the show i mean and i got you know i got a little misty eyed watching it too because you know you watch the show for four or five seasons you kind of you know fall in love with the characters a bit and again it probably wasn't a show that was made for someone in my wheelhouse but uh give it a whirl i thought it was a, a terrific show yeah, that's a great uh, story a, a real really good show and Issa Rae, yeah she's a, a tremendous story making web videos and now she's you know this kind of high power producer for HBO and putting a lot of people to work who otherwise might not have gotten work. So just uh, very inspirational from a creative and artistic standpoint. Okay, drum roll. Let's do. Let's. I'm going to grill Katie here. Uh, you didn't like Succession. No. Who oh. Who were the bad actors? He didn't like McCulloch, or he didn't like Jesus. See, I hate. I kind of hated him at times, but it was almost like showing how good at acting he was. I thought. 
I, I have to catch up with Katie in person, Biz. I mean, like, I, I, I'm very confused by this. Okay, he, yeah. he says uh, that him making you hate him is him doing a good job as an actor, and I agree with you, Whit. But, mm. but that would... So some people uh, maybe got annoyed by... Who's the guy in uh, Breaking Bad? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the, 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 Jesse the, Pinkman? Pinkman. Like, some people were annoyed by that character... All right, but I would, but as Wit said, I would consider that a great acting job if I'm despising him, much like fucking 100%. Walter White's wife, who I hated Sharon, even more. Sharon Stone in Casino is probably the best example of that. Like you absolutely fucking hated her in that role. Okay, Katie's she was on so waivers. Goddamn good in it. Agreed. Katie's on waivers. <laughs> Cancel that marriage talk from the beginning of the show. Everybody say bye to Katie. <laughs> Give me that ring back, Katie. <laughs> yeah. it's down to the coast. Yeah, yeah. That Chanel bag's <laughs> fucking going back to the fucking shop. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, what was the last? Oh, uh, another example of that RA. And like, if I ever saw her in person, I'd probably walk up and tell her I hate her guts. Is Penelope Cruz from the movie Blow? Oh, I still haven't God. forgiven her for the way she treated him. Oh, she was. She called the cops. Oh no, she did the blow up in the car. He's got. He yes, hit me. Yes, he hit yes, me. Yes, that's what she you did. You fucking c she was riding him. Yeah, she was trying to ride tough. him. She was. And then at the end, when he's picking up his daughter, she's living in like a trash. But like, it's just. That was a great movie. Blow. That oh dude's from Weymouth, Massachusetts. Yeah, he oh, just really? passed away. George Young. Yeah, he yeah. just passed away not too long ago. Uh, Already went to shit. high school yeah. with him. Um, <laughs> That's guys, not, let's leave it at that. A- anything else? Uh, oh, yeah. We got to talk about uh, the, the Bitcoin conference. <laughs> no, shit. <laughs> 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 Shit, we, yeah, um, we, we didn't no. go into we didn't go in depth enough. On We're that. actually going to break no. down every single cryptocurrency. So stick around here. Maybe grab a coffee or a piss. We're going to compare every cryptocurrency to forwards on the Russian World Junior Team. It's just another <laughs> thirty five minutes, guys. Bear with us. And just yeah, give this me is the Ivan coin. Just give me credit. <laughs> <laughs> Igor, 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 uh, Igor coin. <laughs> I, all right, guys. Uh, We're it's a pleasure here. catching up with you. I will next see you in uh, mini. Cowboy Jacks Saturday, uh, two thirty Central Time. Gee, any other pertinent notes? We got to show let the fo- fine folks of the Twin Cities know. Be there and be ready to drink some Pink Whitney. Let's All right. go. Say. I'm Let's gonna watch go. Fago every night between now and then to brush up, boys. It's been a pleasure. This is a fun show for no hockey. I had a fucking blast. They hopefully the the listeners did too as well. Get Peace. the Ovi coin now.